Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's June 2nd, 2021, and we are in the middle of Pride Week in uh, Utah. Uh, we are celebrating and honoring uh, the LGBT community, showing our love and support, as we've tried to do over the years here on Mormon Stories Podcast. And today, you are. Uh, we just finished yesterday an amazing interview with, with Kyle Ashworth, um, uh, such an inspiring interview about... Uh, a gay Mormon man who married a woman as he was taught and uh, had three children uh, with her, were married 10 years, and how uh, she set him free. And uh, and then they adopted this motto even after they divorced uh, uh, one home, two, uh, one family, two homes, or two homes, one family. It's a beautiful story. Check out Kyle Ashworth's story if you haven't yet. And today we're just uh, continuing with the love um, today we have in studio Kelly and Kayla Mikesell. Hi, guys. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we're super excited to be here. All the way from Las Vegas and uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, this story is epic, so hold on to your hats. Um, L- Kelly is married to her bishop, uh, Kelly Mikesell, um, currently serving as as a bishop in, in Las Vegas, uh, faithful members for many, many years. Um, prior to this interview, and then and then Kayla, of course, is is the child of of Kelly and Bishop. Uh, Kayla is also um, the reigning current Miss Salt Lake City, Utah, and her platform uh, is LGBTQ advocacy, and and they're here for Pride Week. But this is a story about so many things. It's a story about you know uh, Mormon upbringing. Uh, Mormon family, uh, kind of a blended family. That's going to be an, an element to this story. Uh, there's going to be elements of of, of uh, law of chastity, kind of worthiness, sexual shame. There's going to be uh, some LGBTQ uh, themes because uh, as as Kayla kind of developed and progressed in her life, she has come to identify as bisexual. And we're going to talk about what that was like for her to come out as bisexual with devout Mormon parents. And uh, I don't know if your dad was bishop at the time, but well, he was. So what's it like when your daughter comes out as as bisexual when you're bishop uh, or, or bishops uh, m- married to a bishop? I don't know if you want me to call you bishop's wife. It's or fine. Whatever. Um, uh, but then there's also faith issues and feminism issues. Uh, Ke- Kelly's got her own story of, of, of her journey uh, with with Mormonism, and uh, there's just so many cool, important themes. So, buckle up for a multi-hour epic uh, mother, uh, stepmother, daughter kind of pair. Um, uh, Kelly and Kayla Mike, so welcome so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. For Anything you us. want to correct? No. Did I call you mother when I should have said stepmother? No, no you're fine. She, okay. I am yeah. her. I am. Her I've got two moms. <laughs> but, she, yeah. Yeah, but yes, I, right. she's my daughter in all regards. So yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we're so glad you guys are here. Thank you for coming. And of course, we welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast Studio, Kara Burrell. Kara, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, we were just talking. I'm so excited for this one. Uh, this is going to be really, really interesting. So thanks for having me. Yeah. And it's just been so great to have... Kara in the studio, handling audio and video and time codes and just all the things that we need and adding her questions and commentary and wit and wisdom. So it's just, it's been great to have you, Kara. Thanks. (laughs) All right. Well, let's jump in. Yeah. So we have an Epic Mormon Stories uh, podcast interview, and I'm guessing it's going to start with you, Kelly. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a few years older than Kayla. So <laughs> I have a few more stories to tell. Yeah. <laughs> so do you just jump right into Let's jump right in. Mormon? Yeah. Okay. How did your Mormon story begin? I, I've been Mormon or LDS or member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints my whole life. I was um, born in the covenant. I was born to parents who were converts to the church when they were their parents were both converts. So both of my grandparents, both sets of grandparents joined the church when my each of my parents were young. They were children. And so each of my parents grew up in Southern California. Um, my dad served a mission in Central America when Central America was all one mission, like four countries was one mission. Um, when he got back, my parents met at a singles activity and got married in 1975 in the Los Angeles temple. And I have 
an older sister and two younger sisters and a younger brother. So I'm the second oldest of five kids. And we lived in Southern California, moved when I was nine to Boulder City, Nevada, and then when I was 14 to American Fork, Utah. So during that whole time, we did everything Mormon. We, I mean, it really, I think one of the themes that I've noticed is in the stories that a lot of the individuals you have on interview is that Mormon was just who they were. Like it wasn't that we just went to church on Sunday or youth activities on Wednesday. It was, that is our whole life was being Mormon. So we did everything. My mom and dad always had callings, always served, went to the temple. I'd see my mom ironing sometimes the temple clothes and folding them carefully back up into her temple bag. And we had family home evening and scripture study and family dinner was really important to my mom. And so she really tried to protect that growing up, even when church activities often took us away from family dinners. She was always an advocate for that. My dad served as bishop for a time period when we lived in Boulder City, Nevada. And so you're um, a bishop's daughter as well as a bishop's wife. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have just really great parents and they've always been good examples and have raised us in a home where, you know, I was taught to pray and we just were taught to live our values and we were taught, you know, in family home evening, how to behave and act. And, um, I was always did personal progress. I was incredibly self-driven. Kayla's was <laughs> laughing. She's like, you were a nerd. Say you were a nerd. Um, I loved personal progress. I wasn't aware of the fact that not everybody just, you know, did personal progress on their own because I did, I was very goal oriented. And I think that because of that making lists and being goal oriented, that definitely impacted, you know, my personality definitely impacted the way I internalized messages within the Mormon community. And so um, from a very young age, one of my very first, because I think for 41 years I had, I mean, for I'm 43 now. So for 42 years I had I couldn't even remember a night I had never prayed. Um, I'm sure there was a night I came home late from something and fell asleep, mm -hmm. but I don't ever recall. I just, it was not something I ever had to work at. I just prayed every night to my heavenly father. And I remember pleading as a child with my heavenly father to help me not be so influenced by Satan because I, I was taught that good feelings like, love and faith and service and happiness and joy, those came from God and those were good. They were godly traits and feelings and that anger and sadness and depression and anxiety, those were all from Satan and not to give in to those feelings. And so I was an individual with very passionate feelings and I had big emotions and I was sometime my family would refer to me as Dr. Jekyll, Mrs. Hyde, because I'd be so compassionate and loving. And then I'd feel so much anger and I didn't know what to do with these big emotions. Anger and at what? Just, um, I had a huge social injustice issue. Um, my dad recalls a incident where I, he was having to give me a bath as a young child and I was fighting him and I looked up at him and said, I don't remember this, but he, he laughs and says, you looked at me and said, I wish I were the parent and you were the child and I would stick you under here. <laughs> like I just, you know, I was super into equality in everything. And I, I just saw social injustice in my family, <clears throat> social injustice in the church, social injustice in the world. And I was super angry all the time. And I just was easily, um, I was very sensitive to, to things. And so I just didn't know what to do with these negative emotions. And so I remember praying like, Heav Heavenly Father, please take away this anger. Please take away these sad feelings and just obsessed, became obsessed at a young age with um, not being good enough. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so influenced by Satan. What is wrong with me? Because if I felt that anger, then I succumbed to, to Satan. And, um, and that was just a theme that continued my, uh, really mm -hmm. up until this past year because I of how I internalize those messages. I'm fully aware that not every member of the church internalizes messages that way, but unfortunately I did. And so worthiness became a huge issue for me. And I 
I was a journal writer um, at a very young age. I remember writing in my journal at eight um, about things I hated and are angry about or loved and was passionate about. And, and I never felt I could really talk to anybody about it because I think the world was different back then too. I mean, you go back 35 years, like our conversations with each other now are so different than they were 15 years or 14 mm -hmm. years ago when we first met and, and 35 years ago and conversations I can have with my children now didn't happen with parents typically, you know? So I was allowed to have thoughts and feelings at church or at home or at school, but I had to keep my opinions and thoughts and feelings to myself. And so I just internalized. I was a child that, I don't know, I think I was really conflicted inside because on one hand, I wanted to be so good and be perfect. And I tried so hard and I was that kid. I was that kid that... <laughs> When yeah, in high school, she it's yeah. <laughs> During she got you said you got a, a a day planner for your 16th birthday. Yeah, what what 16 year old like, asks for a Franklin day planner? Like I'm yeah. kind of embarrassed to say that at 16, that's what my gift was, and I still have that Franklin day planner. Like it was so meaningful to me. Like I made lists and I organized mm -hmm. and I was always trying to be a good person, mm -hmm. and I think some of the most formative things in Mormonism for me that I I never talk about you. A lot of things in my mind, I would never talk about because there was never a forum to talk about it. You become, when you grow up in a culture where you have to be quiet, like you, you're allowed to have opinions and thoughts, but you keep them to yourself. You just become observant. You, you just kind of observe. And so I just became an observer a lot. And I was in my head a lot. And I remember being 11 when I very first, like, so I had those feelings of lack of, you know, worthiness in terms of, oh, I'm so easily influenced by Satan. I get angry all the time, but no ability to really process emotions. I, I, I didn't, I had limited tools to recognize that and no understanding that those were human emotions. And, and it didn't mean I was succumbing to Satan, but that's what I believed and thought in my heart, like for years. And so when I was 11, I remember specifically, um, two experiences that really defined and took me on a trajectory with my Mormon experience. One of them was, and they both ironically were around female feminism issues. So as a child, like many people, I was obsessed with outer space and I wanted to be an astronaut, obsessed. Um, I read space books. I asked for a telescope from Santa Claus. Um, I read books about astronauts. When I was eight years old, I watched the, you know, sitting in school, the Challenger space shuttle, um, not blow up. That was, it was engulfed in a cloud of fire. And a lot of the country didn't actually see that footage until after, but a lot of the kids in the school- I watched that live. Yeah, watched, watched it live, live because yeah. NASA had arranged with the school's yeah. systems, you know, the Department mm -hmm. of Education to broadcast that live. And it was really because Krista McAuliffe was the teacher, a civilian teacher. And she was the first- civilian teacher to go up into outer space. And she was the first astronaut of President Reagan's um, teacher in space program. And it and the goal was to have teachers go up into space and to come back and, you know, inspire mm -hmm. students to be interested <clears throat> in, in space and, and, and NASA. do whatever you like, yeah. strive to do what yeah. you want live to your do. dreams yeah. and, you know, shoot for the stars and, and really propel that, that forward. And so I was just, I learned all about her and, you know, I, so for years I was obsessed with space and wanted to be an astronaut. Now I'm fully aware that kids want to be a thousand different things when they grow up. And most of the time, a very small percentage of what you want to be at age 11 is what you end up being. But so I remember being at a family activity. Now it was like a family meeting or dinner ex with extended family. And an uncle came up to me and said, Kelly, you know, just talking to me, seeing how I was doing super nice. Love him. He said, Kelly, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, oh, I want to be an astronaut. And I remember the look on his face. He looked at me with an amused smirk. And he said, you'll never be an astronaut, Kelly. That would conflict with being a mother. The time restraints to be an astronaut are so intense. You wouldn't be able to be a mother. So you really should think about something that would be more conducive to you being a good mother. And it, 
it, it shocked me. Like it was a gut punch because I had been dreaming about this for years. I mean, eight, nine, 10, 11, long before I was eight, I wanted to be an astronaut. That is, I mean, that's a pretty, I mean, my six-year-old changes what she wants to be 50 times every two months. And so, I mean, that's a long time to really want to be something. And so, I mean, even one time I remember reading a book about astronauts and, and the qualifications and requirements, because I needed to make sure, you know, I had 10 that I had the qualifications to be an astronaut. And so I had read that you can't have ringing in your ears. And, and I could be recalling this incorrectly because I am 43, but I had ringing in my ears periodically and I didn't know why. And I just started sobbing. I like went and wedged myself between my bunk bed and the wall. And I was just sobbing like, oh my gosh, how can this keep me from being an astronaut? And um, I mean, so I was passionate about this. And so when he said that, I became hyper vigilant in noticing what limitations were put on women. And I was told all growing up and expectations that I could be anything I wanted. I was brilliant. I was so smart. I even had a leader or a a teacher one time say, it's such a shame you weren't born a boy. And, And I began to really resent that I was born female. I was angry about it. And, um, I thought that, you know, every time I would hear women are so good, they're amazing. They don't have to have the priesthood because they're naturally amazing. And I'm like, you're just telling me that. I really, I know what my place is. I'm a second class citizen. I'm a helper. I don't get to be what I want. And over time, I just assimilated that. You know, I just became really sad about the fact that I was but being I feel like, from hearing you, you talk know, about it before, resigned to this yeah, second status. I, I feel like not only did it make you sad and kind of resentful in that anger, mm-hmm. but it, it, it severely impacted that you had these goals and aspirations yeah. because as the older you got, I had no goals. You didn't have any goals anymore. Yeah. So it did get to you and it, yeah. it got to the point where you were like, yeah, I just need to yeah. get married. And yeah. I had no goals or aspirations. And By the time you were like 17, yeah, right? I went to college. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when I, and another experience I had when I was 11, that was, I don't know, 11 was traumatic for me. <laughs> I mean, you're still in primary, you're young at 11. You're not even in young women's yet. I mean, I know they've just recently changed mm-hmm. that. So 11 year olds go into young women's now, but when I was 11, I was still in primary and singing Helaman's Warriors, you know, like the army of Helaman was my favorite song. And I belt that out in the primary program. I was just loved primary. And I was reading a novel Um, My older sister was an avid reader and my parents just could not keep up with her with books. And so they were always buying her, her books. She's 18 months older than me. And so I was just reading one of the books that they had gotten her and it was from Deseret book. And it was just a novel, a fiction novel, but one of the, the main character, the male main character wanted to marry this second woman and felt justified in doing it because of this doctrine of plural marriage. I was like, what is this? I literally had never heard of it. And clearly if it was ever talked about, I mean, at 11, as a little kid, I I don't, I just wasn't aware of it. And I remember being horrified, horrified. So I go over to my parents' bookshelf with all our LDS books. And I find this Mormon doctrine, this white book, and I pull it off the shelf. I'm like, it's like a dictionary, you know, with the two columns and it goes in alphabetical order of all the Doctrine. Doctrine. (laughs) You know, you pick a a name or topic and you go to that section. And I was horrified that this holy practice of polygamy was going to commence at the second coming. And so began a love-hate relationship with the Mormon book, Mormon Doctrine, and Bruce (laughs) McConkey. Love hate would be a really yeah. good a good example yeah. because I cherry picked when I gave talks what quotes I liked out of that book and um, in fact I never told told you this and I don't think I told Sean what? this but when we first got when Sean and I first got married I saw that book Mormon Doctrine on his book on the bookshelf yeah. when we first got married and I took it and threw it in the trash <laughs> I mean for years after he'd be like well, have you seen Mormon Doctrine no no because I don't I know where it was. I went to the dump <laughs> I know where I went like so I just really hated that book and so. I went, I climbed up to the top of my, I I was the top bunk in my room. I shared with my older sister and I sobbed. I felt so sick inside 
as an 11 year old girl, that felt so wrong to me. So just two impactful things of yes, and not telling, you know, being a yes. mother. And then the second thing of now, like, not only that, how? but you're so not that even a it priority. just solidified to me yeah. that here I was. Nope, here I really was. Mm -hmm. And I remember praying because I, for three months, I did not pray to Heavenly Father. I was so angry. I prayed to Heavenly Mother because I was like, I'm not talking to you. You, unfortunately, be, the way I internalized it is I viewed him as deceiving me. I viewed him as, I, I did not grow up unlike your dad who grew up with this very loving view of Heavenly Father. I grew up being afraid of him. Like I didn't trust him because he lied to how, you. How did I just like miss mm -hmm. that for 11 years? And I now was going to have to live this holy practice. Like I mm -hmm. was terrified of eternity. There was a lack of informed consent. That's a recurring theme on mm -hmm. the yeah. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I don't recall being asked if I wanted to live the law of polygamy when I was eight years old, baptized. getting baptized. Right. And for our, for our non-Mormon listeners, uh, you know, the, the Mormon church has this weird relationship with polygamy where it's <clears throat> baked into our founding. We practice it until the early 1900s in reality, but then the government forced us to stop the practice, but we never stopped believing in it. So my, my grandmother was the daughter of a polygamous marriage. I knew her. So I, my grandmother, I knew her, <clears throat> she was in a polygamous family, but, but now the modern church, modern LDS church wants to distance itself from polygamy. And so they tell everyone in public, oh, polygamy, that's some other group mm -hmm. where it's baked into our history. Most of our prophets lived it. Most of our ancestors lived it. And most importantly, it's still in our scriptures. So if you go to Doctrine and Covenants section 132, um, polygamy is absolutely still Mormon doctrine. Our two top leaders in the church, Russell M. Nelson and Dallin H. Oaks, our prophet and his first right-hand man, so to speak, they're both polygamists in the sense that they're sealed to multiple women in heaven. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's this love hate relationship with polygamy that, that, uh, torments us to this day. But anyone who tells you Mormons don't believe in polygamy is not being honest, fully honest. <laughs> no. True? And, and, yeah. and truthfully, because I am such a binary black and white thinker, I am like, the law of Moses. This is what it says. This is what we will do. I know what section 132 says, and I've known what section 132 says. And I knew that I was going to be destroyed like Emma was mm -hmm. if I didn't live the law of polygamy. Because God, God, I'll put that in air quotes, God through Joseph Smith, it, basically the, the historical context of DNC 132 is that Joseph had married, I don't know, a couple dozen wives before he let Emma in his actual wife on the idea that he was practicing polygamy and Emma freaked out and got angry. So he needed a way to get her in line to allow him to keep practicing it. And so miraculously he receives a revelation and those listening won't see my air quotes. He receives a revelation from God telling Emma that she'll literally be destroyed if she doesn't support him <clears throat> in him obeying quote God's will. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's literally a verse threatening Emma with destruction if she doesn't support Joseph's plural marriage. And you read that. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. And Kelly, yeah. It's you, when she reads things, she remembers. <laughs> like, yes. You're, it's well, it's I internalized, see, like I she see said. pictures in my head, like, especially if I've studied it. Yeah. Like, I see in my mind the column paragraphs yeah. in Mormon doctrine. <laughs> and it's for how much, I mean, you know, that you've been in my life for this long, that I see how smart you are and resilient and, and going after things that you want. Um, and it just makes me sad to think of you growing up with these aspirations and all of these things that you wanted to do, but then just kind of being beat down with all of these things that eventually get you to the point where now you're, you have no self-esteem, you're mm -hmm. in college mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and your goal is just to try and find a husband and be a mother, which if that's somebody's goal, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Like that, I, I'm not saying that everyone needs, you know, every woman needs to be out yes. working and if yes. you want to be a mom and, and that's what you want to be in life, that is absolutely yeah. wonderful. But you wanted to do other things. Yeah. And it's not that you can't do both, but I just, it just makes me sad to think that that's, yeah. that wasn't the framework you. in yeah. which I was Like you instructed. started from the beginning saying this is your life. Mormonism, you didn't know anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's something you have to accept as a woman. Mm -hmm. Like there wasn't a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was never for me, there was never I think this is where the chasm was forged inside of my heart because there was never a point ever that I thought God is wrong. 
I knew God was right. Right. By definition. <laughs> I believed that with all my heart. Yeah. But I did not agree with him. So God's a jerk, basically. And I knew where people who went who did not agree with yeah. God. Yeah. And so here I thought, I'm not this horrible person, but I'm so easily influenced by Satan. I have doubts. Mm -hmm. I have doubt about polygamy. I don't trust that that it, I'll be fine with it in eternity. And um, I just... It just it formed this chasm that just over the years got wider and wider and wider <clears throat> and wider until I just couldn't, I had to f confront things, yeah. you know, when eventually, but with, in, when I was a, C, a junior in high school, we studied DNC in seminary. And I didn't have to get up early like Kayla did. <laughs> I had, I lived in American Fork. So I went to American Fork high school. You're and a caveman. Total caveman. <laughs> Wayne, we had Wayne Sermon on. He's a, he's a caveman. Oh, so. honey. oh Wayne, Wayne Sermon of Imagine Dragons. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so you're not the first caveman. That's <laughs> awesome. <more> of a <laughs> so I just walked across. I had release time, you know, yeah. in the middle of the day, went to the church building for seminary. And my junior year, we, we were studying doctrine and covenants. And the seminary principal was my... Do, uh, Doctrine and Covenants teacher. And that was a really tough year for me because um, there were just so many things that bothered me that, you know, we didn't have the internet, like, you know, we didn't have information even. You just, whatever your leader told you or whatever your parent told you or whatever your teacher at school told you, that was fact. Like there was no reason not to believe anything that was being said. And I remember I was never one of those kids that would raise my hand and be like, well, what about this and this and this? But when anyone else rose their hand and was, what about this, this, and this? Oh, I perked up because I, I, I wanted to know what about this, this, and this. So when I remember uh, a young woman asking, well, what about polygamy? You know, and she was really concerned about it. And he said, everyone will have to marry or, you know, everyone will have to live that law. It is the higher law. It, it, this is what section 132 teaches. It's our doctrine. And um, so then he, he said things like, I mean, sisters, come on, think about it. If you had billions of worlds and people to populate, wouldn't you appreciate the help? I mean, you know, and, um, his reasoning for, and now this is a seminary president, right? So meaning God needs multiple yes, because, yeah. assistance, right? <laughs> right. Cause so he, st he even Female had this assistance. mentality yes. that yeah. we would physically give birth, you know? And yeah. in my brain, I'm like- well, To billions not, of spirit children. Yeah. That's not how Adam and Eve were created. Like, did mm -hmm. you miss the memo? But whatever, okay, we're not allowed to ask or say anything because we mm -hmm. don't have faith if we ask questions. And so I, um, I remember something else he said was the reason why we didn't talk about Heavenly Mother is because we had multiple Heavenly Mothers. So how would we know if my Heavenly Mother was the same as your Heavenly Mother? Oh, or oh my gosh. Mother? Because God had polygamous wives. So why would I doubt that that was true coming from the CES? Mm -hmm. In, you know, the, and he, they just, work for the CES school. department. He's the yeah. principal of seminary. Yeah. So I just, I internalized like, Mm -hmm. shove it down, shove it down, shove it down, have faith, have faith. So mm -hmm. I learned a lot of thought stopping techniques. So really good at that. Someone's been listening to, uh, well, someone's been reading up on the literature a little bit. That's an important topic. Thought oh, stopping. I was very good at it. Yeah. I am a child. <laughs> thought, so yeah, you're singing a primary song. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Anytime. I would, time I would, every single time. Thoughts. Anytime I had an impure sexual thought, I'm a child of God. Um, anytime I had a doubt, I'm a child of God. Thought, shove it down, shove it down. So I never really let my brain get to that point contemplate or evaluate yeah. very far. Yeah. It just, it starts to bubble up and you shove it down. Right. So I'm not even really c cognitively aware to the extent that I have some serious issues going on. Totally. Yeah. At yeah. this point. Yeah. Yeah. So that's seminary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was 16, another kind of right before I get to um, graduating, when I was 16, I distinctly remembered. So I love science and I love science experiments. And I think in terms of more science, scientific experiments and things. And so I viewed life, I remember being 16 years old and just looking out and seeing people and cars drive by. And I had this vision in my brain, not a real vision, but imagined in my mind that this planet was a giant laboratory experiment and we were all the rats. 
And we were set here or set here. And then we were supposed to go through this maze. And then God and his angels were standing above us with lab coats on and clipboards, Mm. injecting us with cancer, injecting us with... This, this is a dark putting, thought. Putting yeah, super dark. obstacle oh my gosh. in front of us, super um, dark. crushing a family member, crushing us, pinning us down. Mm. And they were just observing and taking notes about how we responded to the, mm. the injections of this and this. And it was just like this callous. I never viewed God himself, my heavenly father, as someone loving because I had a very loving father. And whenever discussion about God. I mean, in the scriptures, I mean, especially in seminary, you know, you have old Testament and new Testament. And I mean, we are uh, trenched deep in banishment. I mean, and it starts from the plan of salvation. And that was one of my issues as a teenager. Like what kind of dad kicks out a third of his children? Cause they, he doesn't like what they chose. What, who, Adam and Eve getting banished from the Garden of Eden. I mean, the whole Old Testament is, you know, if you eat unleavened bread on a certain day, you're cut off. The uncircumcised are cut off. You don't obey the Sabbath the right way. You're cut off. You consume blood. You're cut off. I mean, it's just like cut off, cut off, cut off, cut mm-hmm. off, banishment, banishment. So I began, I mean, Noah, the fl- evil, kill them all, burn this city, destroy this. <laughs> I just viewed God as this very hateful, hateful, angry. like you don't do what I say, get out of town type person. And I viewed Jesus Christ as like my savior, mm-hmm. like my savior from God's justice and wrath. I don't know how to explain it. Well, yeah. It makes sense. You know? Yeah. 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 That, yeah. 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 That's, yeah. Yeah. And uh, how you view God so often shapes how you live, how Mm -hmm. safe you feel in the world, how you view yourself and humanity, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the the interesting thing is just showing the difference of being in the same religion, both of us, you know, growing up with Mm -hmm. it, with our parents and everything, and how differently I viewed everything. So even like Mm -hmm. that you had all of these thoughts and things like that, and I didn't have any of that. And so it's just so interesting to see the differences and with everybody, I bet all, you know, all four yeah. of us have had yeah. completely different ideas of what, how we pictured heavenly father, but we were all taught similar things. I mean, a little bit different things with our ages yeah. and stuff, but we internalize it very different. But yeah, that the fact that we all in, yeah, how we internalize mm-hmm. it, it's just interesting mm-hmm. in the way that it comes out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for Kelly. those who, who don't know Mormon theology super well, like Mormons believe that we were going back to this idea of God, father, God, and multiple mother gods in heaven we believe that father and mother God uh, birthed all these spirit children, and then they all existed as spirits before they all came to this earth. And then there was this battle in heaven between Jesus and Lucifer in the pre-existence, as we call it, and that one-third of all of God's spirit, God, mother and father, God's mm-hmm. spirit children, chose to follow Lucifer, and thus a third of mm-hmm. God's spirit children were cast out of heaven and will never have bodies, never come to this earth, never mm-hmm. go to heaven. And that's just a really vicious, if you really think about it, yeah, first absolutely. of all, that's super inefficient. Yeah. If a third of your children right off the bat before mm-hmm. they even come to earth are all condemned forever to be Satan's because of a choice spirits because of a choice they made because a charismatic persuasive mm-hmm. son of God, you know, made a good argument at yeah. some celestial court. But then also the Mormon view of heaven is, is often thought about a sad heaven because in Mormon heaven, when you die, there's the th- three degrees of heaven and then a outer darkness. And if you don't do the right things, you get put in a different level and you don't get to be with God and you don't get to be uh-huh. with your family. And that leads to this idea of sad heaven. So Mormon pre heaven and post heaven is sort of super stratified and kind of tragic, uh-huh. it, it which really makes is. God kind of a jerk, why, or not very smart or powerful. Like yeah. why would God, It's one thing to have adversity on the earth. It's another thing. Why would God create a celestial plan of quote happiness Mm -hmm. where so few of his children make it back to live with him Mm -hmm. and they're cut off from not only God, but their own physical family in heaven. Mainstream Christians just, oh, everyone goes to heaven. If they go to heaven, it's not like splitting up families. Yeah. Yeah. And growing up, I was taught that uh, the family here on earth is the model in heaven. And, And I could not wrap my brain around I, my father would never do those things. banish us. 
my father, because we didn't agree with him. He may not like it, but mm-hmm. I didn't have a father that would yell and, and banish and cut off. And so I, I, my father was someone I could rely on and I could trust. And even when I made decisions that might have hurt him, he loved me and he, he didn't. I mean, mm-hmm. I think the only thing that I would get disciplined was, well, quite frankly, is I talked back to my mom like insanely <laughs> <laughs> because it was like the voice of justice. You know, yeah. like I tried to organize a revolt with my five, with us five siblings once <laughs> because I felt we were being unjustly treated by. <laughs> I don't even know what it was. We were all lined up for spankings <laughs> on the couch. And I was yeah. like, my, I'm sure my mom went to go get my dad or the wooden spoon mm-hmm. or something. And I was like, okay, everybody, we are going to jump up and say, hold your buns and run. And everyone thought that was a great idea. We were just going to like five against one. Mm-hmm. We could do it. And one, two, three, mom comes in and I'm like, the only one that jumps up. And of oh, course no. I get all the spankings. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, I was really like um, yeah. that child. But um, so I just adored my dad and I do to this day. He He's someone that no matter what he was doing, all, all five of us kids knew we could call dad if our car broke down, if we got a flat tire on the freeway, mm-hmm. if we were stuck somewhere, dad would leave work and come help us. Like, and so I couldn't, it, it, to me, there was no parallel between the God I was reading about in the scriptures, but, but the savior, there was a parallel between the savior and my dad. And so I just, I feel like that's what kept the savior hanging on to. Yeah. Because I feel like the resentment and anger, if it was just heavenly father would have driven you. Yeah. I think I would have gone mad, but yeah. I, but I, having Jesus Christ resonated yeah. so much and I loved the savior and I wanted to be like him. And there, to this day, I see a video or a, the mm-hmm. birth story and I, I, just feel that warmth inside and, Mm -hmm. you know, tingle in my eyes. Like I am resonated Mm -hmm. with the savior. And so I just, I think that is what helped me, you know, hang on Mm -hmm. and, and 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 plus you don't have a choice. What are you going to do? And repress all the anger. Yeah. Yeah. And plus I never, I didn't know. I was very emotionally immature when I graduated from high school. I graduated in 1996. I was on uh, seminary council in my senior year of high school. I mean, the elite. It, oh, yes. Very, very Laurel much. president. I got, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, a, I was super, you know, and then you went to Rick's, which nerdy. was BYU. Yeah. It's BYU now, but yeah. it was Rick's college. It was just two year school. And I went, but I got a tuition scholarship, a partial tuition scholarship and went up there and I didn't get into BYU in Provo <laughs> with a 3.97 unweighted GPA. Uh. <laughs> Because when you live in American Fork, yeah. everybody wants yeah. to go to BYU yeah. Provo. So I wasn't like a genius. And yeah. so I actually had to study and work hard for my grades because oh. I just wasn't blessed with raw intelligence. So I went up to Rick's. And so there I am, you know, I, 18 years old. I'm living in the cooking dorms and I have three roommates. Love them. I'm still friends with one of them to this day. Um, she's amazing. She lives in Texas and has been such a dear friend to me. So I loved Rick's College. And I know that that is, you know, a lot of people don't love Mormon schools. I loved everything about it. I loved praying. Rexburg's pretty next level intense, right? Yeah. It's intense, but I loved that we opened prayers for Mm -hmm. for meeting, you know, every class. I loved. Classes at a university. Every class. Every class you go and you open a prayer. I don't know if they do that now. Yeah, yeah, they do. Do they do? Yeah. So you go, every class you go to, they open with a prayer. They don't have a closing prayer. They didn't when I was there, but, yeah. they, and every Tuesday was devotionals. Mm-hmm. Um, Elder Bednar was, when I graduated, he was the president Woman and has my, yeah. do, my two year associate's degree. I have his signature on mine. I just loved, I loved studying in the library. Mm-hmm. My kids are like, <laughs> oh my gosh, how embarrassing. No. But um, I, I loved, I loved everything about it. I do. I have fond memories of Rick's college, but I, I lo- went there with a goal. <laughs> I didn't have a goal. I didn't know what to study because it didn't really matter, did it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, people said you can be anything you want, but we all knew that wasn't really true. So what's the point? So I was there and I was super concerned because I had been there for three months and I had not been asked out on a date. Had you dated in high school at all? I had a few dates in high school, but... When you say you didn't have a goal, I think Mormonism gave you a goal. Yeah, it just that's maybe yes. wasn't it's not an academic goal, yes. goal or a career True. goal. That's well, what I was saying. You had, was a, you had a goal. I, to be married, get yeah. married. 
Go and, to college to get And married. I felt yeah. like a there was a time bomb going mm-hmm. for. And you're 18. <laughs> right. But but I was seriously concerned yeah. that I had gone three months. My, my friends in had been asked out on dates. Mm-hmm. And I was just one of those invisible girls. I There was nothing remarkable about me. And so I just was super insecure. I was immature. And once again, I think, like I said earlier, I all if those things maybe wouldn't have said to you, I think that it, you would have been different. I, I, you Because starting out at 11, you're, you're wanting to be an astronaut, you're wanting to do all these things. And then by the time you've hit college, you're now insecure. You don't know, you know, you're thinking, mm-hmm. oh, I'm not desirable. And that's why you guys mm-hmm. don't want to go on dates on me. That doesn't sound like the same 11 year old girl. You know, it just sounds like because of everything that happened by the time you got there, that's, it was like, well, I guess I just, that's what I have to do now because this yeah. is what's been told. And I wasn't excited for that prospect. I mean, a lot of the the women I knew growing up, a lot of the mothers, they they didn't appear to be happy. I, mm-hmm. I they seemed depressed and discouraged and overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Why would I? Why would I want to? Why would I want that life? You know? Yeah. yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So. Totally. I. I think when I was at let me let me ask you really quickly is uh, is I was did you have a question? I'll let you ask it. We were just wanted to ask more about how you internalize a lot of those teachings about going from being eleven, polygamy, not being ambitious, thinking so much about that you needed to get hitched immediately, and how that affected your dating life around purity and the ways that you viewed your body throughout mm-hmm. your teen years. Modesty if there's anything else you wanted to mention about that, that era. Yeah. is that relevant? Do you want to? Yeah, talk about that? it is relevant and. I'm sad to say, but I hated my body and I was embarrassed. I didn't think I was pretty. I was, I was taught and raised during those years that my virtue, AKA what virtue meant when I was growing up was my virginity. So my virtue or virginity, my sexuality was the most important thing that I possessed. I was taught that it is a a possession. It was this thing that wasn't mine, that I had to guard it Mm -hmm. because it belonged to my future husband. And no righteous priesthood holder would want a defiled, you know, used used young woman. And and in order to, and I really was, I, I really was very good at thought stopping. I, I wanted to be pure. I knew that if I was pure and I didn't engage in immoral thoughts or look at pornography, I had never seen pornography. I didn't even know what pornography was until after I was married. I had no idea. It was just this gross, you know, Mm -hmm. whores, prostitutes, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. strippers, like those were the people that engaged in sexual thoughts, not good women, Mm -hmm. not pure women. And so I went to college, just, I just had no self-esteem and I just didn't think I was, and I know I still struggle with that Mm because I'm self-deprecating, but to try to be funny, but seriously, I, I, still don't have any self-esteem. And, um, so I, after three months of being there, our family home evening dad. So at Rick's college, they have, they put you in, when you're in a singles ward, they put you, organize you by, I don't know. They have a family home evening, mother and father. Mm -hmm. It's like your Monday family home evening, you get together and do activities and, and study. So our family home evening dad asked me on a date. This is November. So I've been a student for three months there. I'm 18 years old. And so I went on a date and I was flattered that he went on a date. He was the first person that showed interest in me. And I remember really being attracted to his roommate, but his roommate, um, I don't think the roommate was even aware of my existence on the date. He was very into his date and I was super jealous (laughs) that he was so into his date. But so my family home evening dad, he kept calling me and interacting with me and very nice. And three months Later, he asked me to marry him and he knelt down on one knee and he asked me to marry him and he put a ring on my finger. And I, I can, you know, those formative moments in your life where you can picture exactly, it's like a snapshot in your brain. So I I picture it. I'm in my dorm right inside the doorway and he's kneeling in front of me and I look at the ring and I look at him 
And it's those moments you think a thousand thoughts in one, one mm -hmm. 10 second period. And I remember thinking, what if this is my only opportunity to get married? What if I never have another chance to get married? At 18? Yeah. 18. Three months of dating. Well, I had right? just turned 19. So, so two weeks okay. earlier, I had turned Oh, I, I got married at 19. I get right. it at 19. Yeah. So, yeah. But so, still. <laughs> but I've been dating three months. Yeah. And yeah. it's not like we knew each other super well. You have to remember, there were no, people didn't have cell phones. We didn't text not and call. Her, yeah. I was super, I had to maintain a certain G, GPA. So I was very committed to school and keeping my grades so up. You, you didn't know. No, so other. I did not, we didn't go out during the week or talk during the week. We, we f so went on the weekend, we, you know, we got yeah. together and, you know, spent time on the weekends. And I, I had that thought, like, what if I never, what if no one ever chooses me ever again? And I blow this chance to be, to fulfill the measure of my creation, which was ver verbatim what I was taught. The measure of my creation is to be a wife and a mother. That is my fundamental role here on earth. Mm -hmm. Everything is secondary to that. And so I said, yes. I said yes to a marriage that I should not have said yes to. I was not emotionally or mentally. I, I, how do you say yes to a marriage when you don't even know who yourself is? Yeah. You know, I, it was so unfair to myself and to my spouse at the time, to be quite frank with you. It was... It, we were so incompatible and everyone around me could see how incompatible we were as humans, but I was too prideful. My parents were, I had been told what to do my whole life. My parents were not going to tell me what to do. And I was going to go ahead with it, you know, and I did. And the purity teachings really come into play. Here, yeah. I really debated on whether or not to talk about this because it is very personal, only a handful of people I've ever talked to about. But um, I'm so sorry. Um, so I never made this connection before, actually this past year. When I got married, I was terrified on my wedding night. I had never seen a naked man. I had never been seen naked. I hated my body. I was ashamed of it. I was embarrassed of it. I didn't know how sexuality worked. Um, I would ask questions and this is the question, this is the answer was like, oh, you'll figure it out, sweetheart, on your wedding night. It, it'll just all work out. <clears throat> and I was so scared and it was painful. And um, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is so awkward. This is so much anxiety. This is not like the movies. And, and it had built up to be this It's supposed to be yes. amazing moment between spouses and, and it was not that connecting. way. Yeah. And part of that was we, um, we weren't super emotionally compatible and, uh, we didn't know each other very well. Um, after we got engaged, he went home. Um, he was, and worked, in the middle of the semester, he was like on a block break. And so we didn't hook up again. He asked me to marry him. He left a few weeks later and we didn't hook up until two weeks before our wedding for me to go meet his family. And, and I just back. have to clarify, hook up means different things. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm so, yes. no, no, you're, yes. you mean okay. going on a date before you got married. Yeah, yeah. we didn't yeah. Um, just reconnect. Yeah, we didn't to reconnect. Get back together. <laughs> get back together. Yes. Yes. I was like, I got to clarify yes, that. We did you. not have intercourse. <laughs> thank you very much for clarifying that. <laughs> because we have, yeah. I was like, so we know, we were like, I'm a good girl. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> They're always telling me my kids are. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that, mom. I wouldn't say that, Kelly. Um, so I, this anxiety around sexuality and intimacy was a huge problem because I could not turn off the thoughts of anxiety and dirty. I felt dirty after intercourse. In fact, I know this is probably too much information, but I, I would take a shower afterwards because I just wanted to wash it off of me, everything. Well, like, it's just how are you supposed to, and once again, this is when you'll hear my side, it's just interesting to hear the two different dynamics of her doing, quote, the right thing and waiting until marriage and mm -hmm. doing all of that and how that affected you, that you couldn't turn off 
what you because no. you did the right things. You were like, I'm I'm hitting these checklists. I'm yeah, doing the what thought I'm stopping, to be. thought stopping, thought yes. stopping. So yeah. how are on your wedding night are you supposed to just switch that off? How are you supposed to just turn that off? And now this and is maybe supposed for to be some open. they can. Yeah, but there's a lot of women. It's but not I that could way. Not. I yeah. could not. And I I was embarrassed. I was I had anxiety. There was we did not talk about it. My spouse and I, and it drove farther and farther us apart because it, I went in this direction mm -hmm. of anxiety, embarrassment, shame. And he's like, okay, he doesn't want to hurt me. And it was painful for me. And you, he's mm -hmm. trying to make you know me comfortable and want to, and mm -hmm. it drove him in a behavior that just made our behaviors farther and farther apart fr from each other. Yeah. And I, I don't want to go into it very much, but we, I said, you know, it was, it played out. I was married for six years and he and I eventually divorced and, and we fought quite a bit. And I remember a year being married about a year and we, we were fighting and he left and I, he left and slammed the door. And I, when I get angry, I feel like I have this electricity inside of me. I just am like, Oh, and I picked up this candle and I shattered it on the ground and I just dropped to my knees and I was just sobbing and sobbing and we were still in Rexburg. We, he was in his, uh, finishing his degree. We had just thought we were in our final semester there. I was just working full time cause I had graduated the year earlier. And, um, so I just was sobbing. I, I just, this whole marriage, this is, not this is not what it was supposed to be. Like, I don't even know what it was supposed to be, but I don't, and I didn't know how to <clears throat> fix it. I didn't know how to change myself and change him and change our marriage. And, um, I picked up a piece of glass and I, to this day, have no idea what possessed me to slice the top of my hand, but I'm sobbing and sobbing and I pick up this glass and I look at it and it's jagged and I just slice the top of this hand and I see, and it wasn't very hard, but it was enough to draw blood and I see the blood come out. And simultaneously as the blood come out, I just, all that anger and sadness just seeped out of that. And I just went numb. And that numbness was a relief. I know that sounds really messed well, the up. The numbness was better than anger. The, the numbness was better than the pain. Yeah. And so I cleaned up the candle and I went to bed. And I thought, I'm psychotic. Because who does that? Well, and you didn't know that I'd cutting was a thing. I'd never even heard of cutting. Yeah. Genuinely. Like, because this is really pre-internet and pre yeah. people don't really go to psychologists and, talk, and, and you talk, talk about, about mental health. Things or mental yeah. health. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea. What you were doing. What the, you were emotionally regulating in the best way you yeah. knew how. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So for two weeks, I, prob I probably engaged in this behavior for a couple weeks, for two to three times a week. And I would cut the top of my legs with a razor blade. And I, it was when I felt, it was usually after a fight or after intercourse because I just felt so sad and so dirty and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And that numbness, there was something about watching the blood come out that just made those emotions just, cause I just remember I have big emotions and I don't know how to deal with them. And oh my goodness, this allowed me to deal with it, even though I'm going crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't know what this means or anything. So two weeks go by and I write a letter. I type a letter. I'm 21 years old. I type a letter to my Bishop asking to have my name removed from the records of the church. And I don't send the letter, you know, those Square discs. <laughs> we saved all our floppy discs. So, yes, yeah, so floppy disk. <laughs> I saved it on that. I didn't own a computer, so I had to do it at the computer lab on campus. And a week goes by. And I get a call from a bishop. And he invites me into his office on campus. Now I'm in a married ward at Rick's College, and my bishop is a religion professor. He's not my religion professor. He's just a religion professor there, but he's my bishop. And he, we're chit-chatting. And he asks me, after, after chit-chatting for a little while, he goes, I wanted to ask you if you knew why you were here. And I said, no, why? And he says, because I've had the strongest impression this week that I needed to meet with you. 
And I didn't really know him. I was the in homemaking leader at the time. So, I mean, I, I had a calling, but I, I didn't really know him personally. And he said, I just had no idea why. So I've just been putting it off, but I just was slammed with this inspiration today. So I thought, okay, fine, I'll call her. I'll call her in. I have no idea what, what I'm supposed to say to her. So I was hoping you could tell me. And I just started crying and I told him about the letter I had written. And I told him about my issues and concerns with the temple. And when we had gotten married in the temple, in Mount Tipignogos Temple, I was just so angry when I went to the temple. Do you want to tell that temple experience? I'll, I'll share a little bit of it. Whatever you're comfortable mm -hmm. sharing. I know that I, for, yeah. for Mormons, talking about the temple is very sacred. Yeah, and I want and, to be respectful. Yeah. But just overall, I was not prepared to go to the temple. I had never taken a temple prep class. Um, I didn't. I'm not a person that thinks in symbols, to be quite frank with you. Um, I just want direct information that I think symbols and parables and stories is like... Mm -hmm. roundabout obnoxious ways to give information. And so I just, just tell me the information. And so it was, it was just difficult for me. And what I struggled the most with was it was very blatant to me. Remember hypervigilant at age 11, all I could see when I went to the temple was the male dominance and the female subservience. Patriarchy. Yeah. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't even concentrate on anything else. I would be so livid and I'd be like, I'd be praying. Sometimes I would fast before I went like, okay, please help me to focus and have the spirit. Please help me to just, you know, um, be enlightened, whatever I'm supposed to learn because I never, what, what information was in the temple was not anything new with regards to what I had been taught previously, it was just presented in a symbolic way. And I remember um, in my letter, um, you know, bringing up the letter about the temple and my, my intense issues with it. And so my bishop, he asked me to write down all my issues. And so one of my issues was the temple. I was, I wanted to know why women had to cover their heads and why um, God is was so, I just viewed Okay. I just viewed God at this time in my life and I don't feel this way now, but I don't feel like we, we talk about honest things. We're not honest in the church with each other. And we, and so we look at people who are serving in all these callings and, and we think that they never have inappropriate thoughts or mm -hmm. questions or, or perfect, beliefs yeah. that are just like so amazing in their testimony. And to be quite honest with you at this time in my life, all I could see that God was the most sexist, bigoted, racist, nitpicky, judgmental, wrath, human divinity in existence. And I wanted no part of his church. And I knew I was going to go to hell for that. I, I knew because I, I knew he was right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, there was something deeply wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't agree with what I had been taught with in seminary that I've know the, the scriptures, the book of Mormon scripture wording has been altered since I was in seminary. But when I was in seminary, I was taught that I had to live the law of polygamy and that I had to have a good attitude about it or I would be destroyed like Emma. I was taught that the gradient of your skin color from blackest of black to whitest of white was a gradient of value. White being the most valuable, pure. Black being mm -hmm. descendants of Cain, fence sitters in heaven, unworthy of the same blessings as white people. And Native Americans were descendants, direct descendants from Lamanites. And I was taught at firesides and I was taught in seminary that and in manuals and in in Sunday school that and the scriptures specifically said in the Book of Mormon that they would become a white and delightsome people as the Native Once Americans they righteous right. yes yeah and their skin color would literally change yeah. that is what I was taught yeah. I and blacks in the priesthood they were not allowed to have the priesthood because they were descendants of Cain God did not deem that 
worthy them worthy of that for whatever reason we don't know. We just have to have faith until 1978 revelation, the year I was born. All, none of that, all, all of that. I just, it did not yeah. sit well with me, but who could I talk to about it? Nobody. Mm -hmm. So I write in my journal. That's who I journal. I don't tell God because he already knows my thoughts. Like I already know I'm going to hell. And so I just, I just couldn't do it. Like I just emotionally, I did. I thought God was, mm -hmm. I didn't think he was a good divine father. <laughs> father. Yeah. And um, so my bishop asked me to just write down all my thoughts and feelings. <laughs> and he said he would research them oh, okay. and that we could talk about them together. Mm. And he had written, he was an author and I just don't remember his last name, but he had authored some books that were sold at Deseret Book. And I remember um, buying a couple of them. One was a religious novel. Some were fiction novels. And so oh, I met with him over a, a course of some time and he pacified me. And one of the things that has stuck with me my whole life, which I've reiterated to my children a million times is he told me that prophets can only receive inspiration. Okay. How did he say it? Prophets can only receive inspiration in direct correlation to their intelligence and cultural limitations. And so that's why our world changed tiny incremental mm -hmm. pieces at a time. So when you and look some, back at, so you know, somehow that yeah. pacified me and we talked about Adam and Eve and we yeah. talked about, he researched polygamy with me and um, I took comfort in knowing that um, Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy. So I kind of vilified Brigham Young or in so my you mind. Thought. Yes. Or so I, you thought. No, yeah. yes, totally. So I did I and the website, LDS.org, I went there all the time. At the time it was LDS.org. I know they changed it to Church of Jesus Christ.org. But at LDS.org, I'm I like to read encyclopedias. I would mm -hmm. read the dictionary. I looked up the gospel topics section regularly. Polygamy. It did say Joseph Smith, excuse me, never practiced polygamy. Mm. Women were sealed to him. After, after the fact, but um, he never practiced polygamy. In fact, it said, in fact, the saints never practiced polygamy till they came West. Mm -hmm. So there was something I took comfort in that, like, okay, in the organization of the church, at least, at least in the organization of the church, it, it never started. Somehow mm -hmm. Brigham Young went terribly awry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I it's, was, so it's people, the people, church is right. The yeah. inspiration is people, not yeah the church. And so he said to me in this first meeting, my bishop, um, can you hang tight for just a second? Because I'm just going to go talk to my friend in the psychology department. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure his eyes were, you know, um, to see if he can meet with you. Um, just emotionally, just, I'm like, sure, no problem. Sat there for a while. He comes back. He's like, yes, he's, he had a meeting, but he canceled it and he's yeah. going to meet with you. So oh, wow. he walked me over to his office. The triage. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he like had me meet with him and I met with him quite a few times until I moved. And he was obsessed with this idea that I had experienced some type of sexual trauma in my life as, and a, I, child. as a child or a teenage girl. Um, he explained to me that cutting is, is known as a uh, self harm. I had never heard of that before. And that actually this was fairly common among teen, uh, teenage girls or young adults, girl, females who had experienced some type of sexual trauma. And I was like shocked. I'm like, no, I've never experienced sexual trauma. Like I first time is no, on your yeah. marriage. And like, yeah. And like he kept night. going back to my father, uh, male relatives, you know, like he revisiting that. Like he even thought at one point maybe I had forgotten something, you know, like this this or is he's like, it. this is a deep rooted issue, like you yeah. got. And it's and there was no correlation. Yeah. And and I didn't talk about my sexuality or yeah. um anything. Um I had no core no idea. So I, for three years, struggled on and off with self-harming, with cutting. And it wasn't until I eventually got help that, um, that taught me different coping mechanisms from a, a counselor at one point. But it was years. It wasn't until this last year that I made the connection and learned that I did. Sexual trauma is um, a sexual experience or encounter that is associated with intense fear. 
And unfortunately, I internalized that that and my self-hatred and my disgust of my body and my embarrassment of my body and um, just the always the thought stopping. So I, I was so emotionally immature, sexually immature, worldly immature. I was so naive. I had no idea while I was at Rick's college why people would say to me or giggle. I had no idea why they would giggle when I told them I lived in dorm 69. I had no idea. I had no idea it was a sexual reference. I'm so naive. I mean, to this day, I'm two years ago, we we're driving past a dispensary. Dispensaries are popping up all over Vegas. And I look at my husband, we're driving in the truck and I'm like, Sean, I've noticed these things called dispensaries popping up everywhere. Like, what are they? And he looks at me, I can't even do the face because his face is like, like this smart, like, yeah. are you kidding me? Are you, are you being serious? I'm like, no, I really, I wonder what they, what are they? He's like, that's where they sell marijuana. I'm like, what? How do you know that? And he goes, Everybody. well, yeah. who doesn't know that? I'm like, well, I didn't know that, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. I'm incredibly naive. Like if friends were having sex or drinking alcohol or doing anything in school, I had no idea. And to this day, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I was the kid that you got up. Because you did everything you were supposed yeah, to do. Yeah, that's what up. I was going to say. If you were living a Mormon life like you should, you shouldn't know what those words yeah. are. I went to Tempe, so that's not far away from where you <laughs> yeah. lived. Exact same type of high school. Like, yeah, it's yeah. to be naive is kind of the, like, the status yeah, of a normal yeah. Yeah. Utah County yeah. Mormon girl. Yeah, I had no idea. And what I kind of hear you saying is this purity culture and this naivete and this kind of bubble that you can get in, not all Mormons are going to have experienced yes, this, right, but yeah. if you are hyper conscientious and, and scrupulous and you live in this bubble, you can get to adulthood with a lot of naivete, but also a lot of shaming sexual mm -hmm. messages mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. your body that can amount to spiritual or psychological trauma mm -hmm. when you then marry them with this idea of getting married and yeah. I mean, have sex that's when you huge. thought it was dirty for so long. Absolutely. And that's why he thought it's, it's kind of trauma. Yeah. It's spiritual or psychological yeah. trauma yeah. or abuse a little bit. Maybe. Yeah. And so that's why you thought, yeah. or, you know, the, the counselor you... kept thinking it was when you were a child right. and it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, I mean, there, yeah. Yeah. It was just living night. a Mormon life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it wasn't like, I, I mean, I mean, I don't want to, it wasn't like my husband at the time was, um, mm -hmm. sexually abusing me. Right. He was, it was what he it was did because yeah. he was so, <clears throat> he wanted so badly for me to enjoy, mm -hmm. um, our relationship sexually that he was introducing all these things. I, I was like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, what about this? What about this? You know, like you know, yeah. maybe this will help you or this. And I just was, um, just traumatized, you yeah. know? And, um, I just had no, I just thought he was uh, disgusting. Like yeah. who wants to have sex every day? Like you're some kind of sick pervert, um, yeah. you know? And uh, if there was a, cause a, you, you just, know, you would never course talk of it, about uh, it. Um, I had discovered, you know, pornography mm -hmm. and I was just like, oh my gosh, like mm -hmm. that just made me feel even more. Um, Defiled, dirty. Oh yeah. yes. And I thought, oh my gosh, like I don't look like those women and I'm not, desirable. So my, and I hated my body even more. I didn't understand. I just didn't understand anything to be honest with you yeah. and how it negatively impacted. I had no sexual agency because I didn't understand sexual agency. I thought my sexuality belonged to my spouse and, and I just endured it for the most part. Of course there, I was married for six years. Of course there were times that I enjoyed it. I'm not you know, mm -hmm. right. And, um, but, but for the overwhelming majority of the time, it was, uh, painful. I didn't know that maybe I should go to a doctor about that. I just thought, mm -hmm. you know, nobody talks to you about these things, you or a know, sex therapist, for example, yeah. no, yeah. Yeah. I could have benefited so much, you yeah. know, and sadly I took a lot of, you know, I took some of those things into my marriage with your dad, yeah. you know, those, that body shaming, embarrassment. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's just in the last year that we're, we've been working through things, you know, yeah. and, um, for my, my end and stuff, poor dad. <laughs> and so anyways, um, I just and, and, trying and, to be respectful, but I can't, I am, un, I understand that not everybody internalizes Yeah the mm -hmm. sexual messages yep. this way. Yep. I, I understand I that. And I, I'm not, but you're also not alone. 
I, yes, I can't imagine not. that I'm no, the not. only one. No, to be no. so, I could be maybe more severe, like to cut myself. Yeah, yeah. Scrupulosity is a thing. That is insane. You know, yeah. that I would, that that. Yeah. It drove you to. Drove yeah. me to that. You know, like that is really problematic. And that I wasn't even to, able to identify that for. Yeah. Oh my gosh, how many years is that? Married at 19, yeah. now I'm 43, whatever. Yeah. Do the math. I don't know, 20 something years. Yeah. And I'll just say, as my observation as someone who studied psychology, you know, uh, for as much emphasis as the Mormon church puts on families, uh, the average Mormon couple is woefully unprepared for marriage, psychologically, communications wise, and, and definitely sexually. Yeah. And it, it wreaks havoc on Mormon marriages. Mormon marriages don't necessarily have any better outcomes in terms of divorce rates or marital satisfaction. Mm -hmm. There's just, just the, the marriage therapists in Utah are just six months out so so yeah. busy with all the problems and the sex therapists they're a year out like it's it's ridiculous mm -hmm. all the dysfunction that there really just, is because we nobody talks about and it. i mean there's so much education we get as mormons mm -hmm. two hour now it's two hours of, of church every week and seminary yeah. and institute and religious instruction at mm -hmm. you know at, at church schools in all of those thousands of hours of religious education. Can we get some sex education? Yeah. Can we get some communication education? Even if it's a education? class for newlyweds, you know, like newlyweds. Newlywed or, classes. Yeah. <laughs> in, instead of just like learning the celestial doctrines and the plan of salvation. Yeah. How about just life skills, financial skill, literacy skills, mm -hmm. healthy sexuality? Why not? Like the church is richer than God at this point. Yeah. All these hours of education. Can we, can we Absolutely. invest in these young couples and frankly not rush them into marriage yes. at age Huge. 17 or 18 and then rush them into childbearing at age 19 yeah. or 20? Because we actually know in the social, social science literature that waiting to get married and even waiting to have kids leads to the healthiest outcomes for, for everyone involved. And of course the church is yeah. never in this lifetime going to listen to any of yeah. these things that are being said, but that's what the social science literature, as I understand it would recommend. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and to be quite honest with you, I don't, I have reflected a lot this past year. I don't to this day understand that urgency. Why? I mean, yeah. genuinely, why yeah. is there that, why are we teaching this sense of urgency? Where does that urgency come from? Well, I can tell you that they've done, and honestly, the church leaders have done studies about who stays in the church mm -hmm. and becomes an active, devoted, tithe-paying member. And they've found a correlation between getting married young, um, getting married in the, t going on a mission, getting married young, and uh, getting temple married, and then having kids young. Mm -hmm. That seals people to the church at, at the highest rates. And especially and, women, because they're in your situation where you never finished college. You got married. You're now dependent on your husband. Mm -hmm. You're not going to leave. And you uh, now uh, you have four kids and you don't have an income. How are you going to so you, start your life? Out? Yeah. So and that's another element, too. All of these women, okay, they're they're in a checkbox if they're not going to leave. They have to stay. Mm -hmm. Dependence on a husband. Dependent. Dependence on the church. Dependence on your community. Yeah. You have all these kids. You're so do that early. Dependence, dependence, dependence. Like you're talking about the markers of undue influence that it's a beautiful thing. It could be a beautiful thing to, there's so many happy Mormon families. I was one of them. Mm -hmm. I absolutely yeah. left the church just because it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not because I wasn't particularly having a good time. I was that person who got married at 19 and was sealed uh, mm -hmm. into the church for all of those reasons that you, you mentioned. And yeah, it comes down to an absolute dependence yeah. and nothing. Yeah. Nothing and it's else. not even that the church is like insidious, like no, not not at all. Like lives. No. no, they want yeah. people to yeah. have happy, right. healthy marriages, but mm -hmm. they also Without want the people tools, to though. remain <laughs> Mormons for their entire lives. And so they're just yeah. taking, and they have, believe me, they have social science researchers that know the data. And so they're just trying to optimize to keep people in the church, which is in their self-interest, but it, it really does wreak havoc on, on people's lives. Yeah. And, uh, because it's, not, it's that system doesn't, yeah. it's not built for everyone. And that's, that's like in ways that it can, it's, it's, yeah. it can work for you. Mm -hmm. it clearly didn't work for her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause it it's, sounds like you're a much more black and white thinker. Yes. Oh. I am the hoe of nuance. As we discussed. <laughs> and so you're internalizing these messages in a much different way. Very literally, very literally. And if the church is not giving you tools to think about how to behave mm -hmm. sexually and you're just taught all of these things, you're carrying that from your teen years into your marriage, how else are you supposed to look for things when you're taught that these things are dirty? Mm -hmm. Or I probably had a more nuanced look where I was like, as long as 
the wing rings on my finger. I can think whatever I want to do. We can do whatever we want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of, there's a Facebook group that's really popular. A couple of one for LDS women talking about these things. There's like 60,000 people in it. Really? It's a yeah. humongous group. What's it called? Um, you know, I shouldn't it say it because people are going to go look it up. And I have a lot of things to say in that group. I need to delete all my stuff. But <laughs> there's two of them. There's more than one. There's some for men, women, married couples. Yeah, there's so many. Super popular. Um, people need help. People want to have these You're healthy marriages. Alone. Like yeah. John was saying, people are striving for all of these, this perfection and stuff. And in the area of sexuality, that's where the church is just completely let people fall through the cracks. They don't have the resources that they need. And women are always trying to reach out for, to each other and need resources, need to know what they're allowed to read, what they're allowed to do in the bedroom. That's mm-hmm. a completely mm-hmm. like a whole other world for yeah. a lot of people that they're just completely blind to. As soon as they get married, things of yeah. things are different. Things are hard. It's, it's an important part of marriage and yeah. they're not given the tools. Super important part, yeah. And I do have a real issue with this idea that anyone in the church or in the world has any input on what a married couple does in the bedroom. I just don't know why that is even something that anyone in our religion thinks is in their domain to even discuss, or Mm -hmm. I just, it's fascinating to me now that, yeah, Yeah. there's so many people that are like, what can we do in the bedroom? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, um, and maybe that compels them. Yeah. Maybe they do get, so many questions because we aren't taught to think critically. At least I wasn't, you know, I wasn't taught to think critically. I was actually just taught to go along. In fact, I never really developed my own thoughts and ideas about things. It was like, Oh, what political party is my parents or what, what what does the church say about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I say. You know, I'm asked a question. Um, well, our church says this, you know, our church says this. And so I just adopted all of that. And, yeah. and, and not that what they say is, is bad about everything. Not what, you know, there's so many great things and so many great values and so many great teachings. It's just, I never learned how to critically think, critically think yeah. about which one of those I wanted to internalize and why I just did because that's what they said. Yeah. And what's hard is that's probably I'd say unintentionally by design because what we're studying in on Mormon stories this year is are the markers of undue influence Mm -hmm. and uh, unhealthy organizations, high demand religions and cults. um, They rely on the bite model. They, they control your behavior. They control the information, they control your thoughts and they manipulate you with emotion and the, the B part, the behavior part, any high demand religion has high controls on sexuality and that's Mm -hmm. just how they function. Um, Not to, not, not, you know, not to, negatively stereotype the church or to call it bad names, but you know, Jehovah's witnesses, Scientologists, yeah. evangelical Christians, Orthodox Catholics, Orthodox Jews, they're all in your bed. They're in your business. And that's, mm-hmm. they, they control yeah. what you dress, they control what you eat and they control your sexuality. And that's part of the deal. And there's, there are good things about that from an organizational perspective because it binds you to the organization And of course, if you're feeling guilty and shameful and sad and unworthy, you need the organization to make you whole and clean. Mm -hmm. That's where Jesus and the atonement comes in. And there's that dependency again. And there's that dependency again. But it's just, it's unfortunately not healthy. And I know that the Mormon church wants to not be compared to Scientologists and Jehovah's Witnesses and and other uh, unhealthy organizations. And so it's, you know, safety tip for Salt Lake City, give your... Get out of people's bedrooms if you can. Give them healthy sex education. Empower women to know themselves, to get educated, to figure out what's important to them. And guess what? You'll have less divorces. You'll have healthy, happier members. And you'll have less people coming on Mormon Stories podcast (laughs) talking about how the church wrecked their lives. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So fast forward. um, I I was married for six years. I... uh, had a little boy born with a neuromuscular disease. Um, he spent four months in ICU and came home on life support. Um, they didn't know if he would live. And I was actually given the option to pull him off of life support and terminate his life. And I was just horrified because they didn't even know what was wrong with him. And um, I had a really huge attachment to this little boy. Um, I loved reading the friend magazine when I was a little girl. I think we've established that I loved reading 
about everything. My favorite thing about the friend magazine was, um, when the grid of all the children and, um, they would say like their names, their age and where they were from. So when I was nine years old, I read a two page article about a little boy who had a muscle disease that was baptized. Um, and he was able, it, the, it was a miracle. Like, I think it was like Brady's miracle or something. And it was written by the physician, his physician who was able to make it so Brady could be baptized. And I have read so many friend magazines, so many growing up. I liked to read it even when I was in high school. I, you know, would grab the new era and the friend and read them both. You remember that. That, one. that is to this day, I can visualize the page layout. And every couple years, the, that two page layout would just pop into my head. Which said what? Um, it was about the boy Brady and who had a neuromuscular or who had a muscle disease. I don't know if it was a neuromuscular disease, but he had muscle disease and he was on a ventilator. He had a trach and was on a ventilator. And I just thought it was random because by the time I was like 17, like it had popped into my head enough times that I was like, that is so weird. That just randomly pops into my head every couple of years. And I had this little boy and he's in newborn ICU and a month after he was born, one of the nurses said to me, um, he's probably going to have to go home on a tr with a trach. And I didn't know anybody with a trach. I'd never seen anyone with a trach. I mean, I had seen Christopher Reeves on television with a trach. He was paralyzed after his accident. And that was it. And I was sitting in the hospital and that two page layout came into my head. And I just knew that I was going to have this boy that they didn't know he had a neuromuscular disease at the time. They actually weren't able to diagnose it till he was eight months old. Um, but I knew he was going to have a trach and I knew he was going to be baptized with a trach. And I just I felt like that was Heavenly Father's way of... just preparing me for a very life altering thing in my life. And so when my little boy was a year old, his dad and I got divorced and we were living in American Fork, Utah. And, um, I uh, moved down to Las Vegas with my little boy and moved in with my parents. And about six months after I moved there, my brother came home from his mission. And this is like the biggest regret in my life. Um, I adored my little brother. I loved him so much. He was four years younger than me. And he had served a mission in Japan. And he came home, yeah, from his mission in about six months after I got divorced. So Brandon was not quite two years old. Oh, sorry. Um, my, my son was not quite uh, two years old. And my son had been born while my brother was on his mission. And we wrote letters every week. And he was just like this lifeline for me. I loved getting his letters every week. And I wrote him all about our family and how Brandon, or how my son was doing it. Um, and... When he came home from his mission, about six months after he got home from his mission, he told our family that he was gay. And so this is like 17 years ago. And I was afraid. I was scared. I was sad. I was disappointed. And he and I were walking. We had this two mile loop walkway circular two mile circular walkway loop in the development that I was living in with when I lived with my parents and he was living at home because he had just gone back from his mission and we were walking and I remember him trying to tell me I don't even remember what it was things about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and tithing and I and that he, he couldn't be a member of the church. And I said to him, 
Okay, the virtual stones your viewers are going to throw at me are 100% deserved. I said to him, you are just looking for excuses so you can live a gay lifestyle. Mm. You are so much better than this. Why can't you try harder mm. to be straight? Mm -hmm. And every myth, every myth there is about people who are gay, I believed. I don't even know where they came from. I didn't know anyone who was gay. You just kind of absorb and assimilate things over time. And to say I was ignorant about the LGBTQ community would have been a vast understatement. I believed it was a choice. I believed it was a trial. I believed um, it was not, it was a sin. I believed he would go to hell if he lived that lifestyle. And I even told him that. Hmm. And I told him that I was gonna teach my son to love him and accept him, but that his uncle's lifestyle was a sin and it was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Do you know the damage that that did to him? <laughs> so for years, we tried to have a relationship because I loved him. And I thought by reaching out to him that I was, I was the loving one. I was accepting. I would invite him. He was, um, he was a student <clears throat> at UNLV. And my brother's incredibly intelligent. And as he went through college, I had harder and harder times having conversations with him because he's so smart. And um, he was a, he graduated with a PhD in neuroscience. And I mean, but all I could see was what a disappointment he was and what a failure he was. He could have literally won the Nobel Peace Prize and it wouldn't have mattered to me because he had forfeited his exaltation by choice. And I was angry because I wanted to be with him in the celestial kingdom and he wasn't gonna be there. And I, he would come to family functions sometimes and he sometimes would be agitated and would say things that I felt we're just trying to get a rise out of us, us family members. And the irony is, I thought it was he that had constructed all these walls and barriers and that I was being so loving and accepting that I would ask him about his life and ask him how to go to lunch. And I would never ask him about his partners or anything because I didn't want to encourage that behavior. So if I asked him about his partners, that was condoning the behavior. Mm -hmm. I am so ashamed. I am the classic, this is what not to do <laughs> to a family member. And I never realized until this past year that I was the one. I was the one that brick by brick and mortar put the barrier wall between us. And I was so ignorant and judgmental that I literally in my mind thought it was him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's choosing it. Yeah, Absolutely. He's choosing to be separate from heaven. This is the Mormon mindset. He's choosing to be separated from his heavenly father. He's choosing to break up our family. Uh, an Orthodox Mormon can be angry at an LGBT person thinking it's a choice. I was. And that they're choosing to ruin our, our eternal family, mm -hmm. which is such For a selfish reason. He wasn't it, trying hard enough. Yeah. He needed to try harder. He try was harder. so much better we than have, that. You know, it's all, it's, we all have things we, you know, some of us have diabetes and mm -hmm. some of us have a gene for alcoholism and some people are gay. It's pathologizing it mm -hmm. and then claiming it's, it's something that's a result of lack of effort or lack of purity or lack of righteousness. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so there's righteous indignation is all I'm saying. Yeah. I, oh yeah. Hi, queen of <laughs> Molly Mormon, queen of, 
I mean, I, I recognize that I'm probably don't represent the majority of members of the church. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware of that, but unfortunately that is how I internalized messages and they weren't healthy and they weren't kind. And I was so proud my whole life of how well I kept the commandments. And I just didn't understand why people couldn't do the same thing. Just get your act together. You know, it's not that hard. Yeah. And uh, don't, don't you want to like be exalted? But then on the other side, I was like, the hypocrisy is that I knew I wasn't going to be exalted because I didn't agree with God about some fundamental doctrines that I had been taught. And so there was just that chasm, you know, mm -hmm. and I was, um, you know, kind of just carried on. I served in callings. I read my scriptures every night <laughs> and I tried to heal from a painful divorce and my parents were so amazing and supportive because it wasn't easy having a little boy on life support, um, living with them and taking over their home and their life and the sacrifice that they made for us. And, and then in 2007, I met Kayla Bela's dad and Wow, this is like, so I'm 2005, six, seven, that's. Yeah. yeah. yeah Mormon stories just started by that point. So now. That's right. It's a couple years old. Huh? Now I've got a parallel timeline going. Nice. On. Yeah, yeah. 2007. <laughs> okay. And I just, um, I was serving in the stake primary at the time. And I think your dad was a young men's president. Probably. He was yeah. a young, yes, had he, he was. Had he ever he was. been married previously? Oh, yeah. Yes. He had so been he, married for 14 or 15 years to Kayla's mom. Yeah. Okay, okay. And they had, um, their divorce had been in litigation for a couple of years and then had gotten finalized. Um, and he didn't want to date anybody. The, uh, the mm -hmm. stake. No, I wasn't serving in the stake. That was, oh yeah, I was. Doesn't matter. Okay. Anyways, I don't remember. <laughs> the stake primary president at the time um, was obsessed with introducing us. I knew her because I was serving, that's right, in my ward primary and she knew Sean as just a family friend and loved him and wanted, I mean, everybody in the stake was trying to hook Sean up and, um, sorry, not hook up, uh, introduce, <laughs> people. Yes, introduce. introduce people. And he didn't want to meet anybody until his divorce was final because his brain was, well, I'm technically still married. No way. I'm not going there. So yeah. when, um, she told me about this guy, she fudged a little bit on our ages. She told me that he was in his early thirties. And she told him that I was in my early thirties and we had some uh, mutual friends. And so they just were obsessed with setting us up. And she said, he's really amazing. He, he's divorced. He has four kids. And I was just like, <laughs> Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, um, I remember going home and telling my mom and I'm like, yes, yeah, sign me up for that. And I used my fingers, like <laughs> thumbs like that. Like, Dad, that guy is going to have like massive baggage issues, you know, because I'm the epitome of not having baggage. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> my hypocrisy runs thick in me. And so, um, anyway, so we met on a meet, a meet and greet type thing just to kind of get these everyone off our backs and hit it off. Sh uh, Sean had <laughs> was pres or friends with the state president at the time, and and he like comes over with his wife to just casually meet, you know, like act like they were just to see who I was and stuff. Anyways, um, ironically, the funny thing was, is my uh, bishop at the time, I I hadn't thought of this for a long time, but I did a photo shoot with my, uh, just this past weekend, <laughs> Memorial weekend with my former bishop and his family out in the sand dunes. And um, as we were, I was in the truck with, with him and his boys as we were kind of going over some rocky train. My little car wasn't going to get there. And so he was saying, I had said, can you believe I've been married 14 years? Because he was my bishop when I had to go through the whole um, process to get my cancel, uh, my ceiling to my former husband canceled. And so he said, oh my goodness, has it really been 14 years? And I'm like, I know, isn't that crazy? And he says, it seems like just yesterday when all the bishops were sitting on the stand and listening to you speak at a stake baptism about the Holy ghost and the stake president leaned over to me and whispered, who's that sister's husband? And I said to him, Oh, she's a single sister in my ward. And then he looked at another Bishop and said, Sean, 
Like, <laughs> and so like their bishop is trying to set us up and, you know, so it yeah. is funny, like how, how great just, the church is. Yeah. Like honestly, <laughs> you're honest, to say? setting them up though. Yeah. I, I mean, was, yeah. Yeah. I was grateful in a way because I was you just, never would have met him. No. And I was so, I didn't trust myself and I didn't have a desire to get married again. And, um, so when we, we met and we call it love at second sight because it was super awkward. I mean, people are standing around you looking like, mm. how are they, how are they interacting? Are they getting along? Are they hitting it off? Like, it's so awkward. And so when he asked me like almost six weeks later out onto a date, um, we just hit it off. And so, yeah. And then I met, yeah. So then I yeah. meet This might Kelly. be a good time to yeah, yeah. yeah. Where are you Kayla come in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This, yeah. Kayla comes in. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so Kayla, let's, let's back up. Yeah. And what, I mean, you're seven at the point that they yes. meet, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, you probably didn't have a long and uh, epic <laughs> yes. life, but you had a life. So yeah. what do you want to tell us about your upbringing so, prior to meeting um, There's, uh, it, It's, yeah, this is going to be messy <laughs> for me. Um, so my parents, my mom and my dad, um, have been married for, was it 14 years? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I'm the youngest out of those kids, out of us four. Um, I've got three other brothers and then me. So they've been married um, and... I'm five at the time of their divorce. Obviously, you don't rem really, you know, remember a lot ages like one to three. So two years is all that I, you know, kind of in between there that I remember things. Um, and it wasn't good. It was, um, unfortunately, just a lot of um, small first memories of them fighting um, in other rooms and my older brother holding me um, while I'm crying and trying to comfort me. Um, and so I don't remember anything positive from it. My older brothers say they can remember some things, but I don't because I was just too young. Were they, um, married, were they married in the temple? Yeah. Yep. Were they, did your dad serve a mission? Um, yeah. So he, yeah. So my, my mom, um, both of them grew up in, in Utah and Salt Lake. Um, both of them have gone to church um, through, throughout Mormons. their entire life, raised, raised Mormons, Mormons, everything. Okay. My dad served a mission in Brazil um, and he had some very powerful experiences on his mission that made him very this is the true church. Um, and from that point forward, made sure that it, you know, all of us kids were raised in it. Um, and so even during all those times and stuff, I know that we were going to church, um, even with those hard times with their marriage and everything. Um, so then they, you know, end up um, getting a divorce. But right before that, like I said, in those t just couple memories that I remember, I remember because of, you know, what we're being taught about prayer and everything, I remember being really little and, praying to Heavenly Father to bring comfort to our home because it was obviously divided um, and just so much going on and praying to Heavenly Father and wanting for things to get better. I'm a kid, you know, I don't know. I you know, want just mom and dad to be happy um, and feeling absolutely nothing. And that theme continuing through my life of just ab the absence and hearing everyone around me talk about the spirit and the power of prayer and all of this. And so it's already starting off the bat with just nothing. Um, so then they end up, you know, divorcing. And then I meet Kelly at seven. Um, and this is where, like, I remember, you know, more things. Um, so I meet Kelly at seven and, you know, they get married. And um, now I've got a new uh, step or not stepbrother. I have. A, yeah, stepbrother. <laughs> so I have a new stepbrother, um, completely different family dynamic now with, her, you know, with Kelly and everything. Um, and so. It's, it's, it's definitely weird trying to balance the differences between my family with my mom, um, like being, you know, being with her and then now having Kelly introduced into my life. So I have these two, you know, maternal figures. Um, and you can be completely honest. Yeah. <laughs> so, You're not going to hurt my feelings. Okay. So, <laughs> it was um, hard for them. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was really, it was hard for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, such a huge blunted family. Mm -hmm. And so, but during this entire time, you know, obviously they meet at church. That's how my dad and Kelly are, you know, introduced to each other. So they get married. We're going to church. They get married at the temple. I remember, you know, getting my dress and standing outside. And I remember being really sad that I couldn't go inside and see you guys get married. I didn't understand. I cried. I remember crying outside the temple, wanting to be there um, and not being able to. And so th there was just these, it's just little things, nothing that was like detrimental, but just hurt, like not answering prayers, not being able to see you guys get married and just like little things. People don't, people don't understand that. Why, why were the children not allowed into the, your wedding? Just to, for those who don't. Yeah. Oh, because they, well, you have to have a, a temple recommend. So you have to have a, you 
get asked a series of questions based on your beliefs about the church and based on your behavioral standards of the church. And, and you have to have received an endowment um, mm-hmm. yeah. at 18. At 18. Yeah. You know, or, 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 or you know, I was, 18. I'm actually fuzzy on this because I, uh, you know, I was born in the covenant, so I was just automatically brought into that. But I, but I hear about, I hear about families who, um, who get sealed after joining the church and all the kids are allowed in. True. To, we didn't to get, get sealed. sealed. They, were, we, yeah. we, they weren't sealed. Okay, so it was so, just a temple. And it was that just was them getting married. One of my sons, I, I have one biological son and one biological daughter, yeah. but I consider yeah, all of my every, kids yeah. my kids. So I talk about them that way. So, but one of my uh, step children at the time was had was very concerned about this sealing aspect yeah. when his mom and dad got divorced and it ate away at his soul. And I, I didn't know that at the time, but the, the ceiling is maintained between because my husband did there. He wasn't allowed to get a temple cancellation from his wife. Um, so I technically yeah. uh, to this day, yeah. I mean, that's his, that's his second wife. This yeah. is where Mormon polygamy comes back in because mm-hmm. even though your husband mm-hmm. got civilly Legally, divorced yeah. from mm-hmm. his first wife, your mom, yes, he did not get the ceiling wasn't canceled. Mm-hmm. He's still set to be married to her in the afterlife. And I almost didn't marry him because of that. Right. Mm-hmm. I, but, I but was you did. so yeah. terrified but I mean, of being it, a second wife in eternity. But but just to be clear, when terrified. you got sealed to your Absolutely. Second, I was a second husband, wife. Yes. he was sealed. You were sealed to him as his second wife. Correct. Mm-hmm. And to this day, you're saying he's sealed. Even to, to this to, day. To, to yeah. Why still, didn't he cancel it? They're not, men are not allowed to. Men, oh. men. The, Under rare the, exceptions. The, the, and this is just like where, this is like Mormon crazy. My understanding is unless. He tried to. He wanted to get. No, no, no. He wanted to get a unless temple Unless the first wife. This is why everyone needs to read the book, um, The Ghost of Mormon Polygamy by Carolyn Pearson. Yeah. Because this is mm-hmm. a, this mm-hmm. is something that it's like this hidden, not hidden, but like this spiritual, psychological trauma that so many women face in Mormonism in 2021 to this day. But my understanding of the the church policy is that the only, so husband and wife get married, they get sealed in the temple, and then they get divorced. The husband can remarry two, three, four, five times and get, and be sealed to each woman. So marriage two gets sealed to the woman, they get divorced. Marriage three gets sealed to the woman, they get divorced. By the time he's dead, um, five wives in Mormon heaven, mm-hmm. all sealed to him. The The first wife won't have her ceiling broken to her first husband unless she finds another worthy Mormon husband to get married to. Mm-hmm. And she has to file or petition for that ceiling to be removed. And the, and the first wife has to sign off. And there's all this like investigation, investigative work. And the husband doesn't have to deal with any of that. If, if he wants to get remarried multiple times, it's just each, it's just simple. Yeah. It's approved. It's this weird, corrupt, abusive, psychologically damaging mm-hmm. practice. And there is some but, but serious I, I'm guessing, investigation work too. And that went behind yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, that's almost mm-hmm. like a legal thing. But your yeah. your mom has not remarried to a Mormon man she in the not. temple. And that's why yes. that's yes. why your dad's yeah. still sealed to your And I mom. didn't know that until years later and was very disturbed by that too. Um but yeah, so yeah, not being able to go into the temple for their for their wedding was not also just adding this, these little annoyances, just like how you said, like I, you growing up. Yeah, And I mean, I, that's another thing, the Mormon temple ceremony where only Mormons get to go in. Yeah. So if your parents or your siblings or your children or whatever, aren't active, faithful Orthodox Mormons with the temple recommend they're excluded from the wedding. Yeah. So if you convert a woman and she marries you and her parents are not members of the church, sorry, they sit outside the wedding and that's awful. Um, mm-hmm. But also I didn't, I didn't get to see my older siblings weddings because you were too young because I was too young. So kids aren't allowed into the weddings in yeah. the Mormon temple. And this is all like way too much control and way too coercive. Yeah. It's, it's For kind of abusive. Be- uh, it's, it's again, where high demand religions get it wrong. Mormon church, fix your, your, Temple wedding marriage policies. Def- okay. No, def- definitely. I hope that wasn't a No, I trail, agree. But, <laughs> definitely. But and that's then, why you weren't at your parents. Yeah, yeah. Your dad's second wedding, Yes. Right? And, and yeah, and I think something that could have 
been helpful to yes, bring us closer I was together. Just say that. That was another layer of they, my, I all don't. My children were suffering. And yeah, and then that was another. They're getting married, yeah. and we're not even there. We're not a part of it. It was just, yeah, yeah. And we chose not to have a reception or anything because the second marriage, you guys just wanted it, to keep and, it. And yeah. Our oldest son was really struggling, and we felt like to just maybe let not to make it easier on everybody. Easier for every like. Um, I think there was so much embarrassment when your parents get divorced. And never really understood until my oldest son was older how much he internalized and how much embarrassment and shame he had. And so we just didn't want to have a, make a big to do about it to add yeah. to that hurt, like rub yeah. salt yeah. in my right, kids' right, wounds right. that your parents aren't together. Yeah. yeah. You know? um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So then Kelly, you know, is now in our lives and living at home and with everybody. And I just remember definitely dynamic changing, um, with the relationship with my dad, um, through the divorce. And then for those years, I was his little girl slept in the bed with him. Um, very close. Um, and then getting older, um, with now Kelly introduced and I, and even then I, um, I'm just, I love everybody. I'm just, <laughs> I want to be friends with everybody. I, um, I, I give everybody benefit of the doubt. Um, and so when Kelly, you know, comes into our lives and everything like that, obviously our family dynamics going to change. Kelly, I'm not going to see with my dad anymore. I have my, I need to go to my own room. So Kelly's taking my dad, like, mm -hmm. um, and not only is she taking him, but our, our family is different and we, it's normal church stuff. It's going to church every Sunday. And there's these priorities that, like I said, I was younger with my dad, so I don't remember them. Maybe I, maybe it was the same and I just don't remember. But so many more of these priorities that we were hitting these checklists as a family. Um, and especially, I feel like we were trying to prove mm -hmm. because divorce isn't looked highly upon, you know, in, the, in LDS. Although it's super prevalent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that we were trying to prove so hard that we were a functioning amazing blended family. That's fair. And that it... There's that element. Yeah. yeah. And so it was just us going to church, doing all of these things, you never really getting to know me or any of the boys, but making sure that we were going to church and going to, um, <laughs> you know, like activities and, and that the boys were going to scouts. And it, it, it we never actually connected as a family. It was just, okay, now you're my new mom and, you know, stepmom and we're doing these things. Does it kind of fill the slots and yeah. look, look perfect kind yes. of thing? And Maybe. so we continue on with that. And I just feel as more and more time goes by, even just as a kid, I am losing the relationship with my dad and that he has other priorities and all these, he's been in so many different callings and is being dragged so many different ways that I am kind of by myself. I have my brothers, but we're not really close yet. Um, and I don't feel ever, ever comfortable talking to Kelly and not really my mom either. So I'm just been kind of alone and it kind of stays that way um, until then once I get into, you know, elementary school. And I just remember having so much anxiety about my parents because my mom and dad do not like each other. And in elementary school, I would lie about, and I did it in middle, and I even did it in high school. I would lie about... Um, events, school events, because I didn't want them being in the same room. So in third grade, I would tell my dad, Hey, I have this Christmas choir concert on the 25th. And then I would tell my mom, Hey, the graduation's on the first or whatever. So that they would come different times. They had come on the same day for something. And I legit had a panic attack in the bathroom, freaking out that they were in the same room together. And Kelly come, I, I just remember Kelly coming in and being like, what is wrong? Like you've been in here for 10, 20 minutes. Um, and I'm just hyperventilating, crying and saying, mom and dad are, you know, in the same space. And she's like, it's okay. It's fine. Um, but it wasn't fine. And, it, <laughs> and just having to deal with that. And so once again, it's just creating these boundaries between all of the people, adults in my life that I don't have a connection with. I can't speak to them. I can't be honest about anything. Um, so then I get into middle school and I am trying new things. I'm in orchestra and I join the dance team and then I do cheerleading and um, I'm making friends and I, you know, I'm turning into a young woman. Um, and so I'm getting attention and, and validation from boys my age. And this is, I don't want to say it's the first time because I know that 
my family loves me and they would give me attention and stuff, but it was in a different way. It was, you're so great and you're so amazing. And, you know, boys talking to me. And so I fed into that and I knew that I wasn't supposed to because I wasn't 16. So of course I didn't say anything. That was just another layer of me We're hiding to date. Okay. So I'm hiding all of this. Yeah. Because for, it, yes. And in, in LDS culture, it's recommended in like the strength of youth that you do not date until you're 16 years old. And even then it's not steady dating. It's, um, yeah. And not being alone, no sex, you know, no sexual things happening, um, anything like that. And so I'm, 13, 14, and I'm talking to a boy who is also LDS and we just get more and more and more serious. And we're trying not to, because we both know this is not what we were supposed to be doing. Um, but I unhealthily just put so much energy and effort into him because I wasn't getting it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, in, in some ways, I'm glad because it, it made me the person that I am today, the, the experiences that, that happened. But in other ways, it just makes me sad that I was so alone and that this is how it ended up happening. So I, we're dating, definitely boyfriend and girlfriend, and I'm only 14 and um, end up losing my virginity to him. Um, but like I said, both of us LDS. And I didn't feel guilty about it. I loved him. We had been dating for a while, as much as 14 year olds can. And I, yeah, I remember not feeling really guilty about it and feeling like what on earth is wrong with me? Because I should feel guilty. I did it. It was in the moment type thing, but something is wrong. Like with me, the church is true and I'm just messed up. And then in young women's, they're talking about modesty. And, um, I just had this feeling that all these like leaders thought of me as just, temptress and tempting to all the boys in our ward and everything um, that I just felt like an outcast even within the ward. And they always talk about the young men in the light of, you know, women having to dress modestly for them. They never talk about young women having sexual thoughts or feelings or anything. So I, once again, am reclusing into a corner even more because I'm alone. I'm sitting in young women's looking at the other girls around me and thinking none of them are looking at their, you know, their crushes and, and wanting to like make out or, or, you know, do things with them. I'm just crazy. I like, I have a serious problem <laughs> because they don't talk about sex and especially for women. Um, and they, and once again, it's, you're a teenager, your hormones are through the roof. Like, how are you, you know, like it, it's not just the young men are having these emotions. It's young women too. And so it's your fault, Kayla, because you weren't practicing thought stuff. Yeah. Right? Yes. I wasn't doing the thought stopping techniques. <laughs> and, so, totally <laughs> and so, and so John's like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, like I said, we're closing that corner even more, just getting all the validation and attention from him that we are actively, we're sexually active and um, no birth control, no, mm. n nothing, because who am I going to go to? And I'm not going to like, y yeah. do sex ed, right? Yeah, nothing, nothing. And I'm, and I was so young that I hadn't even gotten into high school when they teach sex ed. And so I just, so yeah, not great decisions. <laughs> um, but a lot of it was just, like I said, just wanting that love. Um, and so this goes on. And this is just where a huge pitiful moment, the worst experience of my entire life. Um, we're continuing our relationship and texting. And I, um, I got to be careful about this because he, um, I know that he's a good person and has a life and is continuing and everything. And I wish the best for him. Um, and both of us made mistakes. But there were times where I did not want to participate in things sexually and I was forced to or cursed whatever you want to however you want to say that and once again with no sexual education or anything I didn't know that I could say no um and never talked to anybody about it um until recently um and there was just one moment, like Callie said, how you just got pictures in your head, um, that there's a picture in my head of being in his room with my face down, looking into a mirror in the side and just looking at my blank face. Um, 
and not wanting to be there. Um, but continuing on, continuing this relationship in an unhealthy way for both of us. And I know that he wasn't educated sexually as well. So I'm not going to put that blame all the way onto him as well. Um, and so we get to the point where dating everything and he also would, when he was upset, I'm putting parentheses here, or quotations here, not parentheses, quotations. When he was upset, he would request that I um, do things sexually um, to make him feel better. And I was texting him as what he wanted. And his mom ended up taking his phone and pretending to be him and let it on. And I sent pictures, I sent texts. She literally entrapped me. Mm. Um, and you didn't know this until a couple of days ago. She thought that the young man had gone to the bishop and said, hey, I want to stop this now. Mm. It wasn't him. And that also perpetuated the thing of I, I got mm -hmm. blamed, especially by my parents, because they thought that I was the one that was wanting everything. And he finally was like, no, we're putting a stop to this. That wasn't the case his mother did. Um, and went to the bishop who was how old, 70, 80s with these pe pictures and text messages and mm. outed me basically. Um, so and that, I, So that you could be blamed and not her son? I, th um, I don't know what the motive of that yeah, was, of course, of course. but even then that shows it too, that she didn't contact my parents and say, they're young, we need to figure this out. She went to the bishop. Mm -hmm. The bishop calls my dad on a Tuesday and says, I need to meet with Kayla tonight. And I know what's happening. He stops responding to my texts, everything I had. I just had a gut feeling. I was like, he, his mom found out. And my dad knocks on my door. And at this point, like I said, we don't have a relationship. It's gone now. Through the years of me feeling so unbelievably separated, um, he knocks on my door and he goes, the bishop wants to talk tonight. Is there something you need to tell me? And I, no. Even though I knew that I would have to, of course. I just said I wanted to put it off as long as I could because I knew I was about to be a massive disappointment. Mm -hmm. So I just said, no. <laughs> and we go to the um, church building. No one's there. It's just our fam, just me, my dad and Kelly. And he goes, okay, I want to talk to Kayla first. So my parents are sitting outside of the room. Mm. I go in. And I have to tell him everything. He wants the details. He wants me. How what many types of questions is he? How many times? Oh my gosh. Yeah. And um, how age are you again? I'm 14. 14. Um, yeah. How many times? What types of se I, sexual thing? I don't, I know this is a podcast, so I don't know how much I can no, no, say. You know, it's important so that saying, we yeah. learn to stop doing these things. Yeah. So it's not to be graphic okay. or explicit. Okay. It's to educate. That's the only okay. time. And I was horrified. I didn't know all the explicitness yeah. of these, the details of these questions until Because you're not in the recently, room, which is right? its own problem. And yeah, I even told my husband and I mean, so you're, he's, he's horrified so about what you're happened. You're 14, you're yeah. alone with a Mormon adult bishop man and he's asking yes you. and not 30s or 40s 50s i mean like 70s, 70s. Yeah. um and so yeah how, like how many times um orally questions like that um just also and then it. When, yes and times yes um masturbation yes like <sighs> masturbation as well just literally everything mm -hmm. um and then as traumatic as that was crying horrified. He then asked my parents to come into the room and says, what do you need to tell them? And I mean, mm. how long did I sit there in silence? Long time. I just sat there mm. just in silence. He wanted me to tell my parents with him in the room. And I don't even remember what I exactly said. I don't know if I said I have, I've had sex mm -hmm. or yeah. it was something like that. And I just said it. I genuinely don't remember anything after that. I th my brain has, I don't remember. I just remember saying it. I remember that experience. And I don't remember much after that. We were obviously completely cut off from each other. Mm -hmm. um, our families, like, you know, no contact, everything. But we went to the same school. We a took very, your phone, your yeah, iPod. Everything gone. We hardcore punished her. Yeah. Were you in the, was it you or her mom? Me. Room. She was in the room. So it was my dad and, and She's Kelly. The first okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then... Um, an, an, another experience I don't want to go into happens with the same boy. Um, and I 
need to move. I had to move schools to go to the school that my brother was going to. Um, and at this point, obviously I, um, I'm not allowed to take the sacrament as my bishop requested. I needed to repent. And why um, can you go to account, see a professional counselor? Yes. They're, yes. They're making me see, messed up. They're making me see a counselor, an LDS counselor mm-hmm. who I knew I tried to open up and talk to her about something, but then knew that she ended up telling you guys about things. So then I never said anything ever again. Whenever we'd went, I wouldn't talk to her. Yeah. She told us everything. Kayla. Everything. So there was no trust. Privacy. Yeah. No privacy, no trust, anything. Um, and we punished her more. Yeah, after finding out what my thoughts were. So in church, I'm sitting there. Everybody knows, everyone. He's not in the ward anymore. His family's making him go to his sister's ward. I have to stay there. And everyone's taking the sacrament, and I have to take it with my right hand and pass it on. Because? Because it's, I have sinned so bad that I can't take the sacrament. Like I, the, the bishop said that I could not participate in the sacrament and taking the bread and water. Um, and this is in the first hour of church where the entire congregation is there. The families, other kids my age, everyone is there. So I bet I was just more hyper-focused on it because I was so terrified. I don't even know how many people noticed or anything, but in, that is shaming inside of me mm-hmm. of having to grab it and give it to the next person and not taking it. I'm like, everybody's looking at me. Everybody knows. Everybody's judging me. And it w- every Sunday, it was awful. And... I, and I felt like she deserved it. She deserved to feel that shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just got to the point where I was a brat at first with it. And you guys wanted me, they wanted me to repent so bad. And mm-hmm. I was like, I love them. I don't feel bad. Mm-hmm. And I, that made them so mm-hmm. mad. Like, what is wrong with her? That's mm-hmm. so mad. What is wrong with her? Um, and then I, I ended up getting to the point where I was just so broken because of it that I just was like, yeah, I, I repented and was just mm-hmm. numb. I was like, yeah, like, yeah, I don't, I yeah, I, I mean, did. I took him you and to and from counseling for months. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And it was with, yeah. Yeah. So I had to deal with that. And I remember even at one point, a boy in my ward, when time had gone by a little bit better, I had felt a little bit better with interacting with people because I had basically shut off you from were the super, world. You super, super suicidal though. Oh, yes. And yes. I was angry with you for it, being suicidal. Yeah. Because I thought it was a manipulation tactic to yes. um, defer her bad choices. Yeah. <sighs> Um, that's was, horrible. I know it's horrible. I'm no, so embarrassed. No, no, I'm no. so embarrassed. Yeah. No. <laughs> Can I ask something? Yeah. Cause we're, I know that we're going to get to kind of your faith deconstruction, yes. but sorry, I have to ask this. How much of, how would you have parented this situation different if you were not religious, <laughs> if this was not even right. an issue well, with going to the bishop? Yeah. Cause it is, that is a problem that you're having unprotected sex at 14. And, and at 14, that's young. That's young to be yes. getting in these kind of relationships. So it's like the church is used as this like bully pulpit that you're able to smack your kid over the oh, head with God it. wants you to repent. And if, if you're saying Kayla, that like mm-hmm. I repented, I'm done, I'm fine. I'm good with God on it. Mm-hmm. Like, why isn't a child, why isn't anyone able to say, yep, you should validate that. You should mm-hmm. say that I've repented. But when the church gets involved, you're able as a parent to make sure that your child feels worse, that you're able to go and meddle in their business in such a high degree, like you were saying earlier about the way that you viewed a very vengeful God. Like how does all of that play into how you handled the situation then versus if you didn't have the church, how would you have handled it in the most healthy way? I think I modeled the, I modeled what I viewed God was. You're going to do what I say because I said, because I said so. This is the correct way. Mm-hmm. I was, I'm a binary thinker. I grew up in a home and a church culture at the time that was, you don't like what I say, get out of my house. Mm-hmm. You don't agree, keep your mouth shut. You can have your opinions and your thoughts, mm-hmm. but keep them to yourself. It's hard to you imagine, know, honestly. Get out. You don't like, you know, yeah. like uh, the apostates and stuff. Like, you know, I, I think very differently now, but at the time I'm like, what's their problem? Like, okay, so you don't agree. Get out. No one's making you stay here. Like, I was just so. It's hard to imagine though, yeah. honestly. I wish I could go back. Yeah. I don't know how she time. would have handled it. It's hard for, even as the person that she's grown to today, I can't imagine how you would have, how you guys would have handled that. How would you have? I have, to be quite honest with you, if I could go back um, and some of my saddest tears this past year have been around how I've treated my brother and how I've treated Kayla Bela. And um, I wish I could go back. I mean, she was seven when we got married. She was not loved and accepted and adored and 
encouraged. All I could see is what Kayla was not, what Kayla was not doing. That's inappropriate. That's not appropriate. I mean, what, mm-hmm. a thousand times uh, you guys make fun of me by crying, that's not appropriate. That's yeah. inappropriate. Because that's how, that was like that's a real in my life. That's not appropriate, kids. That's inappropriate, kids. And it was all about appropriateness, you know, and inappropriateness. And if I wish I could go back from day one, not even that situation, mm. because I firmly believe that that was generated not because Kayla's broken, not because there's something seriously wrong with Kayla, but Kayla had no one to confide in. Her brothers teased her. They made fun of her. I was not warm and kind to her. I was overwhelmed and discouraged. And this was not exactly the life I had wanted. Like I was so overwhelmed and I was very administrative. And I wish I could go back and just hug yeah. her and love her and know her and be part of her life and get have all of the kids go to counseling. They were grieving, processing their mom and dad's divorce. They didn't want me, they wanted their mom. And I was too emotionally immature to value that. I was so emotionally immature, that hurt my feelings. Like I am embarrassed to say that, but I was jealous of their love for their mom. And I'm horrified, I mean, now. I want nothing now for them. I mean, for years, I've not, I want nothing for them to have a loving, good relationship with their mom. But I was jealous because I felt like I was doing all the work and I didn't get the love and devotion. And um, mm-hmm. I was so much immature, you know? Yeah. So, so how I would have parented would have, I wish I could go back yeah. and, and do it all over. And honestly. And not shame her. With And I'll get into a little bit more, but keep in mind with throughout this entire thing, like I said, I genuinely wouldn't go back because it's, it is the reason that I am who I am today. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, le- and if it's okay, yeah. let me just ask one follow-up question too. When um, parents and, and I, I made tons of mistakes, mm-hmm. even as a progressive Mormon dad mm-hmm. with my kids that I really regret. Um, and even when a Bishop or, you know, Mormon church leaders, when they're, uh, grilling you when they're doing this inquisition, when they're asking these sexually explicit questions, when they're meeting out a punishment and disfellowshipping you mm-hmm. and punishing you to not take the sacrament. Um, they're in their minds, just like with you and your brother, they're trying to help you. They're trying to help you mm-hmm. stay righteous, yeah. help you stay clean, help you stay pure, keep you from STIs, keep you from yeah. an unwanted pregnancy, yeah. keep you pure for marriage. All those reasons, that's their intent. Yeah. What I want you to speak to really quick is how is it experienced? How is it harmful when you're 14? How does, it, how, how does that well-intended punishment mm-hmm. How is that actually experienced and what does that do to you in terms of helping or harming you? Yeah. And take as much time as you want on that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that it helped in any way it, that definitely harmed my relationship with the church. So it definitely the opposite of what the intention was of all of this, you know, surrounding gospel principles and things that we think that should, you know, should be right. It drove me further away for sure. Um, not that I was insanely faithful before. Like I said, I'd pray and felt nothing and blah, blah, blah. But at this entire time, I'm thinking something's just wrong with me, but the church is true. It's just me. So this just, it just tr- dug that even further of, yep, there's something wrong with me. And like, it's my fault that I'm in this situation. I never put the I never truly looked at the adults around the bishop and my parents and the other adults in my ward that were definitely judging me and and talking about me to other people. I never looked at them and not like really thought that they were in the wrong. It was, was, it was still me. Um, And I'm going to say, and now that I'm older and I realize, no, that's not true. (laughs) And that it was really sad that as a 14 year old, that that was all put on me. Um, But yeah, it just drove me further away from the church and it didn't, it didn't help build a testimony. I had fake repented so that they would get off my back. Which is you learning to what? Lie and to see, and and I, at that point already was, I was having to further and further lie to, to try and get out of these things because it wasn't worth it. And I can't talk to anybody, honestly. I'm not going to go to my bishop, especially after that traumatic experience and talk to him about how I'm feeling. Like that's like, it's not going to happen. And especially my parents who I'm just, 
they're ashamed because everybody in the ward, they have this Mm -hmm. slut daughter, you know, like Mm -hmm. that I'm not going to talk to them. There's no one. And who am I going to talk to other 14 year olds my age? Like that's, you know, so completely, completely alone. Um, yeah. So it just drove me further away from the church. It did not benefit in any way that even though it was well-intended, it did not, it was, it did not be, it was not perceived that way. And it did not end up sinking in that way. How about how you felt about yourself? Absolutely horrible. Um, lowest point in my entire life and think it will definitely stay up there. I know I'm only 21, so I've got years to go, but I think it will stay as one of the most traumatic experiences. And I got to the point where I was extremely suicidal. Um, Why? Like what was behind that? That one's feeling completely alone. So the one person that I had felt love and everything from, I'm literally cut off from, we didn't get to speak. It it was a cut off there was no closure. There was nothing. Instant, instant cut off. Um, so and no we micromanaged her to make sure it stayed yeah. cut off. Um, so no closure, um, with a, someone that I loved and I even, yes, it was 14 year old, whatever. I loved him. Um, so no closure from that. Um, already the driving relationship away from my parents is even further now. So, um, and then just being a massive disappointment mm-hmm. too. So mm-hmm. I, I literally just couldn't see in my bubble a way out of it. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't see how this was going to get any better. And especially with the shame that was being brought on to me, why would I want to go to church and continue this? Why would I want to keep going to these things when everybody knows my business? And so every time I went, it just made it even worse. It it's internalized that I don't want to be here and not, not, not even just in church living. I don't, I don't want to be here. Um, And so when that whole experience happened and I had to switch schools and I remember being at my mom's house um, and sitting on the floor for, and this is like a blur too, for like four to five days, didn't shower. Uh, My mom tried to get me to eat. Um, I was so depressed and my mom did try to help me and, um, ask how I was doing and did the best that she could to try and help me, but no one cared. Um, and so that's when I really was just done. And the only reason I made it through that time, um, was because of my older brother who at this point, um, out of all of my siblings, him and I are the most clash. We hate each other. We're so mean to each other, mainly him. I wasn't mean to him actually. He was was really mean to me. (laughs) So we're at this time where he's a senior in high school. I'm a freshman, um, majorly depressed, having to switch schools. And he just went to bat for me. And I don't even mean like trying to talk to my parents, anything like that. It's just was he was there. He um, was made sure that I was with him. We went to seminary every morning together and went to school together. I had lunch with him because I didn't have really any friends. Um, Then he made it so I was in choir with him. So I was with him for two hours out of the day and then I would hang out with him after school. Mm -hmm. And it was just that for an entire year. He got me out of that place that was just Mm -hmm. so hard. And that was another major turning point with the church for me because the church didn't bring me out of that. He did. And he didn't use religion in any way. He was just being a kind brother or person. So that made me even more angry at the church because not only did it cause all, cause all this harm and hurt, but it didn't fix it either. Because I thought, oh, this was all my fault, everything that happened, so the church should be able to fix it. And it didn't, so it just made it even worse. So I'm just getting more and more angry at the church, but I just kind of internalize it. Once again, it's all true, it's just me, but I'm angry. So I get out of that period of time with him during that year of my freshman year of high school with him. And then he's preparing to go on his mission. And I did not want him to go. Um, I knew that when he, everybody talks about, you know, when missionaries leave, they come back and they're not the same. And I wanted my brother and I didn't want him to change. Um, and I was scared to not have him. Um, and so 
one of the funny things too with him is that we never actually talked about anything. He just pretended like nothing was going on. And that made a huge difference. Um, we, he's, he's not an emotional person. He's very, um, but he feels very deeply. deeply. Mm-hmm. So I knew that he cared and he was never going to say it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but so he's preparing to go on his mission. And I honestly could kind of tell that he wasn't excited about it. He it's, he's the third, I have two older brothers and then it's him. They had all gone on missions. He needs to go on a mission. My dad expects it, but I could tell that he wasn't like stoked to go. <laughs> like he, it's just like, Hey, I've got to do this. Um, which made me even more mad at the church. It was just all these things that are just making me so angry. Um, because he, he was taking away my brother and he didn't even really want to go. He didn't say that. I'm not putting words in his mouth, but I could, I just had a feeling that it just looked like he didn't want to. So he leaves. Um, I know the person that is my rock is gone. Um, and I don't date for a while during high school. And then I end up dating again and um, meet in my junior, senior year of high school. Um, I graduated a year early from high school. So I did it in three years. Um, and during that last year, I met my boyfriend that I would end up dating for a really long time. And he was an LDS. And at this point, I'm so far gone of caring because it, everything that had happened, even at this point, I, my dad, I don't care. I don't care that I, I'm, I've already made a major disappointment. So what else am I going to fail in, you know? Um, and so during that freshman year of really hard times, I made a goal to myself that I was going to travel um, and I was going to make that happen. And I don't know why. I think it was like to try and prove people wrong is I was a failure um, to my family, everybody else that saw me in the ward um, in church, that it was just something I wanted to do for myself and to get out of it, just get get out of home, basically. Um, so I did the work to do it. I took the classes to be able to graduate early. I met my boyfriend who had zero religious background. I mean, literally didn't even know the Christmas story. Um, so that was disappointing. I know to them, um, but he was an amazing person, so kind and generous and thought of other people, Mm -hmm. just a genuinely good person. And he didn't have an ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because he's trying to get to heaven. He was doing it because it was the right thing to do. And that's when I started to really question the church because I'm thinking about the people who have hurt me and the bad experiences I've had. And those are bishops and those are people in, you know, higher callings and things like that, but they're going to heaven. But my boyfriend who anytime somebody, you know, his car is, but he he gets pulls out and make sure pushes this person's car. And it's like a good person. He's not going to go to heaven. Like it, it just that once again, the anger just even more. And it just didn't seem fair to me. And he um, is African-American. And I remember wanting to bring him to church because he is this such amazing person, bring him to church. Mm. So even like I said, with the anger and everything, I'm pushing it back because the church is true. It's me. I'm inviting him to church. First time he's ever really been in his entire life. And he is just the token that everybody is just wants him to get baptized. He's been there. Yeah. He's been there for three weeks, three Sundays. And they're like trying to get him to say the prayers and things like that. I'm like, he's never been to church his entire life. Calm down. Missionaries are trying to set up a baptism date three weeks. And we're like, calm down. And he was very blunt and was like, this is not for me. Oh, and I went to Deseret Book and got him. And I bought a Book of Mormon for him. Yeah. And I bought the children's version of the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. And I bought, uh, yeah, you know, to introduce him to and everything. I wrote him a letter and bearing my testimony. And, you know, and I just was, I'm that Mormon that, yeah. hey, you're such a good person. Mm-hmm. You have to be part of this church because mm-hmm. you know? good people don't exist outside <laughs> of the church. Yeah. Um, so he just bluntly tells me he actually walked out in the middle of sacrament one time. Um, and I follow him. I'm like, what is wrong? And he's like, I do not like the feelings here. Mm-hmm. I don't like anything about it. This isn't for me. You can continue to go. I support you in it and stuff. I don't want to be here. Um, and it hurt, but not as much as I anticipated it to. It didn't something that I was, you know, was supposed to cherish and be very proud of. I was like, no, okay. 
which once I it just this transition of oh, it the hurt church her dad and I oh yeah <laughs> this transition of like not I know being the into it stones please don't read the comments <laughs> do you, do you think please that, don't like, tell me the comments <laughs> <laughs> I already have that self esteem <laughs> did you did you assume I know like I'm I always think I think in terms of comments too of like mm-hmm. people would assume oh Satan got to him yeah like he was feeling the spirit yes. and yeah. Satan was like uh oh yeah. yeah and you know, the attacked spirit. yeah the spirit of adversary the adversary yeah exactly and 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 you even put the blame on me that well, I was never a truly faithful we blamed her member we right? didn't think she was a good example you yes <laughs> yes we're standing here today as such a beautiful healthy vibrant young woman I can't wait to hear <laughs> man because this is difficult this is a difficult teenage years girl. yeah yeah <laughs> so, she's been through a lot been through a lot um, sadly I'm <laughs> when we we know better we do that. better it's all good no. <laughs> oh um, gosh so then yeah we get to that point we've graduated high school and I did it. I, we saved the money. I invited him to go on this trip with me and we backpacked Asia for a couple months. That's so cool. Yeah. It is cool. And it was such a, like, I can do this. Um, I know that nobody else saw it in the way that I did of proving people wrong. It's just a trip, you know, but it was a goal that got me out of high school that got me to that point. And I am just a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Um, I am so glad that I met him. Um, and unfortunately <laughs> the, um, cultural things of Mormonism, like we talked about getting married at a young age, mm-hmm. I put that pressure on him and was like, well, you love me. We've been dating for two and a half years or no, two year or a year and a half or whatever it was. Um, so we need to get engaged and I'm 18. Mm-hmm. And at this point, like I said, I'm not even that into it as much, but the cultural aspect was still There's stuck. a massive sense of urgency she felt. Yeah, that I needed to and get married. history repeats itself, right? Really, right? <laughs> yeah. Was he 18 as well? Yeah. Um, he's a year older, he was 19. So the sound from Mary Kelly. <laughs> yeah. It does. But because of my experience, it helped. Yes. Oh. I, yeah. Yes. I so, did. I did pull. <laughs> I did pull my head out of the sand. She's got y'all. a redemption arc. Started to act like a normal human. <laughs> so uh, we. I because that, she confided in me. Yeah. Just the incompatibility. Uh-huh. And, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh Uh-oh. my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Repeat. History's gonna repeat. Uh-huh. And I woke up. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I we get engaged. I put that pressure on him. Um, we moved to Salt Lake because I hated Nevada, wanted to get out of it, especially that everything. It just reminded me of all of those horrible memories. I just needed to get away. Um, so we moved to Salt Lake after traveling and it's great. He's my best friend, but something's just missing. Um, but I haven't said anything to anybody and I go months without saying anything. We've planned our wedding, haven't said a thing. And I talked to him about it. Great communication, especially for as young as we are. Mm-hmm. Great. I told him how I felt at all times. So I would say probably like seven months before we were supposed to get married, I told him. I was like, I something's just missing. I don't know what it is. I'm just worried. And he's like, okay, hey, we'll work on it. Like I said, he's an amazing person and tried to... And all the tickets to Cancun have been... Yes, yeah, so it was now. a destination wedding. Everything's been basically been paid for. So I have this pressure of all this money on the line, like everything. And just the embarrassment, too, of engaged. I, I've posted about it and yeah. having been to cancel that. for a year. And- so I talked to him about it. We're trying to work on it, trying to work on it. And it just, it's just not happening. So I call Kelly in tears and I'm like, I don't think I can do this. Um, and at this point, Kelly and I, near the end of my high school, we kind of had a... Not fully. No, but it's starting. It's, it's our starting. relationship is starting to heal. She apologized. I'm starting to be a normal person. Yeah, she started so. to apologize for some things, but we didn't get really into it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have to ask. Yeah. How does two faithful Mormon parents allow their Mormon daughter to go to <laughs> Asia for a month with her boyfriend? Because obviously, <laughs> yeah. things you just didn't can want me to happen, die. right? <laughs> I'm just curious. Okay. I have to. Ask. So it was two reasons. One, I. Um, I saw what a good human being this individual was and yeah, just really adored him. Very bright, very educated. Uh, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Dad served in the Air Force, retired Air yeah. Force and so polite and kind and no ulterior motives. I sensed his genuineness. 
And two. Six foot two. Six foot three. Six foot three black man. <laughs> okay. I was terrified when I found out she wanted to go to Asia by herself. And I really was trying to encourage her because I wanted her to live her dreams. And so I um, and my husband butted heads a little bit. He didn't want her to go. I mean, he's terrified. He's like, do you know what happens to, mm -hmm. she's cute. She's white. She's, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to just say yes, she can go. I'm like, we can either support her and, and build a relationship with her mm. or we I'm gonna can do lose it. her altogether. Yeah. So we need to change. Mm. And I felt comfort in knowing that this good person, six foot three, was gonna, was gonna be there and protect her. Yeah. So I knew people judged me. I had many people make comments to me. At church. About, yeah, yeah, letting church me comments. do that. Letting me, like, I, how dare I allow her? Like, that is so irresponsible. Which at of this me. point is funny. I'm 18. I, this is my money. I, I was going to do the trip anyways. It, yeah. it, it, it didn't matter if he was going to come or not. And that's what it came down to with, yeah. with Sean and I is that it was like, she's going to do this and we can have communication or yeah. we can stick our head in the sand. Mm. And, we, I, and knew, I could get kidnapped and they wouldn't yes, even know. <laughs> and we would never know. But what about the law of chastity stuff? You didn't I knew, answer that. I, I, I knew yeah. that they were um, intimate. intimate <laughs> and I... I had just accepted it because I, he was such a good person hmm. and my, uh, my heart was changing a little. I yeah. Know. A huge growth from 14 to 18 yeah. for you. Oh, Kelly. Oh, so yeah. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fewer stones now yeah. are being thrown at me virtually. Yeah. <laughs> and at this point too, I don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, their approval. And we sense that. So I can either be part of her life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I cannot be part of my yeah. life and completely be cut out. Okay. So I, yeah, I didn't care at this point anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> that's a blunt way to put that. And it did that, moved to Salt Lake. It's not working out. Um, I let him know mm -hmm. that it's not working. Tell Kelly that I, you know, want to not get married. And I, and I let him and know. She was terrified. Terrified. Tell me because yeah. of the financial investment. Yeah. Her dad and I had made. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Kelly was supportive with it. And she's like, you know what happened with me, the thought of, you know, when I don't get another chance and how hard that mm -hmm. marriage was, that she was like, you know, absolutely 110% I'm going to support you and not going forward with this. I love him, my, you know, my fiance, um, and he's an amazing person and that's okay that you guys aren't compatible and that this isn't going to work. And once again, you're 19. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> because when I was, uh, three days after I had married my first husband, I sat on the edge of the bed in the hotel room on our honeymoon and I sobbed and I was, I knew I had made a mistake, not because he's this evil person and you know, mm -hmm. but because I just knew in inside I had made a mistake, but I was too proud. I was too proud to tell my mom and my dad and I got, just got married in the temple. Mm -hmm. I hadn't even opened up all my gifts. I hadn't come back from my honeymoon. Uh, and mm -hmm. so was I just going to eat? I just ha wasn't going to go back and eat crow. And, and my mom to this day, just wishes with all her heart. But you would have said something. Three days after that I had said something because she felt that it was wrong as well. It wasn't right for me. And I wasn't going to let that happen to Kayla. I, didn't, I told her I didn't care how much money we lost, mm -hmm. that it wasn't worth it. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, um, and while dating, sorry, I got to back a little bit, while dating him and living together, I start investigating the church at a deeper level. Because like I said, even up until this point, I'm the problem. It is still true. I've accepted that I am just <laughs> horrible and something is wrong with me. Um, and all of the anger and hurt and everything like that, it's been all of, it's my fault. So I'm at the point now where I'm starting to look into things, listening to podcasts and reading books. Um, the, so about Mormon truth claims and stuff? Yes. Yeah. So what year is this about? So this is, oh, 20, 2019. 2019? Yeah. Two 20, years ago. 2019 or 2020. <laughs> That's awesome. 2019 to 2020. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So mm -hmm. st start looking into that deeper at this point too. But also I'm not living any of the standards. Like I'm not, I'm not part. Like, yeah. But I think that the church is still true. It's just Are you me. praying at all? Nothing. I'm not living any standards. So you don't she feel like you have a going to hell. <laughs> yeah. I've accepted that. Yeah. I just literally, I've literally just accepted yeah. it. Um, and also kind of had a thing that was like this anger thing at God that was like, you know what you have to do to get me to believe and you're not doing it. 
Um, so if you want to do that, cool. And I'll be ready and I'll, and I, I will, you know, go back to being a dedicated member and everything like that. But you have caused way too much hurt for me to just hop back into doing, you know, par- participating and doing everything. And I also, after moving out and being with him, noticed it was the happiest I had been in my entire life. And what does the church say? Anyone who leaves, if you're not following these things, you're not happy. You're searching for something, right? Even with a relationship that's not working out, still the happiest I've ever been. So this is making me even more like, what in the world? This church. <laughs> like, so look, I'm thinking, you just think you're happy. Yeah. yeah. And I knew, and I knew that everybody. I didn't say it because yeah. I'm trying to change. But that's yeah. not a conversation you guys had. No. You never told her. That, she like, told me she was the happiest. And I'm learning to try to keep my mouth shut and quit mm-hmm. pushing enzyme yeah, articles on her. Pushing her but yeah. my testimony every time yeah. she raised a question. But I'm in my th- mind thinking, she's, she's not happy. you're happy. When it was genuinely the most mm-hmm. happy I've ever been. Um so tell us about your investigation because yeah. you know, what you learned yeah. and, from um, where, and from where. So I first, a coworker who moved to Utah and had didn't really have any experience with Mormonism was obviously slammed with all this culture. So she like wanted to learn about it. So she listened to a podcast, which was, it's very um, aggressive at first. So I, even like I said, not practicing or anything, just tried to listen to it and the defense mechanisms came up again. Do you remember which one? Yes, it was the last podcast on the left. Yeah, yeah, about Mormonism. you were going to yeah. say that. Yes. That's a savage. Yeah, that's it's a savage. last podcast on the left. Oh, that's funny. It's so, a savage. I've listened to it three times. It's, yeah. They, well, and the perspective that was kind of cool is that it's not XLDS people, and it's not more, they're just people who researched it. That, so it's, it, it gave a cool perspective of like, it's funny when they like pronounce things wrong and like, because they don't know anything about it. They're just researching it from a, a standpoint that's like, explaining it. So anyways, I listened to, I try to listen to it, but my defense mechanisms and wanting to defend the church, I stopped. And then it took a couple months before I would listen to it again. And then I listened to it so fast. I, cause I, I mean, there are a couple, I mean, it's like a seven part series or something like that. So I listened to the entire, the show notes. Yeah. yeah. So I listened to that entire thing and I just was, Oh my gosh, just so many things. I was like, there, that cannot be true. Not that I'm like, So in disbelief, it wasn't the disbelief thing. It was just, how did I not know? So then I start, you know, look, Googling and things like that. And once again, thinking this is anti Mormon literature and things like that, but realizing it's just history. Um, I can't remember all the sources that I looked at. Um, but yeah, definitely that podcast. And I listened to other random off ones. I started just um, putting in, I listened to a couple Mormon story ones. I cannot remember which ones. Um, and yeah, just like going into different things, it was just unbelievably shocked. This was super difficult because like I said, my fiance grew up with zero religion. So this is while we're kind of near the end of our relationship. I'm going through this insane faith crisis that he has no idea how to assist or help. I can't talk to anyone. What are the shocking things you learned? Just yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Everything about Joseph Smith. So the hat never been taught that in my entire what life that he translated the Book of Mormon. Um, by looking into a hat with the seer stone. I, my entire life was shown pictures of him with the, the curtain in between with the, you know, the gold plates and retelling it to Emma or, you know, the other translators um, or, you know, people transcribing it that I, the hat, yeah, that just absolutely blew my mind. And I was like, this is just the podcast. There's no way. And then a little simple Google search and a couple of things like, nope, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> um, the polygamy thing, I knew that he had had wives. It, I don't know why it didn't bother me as much. I wish I kind of it annoys me that it didn't bother me as much as it should have. <laughs> um, but realizing how young and how many, and how then the women were, yes, that he married at like 14, 14 15, 16 yeah. Months, yeah. And I look at myself at that experience that I had at 14 mm. and thinking, Oh my gosh, this is somebody who's supposed to be a prophet. This young woman does not know like, And even with that time, we've progressed a lot Mm -hmm. with being sexually, you know, a progressive society. Then I just can't imagine how terrifying and lonely that was for all of the women in all ages, but especially uh, relating to kind of putting myself in her shoes of being 14 years old, Um, that that was very shocking. And then the further time that I took away from listening to conference talks and things like that, when I would hear snippets of it, I would be like, I listened to that and thought that that was normal or that was fine. I hear them saying things like, that's not okay. Um, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. Like, they're talking about modesty things and saying that like men will look at you like an object. Like they've literally said things like that during conference. And I'm just 
being taken aback. So it's just, it's hyper fixating on like literally everything that's being said and done. And then noticing conference talks and things from older times. And then people making the excuse of, oh, they were just culture. It was the, you know, uh, result of those times. So then I'm thinking, well, okay, so that means in 30 years, our kids are going to look at our the prophets that we had and are going to say, oh, it was just culture and things of the time. So who's right? When mm-hmm. when is Where is the difference between this is doctrine, they're speaking to God and they're telling us, and then, oh, it's just cultural. How do you know what the difference is? So that's when I started having really big issues with prophets um, and you know, going all the way back to Joseph Smith. So at this point, I don't think any of them are real. They're not. They're not talking to God and they're not giving... They're not giving real revelation. I have to ask, you're dating a person of color at the yes. time. Yes, huge. Did so that? I remember asking you, because it bothered me when I was still in Vegas. I said, how on earth am I supposed to justify or explain mm-hmm. this to him? This is, it's just insane. And you, and you say you regret it very much now, but it is a huge excuse that people make in the church is that it was because of the times mm-hmm. and that the church giving blacks to the priesthood. I didn't know it had been a disavowed doctrine yet. Yeah. And that despite it was 2019. Tell our audience what the doctrine. 2019. I I still didn't know it had been a disavowed doctrine. People don't even know what we're So in 1978 is when the church finally allowed blacks or people of color to have the priesthood. And to go to the temple. And to go to, and yes, and go through the temple. So before then they couldn't. And wrapping my head around, you you were born in 1978. That's not that long ago. Yeah. And, And it just. And the reason being. Mm-hmm. And the reason being, oh, they were descendants of yes, Cain. Yes, they were cursed with black skin mm-hmm. because they were not valiant in the preexistence. They were fence sitters. Wishy and somebody who is an so amazing they were being punished, yeah, by the, for, for with skin color. That is, I mean, that was the doctrine. That's what foundational we were to the Book of Mormon, yeah, the not, Lamanites, that's as well lies. as as well as Cain. Yes. Um, yeah, something that it, you can't erase just by saying, oh, we don't believe that anymore. Correct. We don't teach it anymore. It's fundamental to the doctrine. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And so that definitely was, that was actually probably one of the more first things before those other things that had come through, but I just didn't, I just sat on it, but I never like really looked into it until every, all those other dominoes started to fall and was like, there's no way I can possibly justify this. And it's not okay for me to believe in a religion that s- not supports, but has believed in those things while I'm with someone who is a person of color. It, it, it erases any mm-hmm. respect to him or anybody else that I know and, and don't know. It's, I, don't, I don't want to be associated with something that's racist. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a huge marker for that. And he didn't even, like I said, he didn't even really look into anything or care. So it didn't really bother him. Like not that it didn't bother him, but he, it didn't, it wasn't like a huge conversation. He was used to racism. But yeah. And he handled mm. it. He was taught by his father to just, um, you know, he wasn't angry. He, his father taught him to, it, it's just, ignorance. It's part of, it's part of being a black man. Uh-huh. This is how you respond. You, you're quiet. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. Don't look, you don't look up. You just, yeah. it, if, as long as you don't antagonize it, it won't get it, worse. It won't get worse, you know? And so yeah. he was just had a, and he just had a gentle nature anyways, yeah. you know, his, he just had a gentle nature. So he didn't get all riled up about it. I feel like, you know, um, I, I got describing it to him, even though, yeah, of course it was upsetting to him. I feel like I got more angry yeah, about did. it. Asia, than, Asia, like than he did. You, you came home super angry and yeah. about Asia. I remember you yeah. talking to me. I was horrified how he was treated. Yeah, Asia. and when we were traveling, he was treated very badly when we were traveling around with racism. Um, but yeah, so that was definitely a huge problem. But it was just hard because he didn't know how to help me because I'm going through this year of just ups and downs. There were highs, which we, you, you hear so many people talk about in their faith through construction. It's I'm free and I'm happy. And then, and then you hit these lows of super bad sadness and depression and then what does the world even mean? Why am I here? And so just going through those ups and downs and he was just like, Oh my gosh, like, why is it that serious? Cause he just didn't understand. What's the big deal. Yeah. What, what the big deal was even with once again, me not even being that dedicated of a member, it was still shocking. Cause I thought it was true. Something's wrong with me. Like I said, that main theme going throughout my entire life and then realizing all of those things that happened to me were a result of this thing. That's not even true. All of this hurt, my not having a relationship with my parents, the, sh- the sexual shame, all of that, that if the church didn't exist, I'm not saying that those things wouldn't have happened, but maybe to, not near to the extent of the degree that it did. So just all of that anger that just definitely pushed me over the edge, um, didn't talk to anybody about it. Um, and I still go through those phases of anger and, and sadness and feeling really happy and free with it and just wanting to share it. And I will go on my Instagram sometimes and 
post about stuff and people get angry at me, <laughs> but I just want to tell people. And it, even it's been comforting and I will post on my Instagram story about different historical things and, and stuff like that. And there's been people I know from my ward that I never would have guessed will message me and be like, I've been having these same issues or I have friends that are going to BYU and are like, I don't know what to do. And so there's so many people that, and, and even just my circle that have reached out to me and are just like, I'm shocked. I don't know what to do. And so I, even though I may piss people off with sharing some things that they call anti-Mormon literature, which I like to call history, <laughs> <laughs> that it's, even if I touch three to four people, it's worth it to me to make some people mad. Um, so then at this point we break up and I, um, I'm going through this change and it's literally, I'm the same person, but there's still so much change happening in the way that I look at people. So like I said, not living standards and stuff like that, but I noticed that I stopped judging people about the weirdest things, modesty, right? I wasn't even dressing super modestly, but I used to hyper fixate on it. I would walk down the street, no shirts too short or, you know, like just looking at things now, I don't even pay attention. It's not even in my radar. Um, of, of, of like those types of things, um, language too. I'm not noticing when people are using like cussing or things like that. I, I just noticed that I wasn't judging as much because I wasn't hyper fixating on it. So I'm going through all these changes and I'm ready to start dating again and settling Tinder. And I'm just like, I'm going to put it to men and women. <laughs> and I, I didn't tell anybody. I just put it to both. And what's- Did you notice attractions to- I don't, I can't say then if like I am looking now, I can see things that were like, yeah, I was, but then not in that moment. I don't know why. "Ah, Yeah. I was just like, why not? (laughs) Cause everything doesn't matter anymore. (laughs) So I said it to men and women, but I only really go on dates with guys for a while. Cause I was just too like scared and I didn't really know. I don't know. Didn't know what it was like to date women and stuff. But then I like really start to think about it and question it, my sexuality. And I, um, YouTube and I start Googling things. And one of the funniest things that I saw when trying to figure this out, I YouTube um, just like how to know if you're bisexual or something. And I click on a YouTube video and the guy is like, I'm going to count down like 10 reasons of like, you know, why you may be bisexual or bi curious or something like that. And he starts number one with the fact that you YouTubed this straight people don't YouTube. <laughs> Are you bisexual? <laughs> So I just thought that, that was really funny, but start. I never have. You never right? have. I was going to say. So I'm taking a quiz. <laughs> I'm like BuzzFeed. Oh. I guess that makes me 1%. 1%. Not. So yeah, I thought that that was really fun. I was like, yeah, that's probably a good point. Um, so then I just really start to think of it. So now I'm thinking, okay, there's a difference with learning the terminology with things. There's a difference between bi curiosity and bisexuality. Uh, bi curiosity is just wanting to see. You're not sure. Bisexuality is being... I'm attracted to both genders. I could see myself with, you know, both genders. So really start going into that and seeing. So I start going on finally getting up the courage because dating women is a total different world than dating guys. So finally get the courage to go on dates and realizing like, yeah, I could absolutely in the same way that I could date and um, talk about my day and um, have a connection with a person on all levels that you're supposed to in a relationship, sexually, um, communitively, just everything. I can have that with a woman. And it was like, whoa, because I, it just, I was like, there's no way. How have I gone this far in my life and not realized it? And I just have come to the conclusion conclusion that it was internalized homophobia because of the church that I didn't even allow myself to think about if that was a possibility. Cause I look back at things and my middle school best friend is also bisexual. Now we used to give each other massages with our shirts off on the ground, like laying down and no, what other 13 year old girls were like doing yeah, that. I'm like, yeah, that, that wasn't normal. normal. <laughs> so like normal, I look back, I mean that, yeah. you know what I mean. Yes. I look back on things that I'm like, yeah, I should have known. And we joke about it all the time. Me and my friend, cause I started, I would get jealous when she would get closer to other girls and stuff. And it's, she, they were just friendships. Everything was just friendships, but it like, I was like, that's my friend. Like that's my best friend. So we joke that we were essentially like in a relationship, but we didn't even know that we were in a relationship. We were very territorial of each other. Yeah. Yeah. And she even said she was the same way with me and both of us. This is a term that you hear a lot with bisexual or lesbian women who figure it out later in life is, um, is it, do I want to be her or do I want to be with her? That is like a huge question of like, wow, you're just admiring her and she's so pretty and all these things. And it's like, wait, do I just want her hair or do I just want, or no, no, I actually want to date her. Do I want to run my fingers through her hair? (laughs) Yes. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So that was a huge, huge, obviously, um, 
thing to uncover. I don't even know what to label that as. Um, that was pretty shocking. That settled in for a while, felt confident with it, and I felt fine with it. I'm not ashamed of it. I'll talk about it. Um, and I realized that I have a point of even within the LGP, LGBT community, which is obviously judged and um, people do not agree with, even within that community, I have it the easiest. I'm a bisexual woman. Transgender people, that is, it is the absolute hardest. Gay men and lesbian women, they have to constantly deal with that. I, as a bisexual woman, yes, it's annoying that we're sexualized in media and by men and things like that, but annoyance is a lot better than being beaten. Mm -hmm. And I just realized like that I had no problems with me being bisexual. And like I said, being able to be open and talk about it, but then realizing my privilege because of that, because I'm a, a, a woman who's bisexual, even men who are bisexual get ridiculed way, way more. So I, I think I have it the easiest. And experience violence. Yes. Violence literally very. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so then gender. Yeah. I, when Women I was learning color. about this. Wow. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So very high death rates, murder rates. Yeah. Very bad. So I started to just reflect on that. Cause I was thinking like, Oh, I'm, I'm like prideful. I don't have to deal with anything. And then I like reflect on, well, wow. I'm so glad that I figured out this faith transition before that, because I can't imagine knowing that I'm gay, lesbian, transgender, or even bisexual. Um, and being in the church at like eight years old or nine or 10 and figuring that out, mm -hmm. I, it just broke, it just broke me. It just made me so sad to think. And then I thought of your brother mm -hmm. and like so many people that I'm so fortunate that I'm on my own, I have supportive people in my life that she's come to a point now that I can talk to my parents about it and everything, but the circumstances could be so different and it is so different for so many people and not just LDS people. There's so many people in other religions that do not agree with, you know, LGBT community. And, um, I just, it just made me so sick to think about all the people that have been, um, kicked out of their homes and children and things like that. And the rate in Utah is so much higher than it is in the rest of the country. They get, it's like double what the rest of the country, like if a, 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 pet, a parent or an adult finds out that their kid is in the community, they it's like a 20% or something like that. I don't want to give exact numbers. Um, in Utah, should we brainstorm why? Right. Should we talk about that? Seriously. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah, it's like double. It's like 40% in Utah. And I it just baffles me that a religion that teaches acceptance and love, um, that there's exceptions. That's how I think of it. It's because it's not what they want it to be. And, and just like all those stereotypes that like you said originally with your brother, that it's a choice and it's all of these things that it, I just, it just breaks my heart. I don't know. Trust me. Yeah. I've cried many tears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, um, Kelly was going through her deconstruction and kind of figuring out what, what she was believing with the church when trying to understand us, I finally felt comfortable to tell her. And if I yeah, didn't she know- She really didn't know what I was going through mm -hmm. emotionally. She just sensed a change in me. I just, yeah, mm -hmm. I could tell in our conversations that for some reason that she was mm -hmm. more accepting. More genuine. Yeah. Like, you just, like, like I genuinely yes. cared about you. It wasn't There fake. was this shift that I wasn't trying so hard to care about Kayla. Yeah, yeah. You know? So then I finally felt comfortable telling her. Yeah. How um, recent was this? This was, I want to say September of last year. Because you, yeah. you told me a yeah. long time, and I didn't tell anyone, not even dad. Fall last year. Yeah, For fall of last year. six months until you came out, and then mm -hmm. I ran in the house and was like, dad. Sean, I need to talk to you. I, <laughs> yeah, see, and this just shows you the timeline still. This shows your dad's you. bishop by this yes. point. Yes, yes. I'm like, still. I'm going to intercept this before so he finds out. So, out. remember. So this is the second yes. coming out to your dad, Mormon <laughs> bishop dad, as bisexual. So this is where I did not handle this. Well, I, and it's okay. Yeah. I look once again, this you timeline, it's so, it's so short. This is still happening right now that I still don't feel comfortable enough to, to come out to him. I don't care that he knows, but I, I couldn't even think about how that conversation yeah. would go. I didn't know how, I don't know. It just felt mm -hmm. like it wouldn't, I don't know what he would say. And unfortunately, like I said, at this point, my, separation of caring of what people think and especially my parents is gone his approval his everything so I didn't feel the need to tell him and now it kind of I kind of regret that I wish I would have had a conversation with him to tell him but I like I said I've just at a point now where it's just mm -hmm. I don't care if he knows he knows and everything so I came out publicly on my social media first 
first. So I had told Kelly and I came out on social media first before ever talking to my dad because I just didn't literally, I guess the best words I can say is I didn't feel the need because with all of those events that had happened, I've already been this disappointment. I've already like that. Why I don't need his approval. Like in my head, that's kind of what it was. And it makes me sad because I, a lot of the times I contribute that to the church. I think that we would have a much better relationship if it wasn't for the church. Um, and that breaks my heart because I know that we, I know that he loves me. Mm-hmm. I know that. Um, but it's just so frustrating that this isn't even that long ago. It's within the past six months that I didn't feel comfortable coming out mm-hmm. to him personally. I didn't care that he found out through other channels through Kelly mm-hmm. or, you know, other people, but I didn't want to tell him I, with my, like myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. What were you? Um, so you it sounds like you held it in for a long time. Mm-hmm. Worst case scenario what was the worst case scenario in your head? And then how did it actually go? Like with him? Yeah. Like, it, uh, I mean, I, I don't even think he's said anything about it to you. Has he? We haven't even had a conversation to this day about it. Like he oh, just acts, wow. we, we, I've seen him and we interact and every time I see him, it's, he just called me actually to congratulate well, me about been, something. He's been being educated because I forced yes. my education on him. Yeah. Mm. So he, I probably loop back to your story in a second. Yeah. Um, I exercise undue influence over my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. mature. We already established I'm super mature. Mostly, right? <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're lucky you more now. I'm the epitome of maturity. Yeah. Yeah. Like Kara's more like, now. oh my gosh, this girl. Oh no, my gosh. It's just I so funny that you're the like, comments. the church taught me undue influence and now I'm going to use that to my benefit. Oh, I, I totally <laughs> Yeah. I, right. that's, I mean, you just learn. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, definitely. When I'll be honest with you, um, grow, raising the family. I mean, you can tell in how I responded and interacted with her, what type of Mormon I've been, you know, and what type of our house, our household has been. I'm when Sean and I got married, I asked him, Hey, where's your food storage? And He's like, oh, it's like up in the attic. <laughs> and um, I'm like, well, I, I need to see it. So I know I have a spreadsheet and an Excel document because I know exactly how many cans of everything we need and for seven people. And That's I've insane. multiplied by everyone's weight, how much food we're going to need over the next year. <laughs> and I'm going to Kara's like, oh my God. I feel like I'm going down like a roller coaster it's, on Six Flags right now. I was like, okay, wait, a perfect you know, big explanation of how Mormon you are. Like, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And I had a wow. whole program spreadsheet about it. That the movie, uh, the, the R- RM, mm-hmm. where he comes home from his mission and sleeps on like the yeah, food storage. Right. That was you. It was under all Literally the it was her. It's under all the reds. Yeah. And I was like, I want to see this food storage, you know? Mm-hmm. And and he kept putting it off and putting it off. So finally, I just, he's like, it's up in the attic. It's hard to get to. Blah, blah. I'm like, go get it. Mm. So he brings down one case. <laughs> and if for oh. all the family of members seven. of the church know that in one case of food storage, there are six cans. <laughs> and I was like, this is your food storage? <laughs> he's like, well, I have lots of guns and bullets and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> food storage. So my Parents were like from 2007 to 2009 were uh, volunteer missionaries at, um, it was called the cannery and it's next to LDS, like uh, so it's just where you get food storage. industries yeah. where they, you, as members, you could schedule appointments or as a church group, you could schedule appointments and, and go to like a big warehouse in the back, choose oats, wheat, flour, sugar, whatever, and then can it yourself. So, mm-hmm. um, so there were a lot of times that my parents had, um, a group not show up or cancel or, you know, and so they would have a two and a half hour slot. So they'd call us kids and say, Hey, do you want us to can you anything? And we're like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I just bring it home food storage. The they bring it, drop it off. I'd write checks to them, you know? So one day, I mean, Sean's like, okay, I think we have enough food storage. And, and my calculations with my Excel spreadsheet say, we do not have enough food storage. Okay. I have, you know, four boys and a girl and a husband, like we need a lot of food, like more than it even says I'm convinced. Okay. So, um, it's stacking up against the wall. He's like, I think we're done. How much is this costing us? You know? And he's not the type of spouse to tell me what to do or demand anything or put Mm -hmm. his foot down. He's just not that person. And so he's like, I think we're done. We're good. We're good with food storage. (laughs) Well, we weren't good with food storage. And so I, kept bringing food storage home. And literally he comes home one day and it's like stacked up on si- the side of our bedroom because I've run out of under beds, under beds, you know, to put it. And we have this family of seven living in a 1500 square foot house. And you know, there's not a lot of space and we live in Vegas. So you can't put your food storage mm-hmm. in the outside. So, um, it's all stacked up under our window. And he's like, I thought we were done with food storage. And he, and he got a little terse with me and I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. We, do you remember 
that Lehi, the prophet in the Book of Mormon, <sighs> what was the one time he murmured? Do you remember? <laughs> when did he murmur? Oh, that's right. He murmured when his family was hungry and his grandchildren was hungry and he was hungry. <laughs> he murmured against the Lord, a prophet. If you think on any level, when we come to need this food storage, I'm going to look at my kids who have hungry tummies and say, oh, I'm sorry. Daddy <laughs> just didn't like the way it looked in our house. So you'll just have to go to bed with your stomach hungry. You're crazy. Crazy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get food storage. Don't say another word about it. I, I wasn't aware that the prophet said, only if you like how it looks in your house, and then get a year of supply. Such a brat. So you're telling that story in just to show what type of- That yeah. is me. Okay. My oldest yeah. wanted to grow his hair out. Absolutely not, inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I, I was worked in the stake. Sean was, had callings in the, worked. I had callings in the stake. Sean was in the stake, young mm -hmm. men's, young men's president, you know, high council. Like, no, we're the Mike cells. You're not going to grow your hair out. Who do you think you are? That would look bad on us. Like, absolutely not. He didn't have a choice. Oh, seethed inside. And you know so what I mean? Yeah, like, that definitely too. You, with with you know, all of that, me coming out, I know that there are people in our ward who have seen it and everything. And I know through a friend that have said like, wow, Kayla's really gone off the deep end. And stuff, and it just cracks me up. It's funny now. It would have uh, hurt I would a little have, bit. I would have done the same thing. I, I would. I, I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm. I try to ask Kayla to be patient. Yeah. Because you grow up with a mindset and a culture. I, I truly. I, I know. I probably are am different than other progressive Mormons in that I. I personally don't believe it's intended. I believe it's just part of cultural things yeah. that yeah. have yeah. happened. I don't. I personally. Um, the first time my brother told me that I was part of a cult, I was like, oh, how dare you? How dare you? And, and I was so angry and uh, I didn't listen to anything he said. Like I, we do not mm -hmm. drink Kool-Aid. Yeah. Are you on crack? Yeah. You know? And so the more and more I heard it, I was just super offended. I mean, if someone said I was part of a cult, I, mm -hmm. They were um, illegitimate to me. Mm -hmm. I, they, sure. You know, I yeah. there's no way. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was just such. I mean, we were so devoted, and I was so unhappy inside. And when I got married, I mean, I had this little boy. He was five. He was on a ventilator. He had a trach. He had a G tube. We spent eleven hours a week just in feeding therapy, trying to teach him how to eat and. Nobody knew how to take care of him. I, the kids would watch him while I would go places because it was hard to take him places with, with a ventilator. And people would say how sorry they felt for me. Um, and appointment after appointment, 17 surgeries during, you know, just, it was overwhelming. It was just emotionally overwhelming. And the chest fest, the medication, he, he has a neuromuscular disease. And so our life was dictated. Um, he had a medication that had a short half-life. And so it had to be given every two hours in liquid form. And my brain was just eight, 10, 12, two, four, six, eight throughout the day. Like my brain just operated on an everything. What, what everything in my life was run on this rigid schedule because he had it to have it, um, to breathe. And he had so many struggles and challenges and so much of my focus went to him mm -hmm. and I didn't really. That can cause a divorce. Just focus having a special needs on kid. the other kids. Yeah. And Sean did his best. I mean, there were so many nights that Sean <clears throat> would take his turn. I, I don't function well on little sleep and Brandon, Brandon was on a ventilator and is on a ventilator still at night and moisture would build up in his tubes and, uh, Every two to three hours, I would have to get up because I could hear the cadence of the machine. Sean had built like a room, like he had cut a hole in the, like a door right next to my bed and built like from the outside, it looked like a shed, but it was Brandon's room. And so I could get up every, throughout the night and drain Brandon's water and section him when he needed suctioning because he could cough up his secretions, mm -hmm. which he had so much mucus mm -hmm. and secretions that if he coughed it up, the ventilator would would just push it back into him, cough up that, you know, so you had to suction him throughout the night and stuff. And there'd be nights when he was sick that he, Sean would come in the morning and I was just sitting next to his bed and there's 80 saline bullets, you know, because he had, I, there was no point in getting back to bed because 30 seconds later I had to get up and suction him. Whatever. And so I, th I think the point I just wanted to make was with having a child with such extreme special needs and the fatigue I, and having four kids that, I didn't really 
have time or energy to get to know, to invest in. And I'm serving in demanding callings and my husband is serving in demanding callings. And there are so many times raising our family that our callings took precedence over our family and their needs. And, and I didn't ever see anything wrong with that because I was serving God. To me, serving in my calling was directly serving God. And, and I this, was going to be blessed for that. That what like I talked about with relationship with my dad, that was something that really made me mad too. The amount of time and effort that he put into young men's and things like that. And other trumped, people. Yes. And other people trumped over. Far and away. Think like my, you know, high school choir concert. Yeah. No, he had to go do other things. So because it was, if he had a young men's activity, yeah, that was or I priority. Had a young women's activity, we were in charge of. That was priority. Yeah, and so that was really that really hurt. And I know our the church doesn't teach like the church teaches family first, mm-hmm. family first, family first. But the reality is, John, when you are in a demanding calling, and you are it, like you you are perhaps paired with maybe a less active individual because they put you that way so you can help them grow. When the rubber meets the road, it's not family first. You, you, it's expected. You can't just cancel young mm-hmm. men's and young women's because your child has a concert. Mm-hmm. That's shame on your child mm-hmm. for having something that conflicts with young men and young women's. Yeah. Shame on them, you know? And so it's just, it was really challenging. And I, I think the theme for journal entries during 2007 to 2019 for me to sum up everything was what am I doing wrong? I've been told my whole life that being a mother and having children and serving in the church is the culmination of my existence and that I should feel joy. What is wrong with me? This is not bringing me joy. So I read my scriptures more. I go to the temple more. I read Ensign articles more. I take one month, I take 10 meals to people in need in the ward because I want to serve more. I want to feel what I'm missing. What am I doing wrong? Why am I so easily influenced by Satan? What is wrong with me? Um, that, that's just a theme over and over and over. And um, I remember one journal entry <clears throat> I read recently. I mean, last night in the hotel room, I because um, I came up this week to help or volunteer at Pride Week to support Kayla. And so I was in the hotel room, hotel room last night, just reading through some old journal entries. And I mean, here, 2012, 2014, 2017, these are, this is the theme. Suppression is the name of the game. What am I supposed to do? There's nobody to talk to. Uh, I'm I'm the one with the problem. You're writing every, this in your journal? Yeah. Every other woman just loves being a mother and loves being a wife and loves serving in the church. And I don't find a ton of joy. I find joy with my spouse. I find joy doing other things. And so during all these years, my husband was super, well, why don't you find a hobby? You know, why don't you do this? I took up running ran half marathons. And then I took up gardening. He built me a greenhouse to support me. I, uh, after, uh, my six year old was born, I took up photography and, um, I'm the nerd that reads the entire manual. And so I became obsessed with that. He bought me cameras and equipment and lighting and studio equipment and supported me. And I just never felt fulfilled because I just, I never learned to love myself and I didn't see how that was connected. And so when 2020 hit, my whole world changed. And it started in February of 2020. I was serving as a primary teacher and one of the young women, I was uh, the Valiant class and they are ages, for people who don't know, that class is ages um, eight, nine, 10, and 11. Well, in my ward, we have a a very small primary and so they kind of combined it to one class. And so I was teaching and one of the, 10 year old girls raised her hand and said, sister Mike Sell, why don't we talk about heavenly mother? And I went into robot mode and I don't know how to explain how to explain what I mean by robot mode. It's just something that I just did. And I started to say, well, because it's, um, she's, we don't really know, but it's she's because sacred, sacred, yeah. sacred silence. And then I just stopped. And, and again, a thousand thoughts in 30, you know, 10 seconds. And I'm thinking, that's me. That's me when I was 11. Mm. And I'm thinking of myself sitting on my bed, sobbing, Mm -hmm. 
She's 10. I'm 11. Blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm looking into her little blue eyes. And I said to her, you know what? I don't know. Let me research and find out for you. And a couple weeks later, COVID kind of shut down all of church meetings. And so that I had always been afraid to research Heavenly Mother on my own because I was so afraid that I would find, I, I couldn't emotionally deal with this reinforcement of polygamy. It just took me down places that I thought Satan, I was allowing Satan to get into me, into side of me. So I just kept it at bay because whenever I went there, I wanted to leave the church and it, it came out with a vengeance. So I, and I just thought, I promised her I would find out and I'm going to. And so I started researching Heavenly Mother and I really needed to understand polygamy. And I found a book by Carolyn Pearson, the one you mentioned earlier, The, the Ghosts of Eternal Polygamy. And um, because I, I truly believed at the time that um, there was a, a conference talk. I listened to conference. I internalized it, the enzyme. One of the, I can't remember who it was, <clears throat> but one of the leaders had said, I, I, I want to say it was like 2012, 2013, in conference, that if we have questions, we should not go to the internet for answers. Mm -hmm. And that if we do, we can repent and receive forgiveness. For looking things up. Yes. And so I was um, like, okay, I have to find this information. So I, I was trying to look online. Um, I had never, I honestly, I didn't know anything about Mormon stories podcasts. Mm -hmm. I'd never even yeah. heard of you. Yeah. I didn't know there was an ex Mormon or a post Mormon or a progressive Mormon community. Mm -hmm. I had no exit did that existed until November of 2020. <laughs> so um, <laughs> six months ago, literally, I had no idea. Um, but I found this book and I, and I, read, the I read the synopsis. And so then I, I went researching who this woman was. And if I had told myself, if she's an active member of the church, I will read this book. Which she is. If she is not, right. I will not read this book. Because yeah. you can't trust any. You can't right. trust so it. I'm like, Carolyn yeah. Pearson, is she still a member of the church? Is she excommunicated? <laughs> <laughs> like, and so I'm like, who is she? Found her website, read about her. Hmm, really contemplating this. Do I order this or not? You know, this is going beyond what I had ever done in my life. I had never read a book that was not. I did not purchase a Deseret book or I did not information. I did not find in the enzyme or at LDS.org. And so, um, I ended up ordering it. I, you know, I, I found a YouTube interview about the book and I was fascinated by her YouTube video mm -hmm. explaining the process of collecting that information, yeah. um, and how it, it literally came from church archives when she was researching her for the movie that she had been, um, the script that she had been solicited by the first presidency to make for the prophet Joseph Smith. So I, I thought, okay, this is legitimate research. She hasn't been excommunicated. Clearly if it was not valid, she would have been excommunicated. Right. And so I ordered it and I read it and I voraciously read that book and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I wrote her an email, never expecting to hear back from her mm -hmm. telling her, how that changed my life. I did not know the information in that book. And what information? <clears throat> that polygamy was never, never came from the hand of God. And um, I had, I was simultaneously so sad that I had harbored so much hatred for God, for something that never came from him. And I resonated so much with the stories she shared from the polls she took. And I, I just, for the first time in my life, I felt like my heart opened up and I just prayed to God and I said, I'm so sorry for how much I've, how many other things have I judged you about? Because I believed something that had been deified that I was told that wasn't true. And I, she emailed me back and the sweetest letter. And she said, you're the very reason I wrote this book. And how many things, you know, how many things and false traditions have we internalized 
as members because it's been said with an air of authority. So we perpetuate that. And that just, it just, there, it did something inside of me. It, it, it switched like, oh my gosh, maybe God does love me. Maybe I am just as important. And March, um, one of my children contacted me and told me he was stepping away from the church. And I knew that one, other, one child wasn't active anymore, and I knew Kayla had gone in a different direction. And I was so sad. <laughs> I just cried. And he said, Mom, I don't want you to try to convince me, but I wanted to talk, tell you what I feel and think. So I listened to him talk for like um, two to three hours. And I got off the phone with him. And I just cried. He was so afraid to tell me because he didn't want to disappoint me. And I love him. And I love my children. He told me he was agnostic and shared a lot of challenges and concerns he'd had about the Bible and ironically, polygamy was for a young man. Polygamy was his uh, a huge problem. shelf yeah. that broke his shelf. He, any time in priesthood and quorum, it ate at him. It just ate at him. He he just saw. He just thought it was. Uh, I don't remember exact exact words. Like grossly unjust. And good for him. He's a very just person. You know, he is very, um, he's such a good person. You know, he, he's like, I can't go on my mission or I, he's like, I can't go away to school because, um, everyone knows Brandon's name already. So, but mm -hmm. so he's like, I, I have to go, I'll have to just stay and, and go and be Brandon's buddy and protect him from his, his school. And he, he didn't really, but he was just, he just wants to protect and he wants to, it, there's equality and he just sees social injustice places. And, and I resonated a lot with that and I, uh, connected with that. And so I just got on my knees afterwards. Oh, he's like agnostic and I'm typing up like, while he's talking to me, definition of agnostic, <laughs> you know? And I just started sobbing because I'm like, oh my gosh, she doesn't believe in God. What is happening? And so I prayed and prayed and I decided I made that choice that I was not going to let happen to my children what happened to my brother and me. I had lost so many years of, because of judgment, because he, I was angry that he had messed up the celestial kingdom plan for our family, and I loved my brother, and I wasn't going to be in heaven with him. My goal shifted that day, and I decided to go on a journey I wanted to understand my children. I didn't want to judge them anymore. And the only way I could understand them, when I had conversations, I wrote down all the question, like questions. Sometimes they would say uh, flat out questions and other times through the course of our conversation, I could tell obviously what some of the questions were. And I had this uh, on the side of my bookshelf, I just started posting stick, yellow sticky tabs. Posted notes? Yeah. Of what? Questions. The questions. About? Like, My children just all of us. All of them. Issues with the church issues, and questions. Issues, concerns, um, disagreements, uh, hurts. So that she could look up every single one. I wanted one. to study everything. So tell us five of them. 72. <laughs> <laughs> top five. I'll probably say maybe one from each child. And I don't know if it's necessarily their top, just ones that come off of my head. So one, if... Jesus Christ was so important and God sent him to the world to redeem our souls and to be an example. And if record keeping is so important that we're commanded to keep journals and that the Nephites were commanded to keep these plates, why did God not feel it necessary to preserve an authentic record 
from Jesus Christ himself? Why is our knowledge about the Nephites and Lamanites more important than Jesus Christ himself? Why would, this is all in one thread for this child, why would God allow the Bible to be corrupted to the point that scholars now don't know if some of the texts are original or not, and why, if Joseph Smith wasn't allowed to use the gold plates for money and propaganda, why was the Bible allowed to be used at times in history for propaganda mm, oh, and wow. financial gain? I never thought of that. And I was like, <laughs> <clears throat> questions? Sticky, sticky note. note. Questions? <laughs> sticky note. Um, okay, another child. The sexual uh, shaming uh, this child I said to me, if the atonement is for the sinner, why was I publicly shamed for so long? And why was I not allowed to take the sacrament for so long? <sighs> Sticky note. Another child. I'm doubting the existence of God because of the absurdity of prophets. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. This, this question comes in July. I'm like, okay, tell me more. And I'm trying not to like open my eyes really big and like freak out, you know, this is a different child. Tell me what you mean by prophet, the absurdity of prophets. And he says, what is the point of a prophet if the doctrine and revelation that they teach is later disavowed and told that is not true. And I said, like, what? Give me an example. Like, what are you talking about? Race in the priesthood just ate at him. Uh, the teachings on Native Americans and the graduation of their skin going from uh, dark to light based on righteousness, um, that doctrine that we don't teach anymore, or that we don't teach it is true anymore. Um, Blood atonement, never heard of that. Uh, sticky note. Um, the, oh gosh, they're just, anyways, all, like uh, pol polygamy, you know? And I was like, well, thinking back to when I was 21, well, you know, prophets can make mistakes. And um, thinking back to my bishop years and years ago, if, you know, they can only be influenced as far as the cultural and intellectual level of the prophet. He's like, then what's the point of prophets if they're always 20 to 30 years behind uh, correct change? And if we're going by those standards, then why does anything in the Bible, yeah. how is that so, relevant? So then he starts rattling off like, that's a great point. Did too. you know that, that the church was against civil rights, this civil rights act? Did you know that the church fought this mo the women's ERA, rights movement? Equal and, rights amendment. I'm like, no, no. Sorry, no, I, no idea. No idea. Tell me more, you know? <laughs> Another child starts taking an institute, Pearl of Great Place class. And this child is very scientific. Ironically, this child was reading college textbooks about space when he was eight years old. Sean and I could not consume and purchase enough space astronomy books. And so he comes home. Once a, I take him to institute, he comes back. He is angry. He is um, angry. And I, I feel like every, so then I'm like, okay, uh, he's, his things were like, it says in the book of Abraham that the earth is 6,000 years old and that is scientifically impossible. So either the book is lying or the, you know, he just, he just could not reconcile it for scientifically. I was told today by my teacher that Adam was the first man on earth. That is scientifically not true. Um, like just thing after thing. It's and, all true. And um, all of Mormon theology and doctrine is based and on a yeah, literal. Yes. Time, Correct. you know, chronology. Yeah. Noah, and, right. you know, you know, Tower of Babel, yes, Tower Book of, Babel, of Mormons, depending on the Tower yeah. of Babel. Yeah. And so you can't have it both ways that the Bible and the Book of Mormon are true historical records. Yeah. And that that they that they're allegorical mm -hmm. and that really science mm -hmm. is real. 
you can't have it both ways, really. I mean, you can, but it's not logically yeah. consistent. Yeah. And the religious exclusivism Exclusive, ate yeah. at this particular yeah. child. Mm -hmm. Just ate at this child. One true church. Yes. Other like churches he are false. could not wrap his brain around it. And I'm always like, well, you know, we used to teach this, but now we teach that all churches have good in them, but our church has all the good. I mean, it didn't matter what I said. Like, so I'm, I start re oops, sorry, researching the book of Abraham mm. because I'm trying to yeah. work with him <laughs> Don't do that. and pre Everyone do be that. preemptive <laughs> with, you know, yeah. Tuesday nights coming home uh -huh. from Institute. So all this time, and really I, I decided I needed to start with um, Christianity. I realized I was so ignorant to Christianity in general. And so I, read a book called um, Christianity, the first 3000 years. I, then the next book I read was um, how the Bible, the formation of the Bible by John Barton. Then I read uh, Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> and then I, I read the new Testament and underlined, I bought a new new Testament and I underlined every word or action that Christ did. I, I'm like, what did Jesus, what was it said that Jesus did? I didn't know a lot of the things that I was learning. Um, I, I had no idea. I, I mean, I guess I just assumed that Jesus was a Christian. <laughs> so obviously he was born a Jew. He grew up as a Jew. He was a Jewish rabbi and teacher. He held the Jewish priesthood. He taught as a Jew. He died as a Jew. And Christianity was a mystic sect for the first 300 years. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until Emperor Constantine compiled the Book of Mormon book, for, Bible. Uh, Bible, Bible, yeah. for political propaganda. Mm -hmm. And he is actually the one that instituted in the, um, the patriarchal order in the Christian church. And he based it off of the Roman army. Mm. You know, I, Jesus Christ wasn't, an organizer of a church. He was, mm -hmm. he was a, a minister, you know? And so when I was listening to, um, so I would walk in the mornings and I'm, when I get home, I, so I was listening to the new Testament while I was walking. And then when I got home, I would read those same chapters and underline everything in. So this is about July and I'm, I'm just trying to, I want to understand so I can look at my children and say, I may not agree but I understand how you came to this conclusion and I respect you. And I just burst out crying because I, I had thought my whole life I had been a disciple of Christ. When I, th I love the New Testament and when I see images or read the New Testament or watch the Bible videos, I love the LDS Bible videos about Christ. I just love them. I always envisioned myself as you know, one of the disciples in the plain garb following him around. And I realized I was the Pharisee. Mm. I cared so much about beliefs and behavior compliance. And that took precedent over love and understanding. Beliefs and behavior compliance and an assimilation into one right way, I, I had no idea that it dominated me so much. I, I was not aware. I am not saying all members of the church are Pharisees. There are so many people that are so much better than me. But it was a wake-up moment for me to realize that I, had, I cared more about beliefs and behavior compliance than I did about a person. And then I just kept studying and I kept reading. And uh, Kayla said to me in end of September, or early October of 2020, I'm trying to convince her that she can stay a member of the church and just be kind of progressive. And yeah. she's like, I'm not going back to it, I'm done. And, um, and she said to me, you knew Joseph Smith was a, a treasure digger, right? And I was like, I, so I got to, I got to say my, mo like my ulterior motive and things for this. She did have an ulterior motive. <laughs> so obviously Kelly researches things and goes things. She can't, if something's in her head, she's going to go at it all the way. And I know that because of the defense mechanism that, you know, 
very active members and you start to hear things, you, you put up those walls and you don't want to hear things. Um, I, and I knew that that's how it would happen mm-hmm. if I tried to talk to you about, like I said, I had been alone during that year of, you know, finding all of these things out about the church, historical things that I was just never knew about or they didn't teach about. Um, I knew that I couldn't just walk in and, and start doing all that because the defense mechanism would start. They, I would be shut down. Everything I said from that point on would not be valid. I would not be listened to. Back for effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I knew mm-hmm. that if I just said one small mm-hmm. sentence... And left it at that. <laughs> she would look it up. And I had not um, yet researched any church history because I, like you I left said, it I, Christianity. I was starting from the beginning. So I, I knew that me yeah. just saying something little like that and her <laughs> figuring out how did I not know this? She's like, what else do I not know? And that she would go 110, <laughs> which that is exactly what happened. Sneaky. So I Sneaky. went. I went to um, after that conversation. She mentions treasure digging. Yeah. Treasure digging, and I just like, like to, a little thing, not something like yeah, she's crazy. All she said was this. You knew Joseph Smith was a treasure treasure digger, right? I was like, and the grave robber and grave robber, and I was like, no. She's like, yeah, look it up, and I just left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I went home because we had been, yeah, we like uh, meted somewhere, mm-hmm. but you went home, so I went home, and I went to LD, or Church of Jesus Christ dot org, and I looked oh, up Joseph God. Smith and the Book of Mormon, and I was shocked to see that everything Carolyn Pearson had put in her book about polygamy was now on LDA, or churchofjesuschrist.org. Gospel topics essays. Yeah, yeah when it I wasn't had never before. heard of that. I had been teaching my young women that, you know, prior to 2020, that Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy. Mm. And it's on I had website. no idea. Mm. And I was horrified that they admitted that he, he not only practiced it, He lied to Emma about it and he lied to the public about it. And I, I find the information about the book of Mormon. And that is not, that is not what I was taught. That is not what I taught my primary children. What about the book of Mormon? Um, Okay. So I, I was taught that the book of Mormon, and this is what I, I've made, I have a poster board with all of this on it because I am a primary girl. If people who are members of the church, when I say primary girl, you'll know what I mean. I'm a primary girl and I love primary and I love making visuals. And I was taught that Joseph Smith got the gold plates, a breastplate plate and Urim and Thummim and translated the Book of Mormon, from those plates. There are pictures that show him with spectacles and show a breastplate, and he's translating the characters. And now on churchofjesuschrist.org, six months ago, when I read the Book of Mormon essay, he apparently had a seer stone. That that was the same stone that he used to... For treasure digging which I had never heard about, that he put it in a hat and put his face in the hat and words for, to translate the Book of Mormon would appear. And that's, and until he got it right, it would, it would stay, he couldn't go to another sentence or something until he got it right or something like yeah. that. Um, that the plates were actually never present. He never used the plates to translate. And this seer stone- They weren't in the room. This, mm-hmm. That the he was a treasure the, digger. Yeah. And that- him using the seer stone, the, the excuse, or I'm sorry, the explanation, justification, <laughs> the reasoning. Let me put it that way. Yeah. The reasoning on the website says that he ha- it was a way for him to practice using the seer stone. And that just blew my mind. You don't like that? Explanation. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't happy with that um, because it was uh, directly in opposition to what used to be on the website and what I had been taught before. Yeah, and then it just dominoed from there. I, I found I read all the gospel topic essays. I did not know they existed, and this is 2020, and I had no idea. I had no idea about the seer stone, and they've been I, out for six years. But I had no idea, <laughs> and and I'm an active member of the right, church. Yeah. My husband at this point has been bishop for over four years, yeah. and. And we have served and taught and we study manuals and I'm the nerd that reads the lesson before this on that Sunday before. So I can think and ponder and pray about it all during the week. And, um, 
I just, I went to my husband and he didn't want to have, hear anything about it. He was super defensive. He's um, Bishop. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. He didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I kept trying to talk to him. I couldn't talk to him. I, and to be quite frank with you, I, I was just, you're alone how, too. I, how can, how, wh- what have I missed? What, where, what memos have I missed? Like, I have not been asleep at the wheel here. How can this be on LDS.org? Or, you know what I mean? And I had no idea. I'm still teaching my primary children. Yeah. The manuals and things still say what the way I've been taught. Mm-hmm. So I, um, my husband won't talk to me. I, I reach out to a family member and, and try to talk to them. And they don't want to have any discussion about it. I don't feel like I can talk to my kids. I don't want to talk you to You can't Lord. talk to your bishop. <laughs> <laughs> right. My bishop's MIA. And um <laughs> and um I can't I don't I can't talk to anyone in the ward for obvious reasons. I like, I just felt really alone. Like I am I just can't live like this anymore. Like how can like I just felt like my when you believe something and you used to go to that source for that information. And then you go to the same source and find different information that contradicts what you were originally taught. And there's no explanation about it other than really lengthy, yeah, circumvented. I I just was sick to my stomach. I literally felt like I don't know what to believe because my whole testimony, my whole allegiance has been based on this. And now you're telling me that this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't you just tell me this in the first place? It wasn't the information so much It was the deceit. It was the direct, the, I don't even know how to betrayal betrayal. Yes. I felt literally decepted and and betrayed. I didn't know what was, I didn't know what to believe in the universe at all. I don't know. I felt like I had been running down a hall for so long and I get to a door and I open the door and there's blackness Mm -hmm. everywhere. And I look behind me and there's blackness and I'm just in this door frame floating in space. I, I don't even know what to think. I don't feel grounded. I'm, I'm having a lot of suicidal thoughts, sadly, because I, because your entire life is I'm dependent on my, it and built on it. My whole life I have shoved down and believed that I was never good enough, that I would never be worthy enough because I disagreed with God. I didn't trust myself to make decisions. I didn't think I was worth anything. And to find out that the things that I had problems with, like polygamy, and race, I, I was, I was right all along. I, I wasn't wrong. Mm. I wasn't bad. Mm. I, I was never being I had, deceived and by I had Satan. Those similar feelings too. What, which yeah, word? about which word? of just feeling that all that anger and hurt and everything that was caused. It was so needless that yeah, that it was it wasn't necessary, and that my instincts of of feeling uncomfortable of talking to the bishop about certain things and Correct. not having a relationship with my dad and all these things, like that, all of that, like I said earlier, if the church didn't exist, those things probably wouldn't have been there. So it, it was just a, yeah, it was just the same feelings mm-hmm. of like my instincts mm-hmm. of feeling like this is wrong. This shouldn't be the way that this is. I shouldn't be publicly shamed and all of that was justified. Like it mm-hmm. felt like I, I was right. You were right. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm in this space where I can't talk to, I am literally in a network of amazing people who are doing the best they can, who love the Lord, who are serving in their callings. I love the people in the church. I believe in, the, in so many of the values and standards, but to have these things that ate away at my soul and to find out now we're disavowing something that ate away at my soul. And in July of 2020, Elder uh, Cook made a, a comment. He was talking to the, the uh, it was in the uh, Liahona and, 
or maybe it was still Enzyme. I think it was Leah Hono. Was whatever. <laughs> um, he was, he said something along the lines of, um, I'm paraphrasing the, it is among the belief in the senior councils of the church that for whatever reason, plural marriage or polygamy existed, that reason is complete and it is finished hmm. and it is no more. Hmm. And I'm just going, oh my gosh, everything Carolyn Pearson said was right. It wasn't of God. Mm-hmm. You know, you know what I mean? And I know that they can't come out and say that. And I and I understand that why. But wow, I was tormented for a long time mm-hmm. because I thought I was in opposition against God. I I never in my in a million years dreamed that it was that leaders were in opposition against God. And I I disregarded my own soul and my own heart. Mm-hmm. And thought that I was being influenced by Satan. And journal you after and journal entry, thousands after and thousands journal of entry other after journal entry. So I was super dark and suicidal and angry for like four months. And I finally sent a text to my husband because we he would just not talk about it at all. Like he just shut it down. Again, we've established my emotional maturity. So I completely used manipulative tactics. And I wrote him this really long text and said, the fact that you don't want to understand genuinely why five of your six children, because we have a six-year-old, so why five uh, of our children have left or walked away or stepped away from the church At some in point. the four years you've been bishop. Yeah. Plus your spouse. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking to you about anything. Mm-hmm. And I didn't until he came to me and said, okay, I'm ready to talk. And it, and it might sound like we're piling on him, right? Like he, yeah. What like I did was really unfair. The, people who don't understand Mormonism are like, "What an awful human!" But no, he's not. He's, no, no, I know yeah. you guys love him. Yes, and, and he's you a just good have to person. understand number one what it's like to be an Orthodox Mormon, mm-hmm. but also what it's like to be bishop, right? Yeah, and that's just it. So I, I said to him, "What's it like to be bishop? Explain that to oh, people." Oh gosh, um, a 2017 journal entry was: <laughs> Are we really a child, a Christ-centered church? I'm grateful that Sean can help so many people, but the negative, I mean, people call all the time and because of cell phones, Bishop being a Bishop nowadays is people are, uh, Bishop is so accessible Yeah, and um, they email him, they call him. I mean, how do they look? They look to him as what? Uh, they're Leadership. a leader yeah. in every single so way. Counseling mm-hmm. in ways. Spiritual. Spiritual. Marriage, yes. Marriage, marriage. Counselor. Literally, yeah. Psychologist, for, therapist. For youth to, to adults. It's, it's everybody. Right. And and my my husband is incredibly. Financial advisor. Yes, yeah. everything. My my husband is really confidential. So I, ironically, I think I don't get information about even activities in the ward because people assume that I already know. And I don't even know when the trunk or treat is or when this is <laughs> like, cause my husband doesn't even tell me we get new bishopric member and I'm the last one to find out. Like you, th- I mean, he does not talk about anything. He, he has told me that because of my, um, you know, anxiety and depression, I had suffered with serious postpartum depression after my six year old was born. And, um, because of just who I am and all the things I've been through, he is such a better bishop. And he feels like he's been able to help so many women in the ward. And from um, your perspective of, yeah, uh, instead of just being, because yeah. I got, when I went to a bishop about suicide and cutting, I got, you need to read your scriptures and, and pray more. And so I did. Mm-hmm. And so when, when I didn't find relief, when I didn't have <clears throat> these feelings removed, I just thought at my core, I was not a good person. Just and it's from, made, at my core. And it's made the difference too through what happened to me as a, being a young woman and what happened to me with the sexual shaming and stuff that it's helped him. He's been a better bishop. He's been a better, been bishop, a better bishop for That's good. young women. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. He said, he, you know, he loves the youth and he loves helping people because he's just that type of person. Yeah. I mean, I would get people text me. I have no idea where my husband is. He, he leave, So you ask what it's like to be a bishop. So he'll just disappear. He's out, I'm mowing the lawn and then his truck's gone and I don't, he doesn't come back for three hours. And I know he's, I know when he does, when he does that, he's not just running to Lowe's or Home Depot. Mm-hmm. He, he's doing Bishop stuff and he needed to leave. And somebody has an emergency. Yeah. And, he drops and so everything to that's just, it's really hard. It's hard. And I just remember. And by the way, people, yeah. non-Mormons don't understand. This isn't like a Catholic priest where it's his full-time job. He has a full-time job in a, addition a to being a bishop. Yeah. 
and his and children yeah. and other responsibilities. Yeah. Right? And when you are bishop, uh, your your family is second fiddle, and and, it, and I get yeah. why, but it's really tough. I mean, he's been bishop since our daughter was nine months old. And, and she's six. And he, he has long hours at work. And then he comes home and he has lots of meetings or he's outside in the backyard pacing on when, phones, when, when on phone the, calls. When the phone rings and he takes it and heads out, I know it's a work call. When he looks, when he I sees mean, and it and then he goes out, shuts the door and then yeah. takes it, I know it's a church call. You've literally you know I mean? said there's been people who call at two to three in two, three a.m. Yeah. Like asking for things. He, yeah. It's just because they're going to kill themselves or, you know, yeah. and he's always, you know, so I don't, I, well, I'll just have to know. say, and they are not trained as mental health professionals. No, and he's not. So they have no idea how to help someone with their sexual yeah. dysfunction, yeah. With yeah. drug addiction, with an unruly child, yeah. or, yeah. you know, someone who's cutting or borderline it, personality it, it disorder. It doesn't, it doesn't There's matter. No training. There's no it training. doesn't matter how much of a good person yeah. you are and yeah. like in genuine motives to being a bishop, you are not trained in those areas. Yeah. And, and, you know, everybody wants, you know, <clears throat> they want his approval and, and it's not, they want Sean Mike Sell's approval. It's they the just want the bishop's approval and they want his, you know, them, they just want him to feel like he cares, like this important person in the ward cares about them. And so I understand, but it, it, it began to make me question the structure of the church. If, if it really did bring families together mm -hmm. or if it took us apart because it spread us so thin Especially at this point, that when we had nothing to give. You're starting to feel closer to us. Yes. Away from it. Because yes. all of us of kids have pretty much yes. separated. So, so really when COVID happened. Can I just, oh, wait, before we go to COVID, I'm just struck by this idea again, that the, the church is all about families. Yeah. And your husband's helping everyone in the ward. Yes. And when his own, and this isn't a pile on him because he's a part of a system. It's systems, not people. Yes. But when his own wife and kids, everything's kind of unraveling. He's like, I can't talk to you. You guys got to go figure that out. Yeah. I got to go help all these other people in the ward. That must be an incredibly lonely for you. Definitely. And yeah. for him. Yeah. It was, and just yeah. not good for the family no, at all. No, it's not good for the family. And, and so when church meetings stopped, oh, I felt so much relief. Yeah. I could breathe for the first time in a long time. And it was so nice to have Him my home. family together mm -hmm. and we could choose what but it we took wanted. A global pandemic. Yeah. We, we could teach what <laughs> we wanted to our children and we had sacrament at home and I felt the spirit again. Like I felt connected and I, I was, it just made me realize mo so much more what was really important to me. So I, when I had sent him that, like, I'm not going to talk to you until you are willing to talk about why our kids have left the church. Um, I said, and I don't know why it's such a threat for you. I'm not asking you to change your mind about anything. I, do, I want to have a conversation. Why can't I even have a conversation about it? And, um, and, and maybe you could explain, we've had several Mormon bishops on, but what, if a Mormon bishop loses his faith while he's a Mormon bishop, it's, yeah, it's, it's like catastrophic yeah. because every, because he gets you all, everyone knows that a Mormon Bishop is supposed to serve five years. So if ever a Mormon Bishop is released prior to five years, everybody wonders, what does he have a porn problem? <laughs> did he cheat mm -hmm. on somebody? Is he, a, did he break the law? Like what? Mm -hmm. So, and then if, and if he, yeah. And then if he stops early, then there's the buzz and the scandal of like, why did he, yeah. mm -hmm. did, did a Bishop lose his faith? <clears throat> and then, then the stake president, his boss might turn around and want to, have disciplinary hearings because the last thing is uh, the Mormon church wants are, are their top leaders losing their faith. So you might face an inquiry and possible excommunication mm -hmm. if it's discovered that a bishop has lost his faith. And so a bishop can't be entertaining doubts and questions and, and that was exactly or why. everything yeah. could blow up yeah. and, and to it's be a public clear. scandal. Yeah. And, and then if yeah. their job is tied in Mormonism mm -hmm. to, any, oh, to yeah. Mormonism, if they're a dentist or a lawyer, mm -hmm. And then they lose their faith and they get released early, all the scandal of rumors, and then you might lose clients or customers. Mm -hmm. Like it can be Mormon just catastrophic. Yeah. Right? And and to be clear, we just want to make that clear that you have gone through this and he's still in that position of I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. He, right now. he yes. now, yeah. in all today, fairness, today, correct. Yeah. In all fairness, um, not to throw him under the he bus. He did say, okay, I'll, I'll, I want to talk. Why did our, mm -hmm. what, what are our kids' so, issues? So you said, okay. I won't talk to you again. Yeah, I won't talk you. about you with anything. And I said, you don't get to dictate what we do and do not talk about in our marriage. And I'm dying inside. And you're my partner. 
So if you can't talk to me about what I'm dying about, then I'm not talking about you, you with anything. And so he, he came home like from work a couple nights later and he's like, okay, I'm ready to talk. And I shared with him the stuff from the essays and, um, gospel topic essays. Yeah. The gospel topic essays. And just, I said, and Joseph Smith's character and what it said on there and, and just how different it was from when he had served his mission and what he had taught people about Joseph Smith. And, um, he's like, I, I, I have not heard, I've never heard of most of this. Mm. And I said, therein lies the problem. Mm. You're a bishop. bishop. I said, you have been a bishop for over four years. You have been a young men's president. You have served in two stake young men's presidencies. You've been on the high council. You've been in bishoprics. You've served as a ward clerk. You have been a scoutmaster, a yeah. varsity coach for most of your 32 years as an adult in this church. And, and you served a mission to Brazil. And it's tearing your family apart. And yeah. you have never heard of most of this stuff. Don't you think that's problematic? <laughs> and I may not have said that so nicely. <laughs> if you haven't got doll, I am a little passionate when I get upset. And um, he's like, no, no, no. I, I, I see. I mean, that is problematic, you know, but blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, don't butt me. Just listen. This is why your kids don't want to talk to you. Because all we've ever done to them is let talk to me, right? And but. then we're like, why, why don't you read your scriptures more? And pray. Mm -hmm. And why don't you, why don't you refer, have you looked at your um, patriarchal blessing recently? Mm. Are you paying your tithing? Mm. You know, don't do that to me. Don't do it. Just listen. I mm -hmm. feel betrayed. And every single one of our children's 72, and I point to the wall, 72 questions mm. is valid. Mm. Now, I may not have drawn the same conclusions as my children on all of those issues, but there is a massive problem with what I was raised and what is currently now on churchofjesuschrist.org. And now I don't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like my world had shattered. And he was sympathetic in terms of my emotions. He was very afraid. Um, he said to me, you know what? I said, I'm so angry right now. I, I just want to leave the church. I'm so angry how does this happen? How does this just get slipped in? And I'm an active believing member who teaches. Like there is something seriously wrong here and it's not with me. I mean, I was taking back, you know, this Your inside power. and he's, his eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, oh my gosh. And he says to me, um, I respect you and I love you. And I don't necessarily feel the same, although it is disturbing to me that this is, this is here and I didn't know about it, but whatever you decide to do, whether you decide to leave the church or you decide to stay, I support you and I love you. And you mean more to me than any religion mm. because I made covenants in the temple with you and God. I did not make them with Joseph Smith. I did not make them with Russell M. Nelson. And I did not make them with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mm. So I respect you. And I'm asking that you respect me too. Mm. I, I'm asking you not to leave. And if we could kind of maybe read and things together and I can, you know, I'm asking you to just maybe slow down and not go at Mach 10 speed because I cannot assimilate information as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I'm hearing about this mm -hmm. and you've been mulling it over for a while. So I feel like a deer in headlights. Mm -hmm. And um, so we... I think because, to be quite honest with you, I, if he had responded differently, if he had freaked out or been talked about divorce or anything, like sadly I hear people do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I would have just out of that rage and that rawness, because it's just shocking. It's shocking to learn something different. So then you think, okay, so what, is, what really happened? This used to be true, now this is true. Like your brain just, my brain just couldn't handle it and I freaked out. And so if he hadn't responded that way, so, so compassionately, I, I totally would have probably writ, written a letter for good and removed your name, room by name, because I was so angry. And so I just stepped back 
and I took deep breaths and I reached out to you. I'm like, you know, I don't really know because he didn't want to talk about the specifics of things. And he said, you know, nothing you say, even if it's all true, I'll never stop believing. And I just was like, I'm not asking you not to believe. And I'm not even saying I just completely don't believe in the church anymore. I'm asking to talk about these things that why are they different? I deserve an explanation. And, and some of this convoluted explanations, it, it actually hurt my testimony more. And I found Fair Mormon. And I was shocked that Fair Mormon, this apologist, okay, first of all, I didn't know there were such things as apologist websites. I found your website in November of 2020. And before I even started listening to things, I'm like, who's this guy? Like, what's his deal? I found your excommunication story. And I listened to the seven hours of it hmm. because I wasn't going to listen to the, you know, I wanted to see who you were. And I, I felt so compassionate towards your story. So you didn't have the same beliefs, but you were providing a forum for people to talk about things that doesn't exist in the church. So I want to kill myself because I feel alienated and alone in a, in a church of millions of people. There's a problem with that fundamental problem with that. Mm -hmm. And your, your podcast saved my life because I had no idea other people were experiencing the same thing I did. And I reached out to you um, because I just was struggling so much. And I, um, you had recommended that I listen to gift of a Mormon faith crisis. And podcast. Yeah. Po yeah. The yeah. gift of Mormon. It was a podcast and it totally turned things around for me. It, I, I was like, okay, I can breathe. Like this is something that people go through. I took a world <clears throat> religion class through Harvard's, um, the divinity Harvard online school. And I just like want to understand. I just want to learn. I want to slow down. I want to learn. I, I'm not going to make rash judgments either way anymore. You know, um, I, I, but the, the gift of a Mormon faith crisis, I definitely would recommend to, and anyone who either has a family member or is going through a faith crisis because it, it just helped me put things into perspective, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm. okay, breathe. And um, I, I did a values inventory and I did a belief inventory. I, I did. You gave a homework assignments after all of them and I did all the homework assignments. Mm -hmm. I know it's a shocker. <laughs> um, <Of course. laughs> I'm so arrogant. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but, but it helped me because I was able to write things down. I am not a very articulate person in general. Um, and when I feel very emotional, I just am like, uh, la, 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 you know, and, and, but I process when I write, I, I kind of process things when I write and it allows me to form opinions and change opinions and thoughts. And so, um, I definitely have started picking up all those crumbles that, you know, shattered pieces. And there's some things that I'm like, okay, all right, I'm good. I, I, I this, put this right back up. I'm going to use this enough for a building block. I, I feel like I have to kind of rebuild a, a measure of my scaffolding. Other things I'm like, I've got to research more about this. I, I do. I, this needs more attention. So it goes over here. And then, then those are things that I've just rejected. And, and, and it's not that I've consciously rejected it, like intentionally. It's just when my framework fell apart and I used to be so judgmental and critical of people based on that knowledge, because I knew that it was true. The, these, the way these things happened, it happened this way. I knew that they had happened that way. And, and you were just deceived. And so, or ignorant, or you didn't have all the facts. And so all of a sudden, I'm wrong. I don't know what is, what is true. And I'm having, it just, scales fell from my eyes. I realized I had been judging people even, even before, even in the time that I was, I was still trying to like convince y'all, mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, no, really like you get the facts right. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> and, um, and <clears throat> I joined, uh, the Mormon stories, Facebook group. I, I joined Facebook in, in January in order to join the Mormon stories, Facebook group, because I just felt so alone. And that was really cathartic for me to just read that. Okay. Other people had, is going, are going through this and they're normal and they're not insane and they're not being deceived by Satan. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> has made a huge difference in my psyche 
that I didn't realize I had rejected is um, when uh, I don't believe that I am being like injected or trapped and tempted by Satan all the time. I don't believe that my feelings of sadness or depression or anger or sexual thoughts or is t- Satan tempting me. It's just I human now, behavior. It's human behavior. And for me to understand that has kind of lifted this like, okay, I, I have control of myself. Like I'm in charge of myself. I'm not so afraid of the world. I'm not afraid like, you know, like this is Satan tempting me. And I'm, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. do I, and I can make choices based on that. Like, you know, fidelity is, is incredibly important to me. And, and I do value a lot of things in the law of chastity, although I will teach it differently to my six-year-old and I will not shame her the way mm-hmm. I shamed Kayla. Um, I want to teach her in a way that empowers her and instead of this fear base, like mm-hmm. if you have sex, you're unworthy, you are shameful, you are bad, and you will not go to heaven if you don't repent. You know, this, this fear, I, I just was shocked at how much fear I infused in my children through just my teachings, because that's how I was taught. And I don't want to raise my daughter that way at all. Mm-hmm. And I want to teach her, <clears throat> I value chastity. <clears throat> this is kind of what it is. Uh, your body's not shameful. Um, you know, you're, you're, it's beautiful. And, um, the sexualization of, yeah. you know, that, that hyper-focusness and yeah. stuff I'm trying to get away from, but she's already been indoctrinated with that. Like I bought her purposely bought her a tank top. Like I had found Jennifer Finlayson Fife's work. Um, and that was really instrumental to me. Um, I took her art of desire class in helping me understand I can have my value, I can have a higher value and a higher self, <clears throat> but I can approach it differently and I can teach it to my children differently. And that, you know, what do you want? Do you want a, a committed, loving, long-term monogamous, monogamous relationship? Then you have to evaluate along the way. Is this behavior going to get me here? Is it, but just talking about it in general. So you're saying just like the values of- Yes, yes your higher you can self. Suffer, that just because you're you know, not in the Mormon religion anymore or you're questioning or things like that, that it doesn't mean all of these, if, if, like the values are thrown out the window. That you have no that values. You, yeah, you, you can still and I see have important like children aren't family. depraved, horrible people yeah. because they've left the church. Yeah. And so it's just opened my eyes. That, and so when you're going, yeah. I'm seeing this happen during this period of time um, and seeing how different the shift is in the way that she's talking to me and processing things. And just, I'm seeing that difference. And that's why Mm -hmm. I felt comfortable enough to come out to her Mm because I just wasn't ever going to say anything Mm -hmm. because I was like, there's two ways this can go literally because bisexual, I could either end up with (laughs) a guy or I can end up with a girl. And if I end up with a girl, then that will be the time to tell her. Then I don't really have a choice. But if I end up being with a guy and I'll just silent, they will never know because I can not just, disguise in a heterosexual relationship, but there, but that, that's a way to be in a, you know, in a relationship that she would just never find out. So I finally felt comfortable enough to tell her that I was bisexual and her response and everything was like, yeah, that's fine. It's, it was just super casual and, and it, you know, no and, problems and at all. This past summer, she wrote me a letter telling me she'd had her name removed from the records of the church. Yeah. And I mean, it's just systematically like, boom, boom bomb, just a ton bomb, of things in 2020 from child, you know, and I didn't want to judge them or look down on them. Yeah. And I tried to convey that in my response to you. Yeah. You know? And it's a tiny bit ironic or sad or tragic that being an Orthodox believing Mormon, or let's just say the pinnacle of parenthood is you wanting your kids to be able to tell you when they're going through hard things. I, I if there's a parent out there that that's not their biggest goal, I would question that mm-hmm. parent. I, I would, as a parent, I, what I want most is when my kids having a hard time that they want to tell me what's going on so that I can be a support to them. And it's ironic that being a super Orthodox believing Mormon makes your kids less interested or eager to talk to you about hard things because of the judgment. And, and it makes yeah. you less, less loving and kind and compassionate and unconditionally loving when they do come and talk to you. And then you flip that. It's ironic that you starting to question your faith and losing your Orthodox Mormon faith is what then makes your kids feel safe yeah. 
and comfortable and, and men, to come and to you and to tell yeah, you what they're going through. Mending the relationship. Yes. Because I, it was so... What does that say about being an Orthodox woman? Yeah, I, that it completely I, just destroyed I, it. This past year, I've been on a journey. Like, 2021 is my journey of mending hurt relationships because I judged them. Mm-hmm. And and I'm also reevaluating, you know, my beliefs. Do I believe this and why? Um, you know, and I've learned a lot about elevation emotion and how easily emotions can be manipulated. And, um, and yet I can't deny, and I don't, I, I do believe in God and I believe in Jesus Christ, but I no longer feel this need to hit all the checklists for yeah. Mormonism. And, and my, it's whatever my works goal for you. has just shifted. And it, what I tried so hard as a Mormon, like uh, just that Orthodox binary thinker. And, and now that I'm I mean, I, I guess I don't know the right word, maybe a progressive Mormon. I still identify as Mormon. I love many of the Mormon beliefs. I go to church. I support my husband. Um, but my my mind is shifting, and I, I'm seeing people in the community just with love. I mean, I, I said I I this past weekend I had a couple photo shoots, and I saw – and they were with two fa- – one was a bridal – at bridal shoot at the temple and the other was just a family. And I hadn't seen them for a long time because they were former members of our ward. And when I saw them, I was just filled with so much love for them. And it's genuine. Like I am so blessed to have so many amazing friendships um, in the church and good people. And I, and I do value religion. I respect that others don't. And, and being part of the Mormon podcast face group group, group and seeing that there's this ex-Mormon community, I used to have this mindset like, well, if you don't want to be part of the church, leave. No one's making you stay. Get out. Yeah. Get out. Banish. Banish. Get out. And um, what's your problem? Like, chill out. And 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 be, in my quest to understand my children, I realized why they couldn't leave it alone. Because they felt hurt. They felt betrayed. They felt like people just shut them out. And I did as a Mormon. I'm the one that put up the walls and the barriers, not them. Uh, I remember several years ago, standing in Michael's craft store, a woman who had I had previously known, her husband had served in some prominent callings in the ward. I knew she had two daughters, and I had heard that she left and her husband left the church just prior to her daughters being baptized. And she said to me, hi, Kelly, how are you? And I was like, Hi, so-and-so. And And I had seen her, but I was pretending like I hadn't seen her in line. And I was like, hi, how are you? And I could not see her as a regular human being. All I could see, all that was plastered in front of me was, she left the church before her girls were baptized. Shame on her. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I don't ever want to be that Mormon again. I don't want to be that type of Mormon. I don't want religion to define me that way. So I'm on my own journey. And one thing I I told Kayla um, when I went up for her 21st birthday to take pictures of her Miss Salt Lake, you know, with her crown and sash and to go take her to dinner. I told her, I was in tears. I said, you know, I know all eight of us are on different journeys in our family, but I'm so grateful we are on this journey together And even though we draw different conclusions about some things, I just feel like we're so much more connected and other families don't have that. And I'm so grateful. What happened to my brother Mm -hmm. won't happen to us. And I have contacted my brother and I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And I just apologized. And I was so sorry. And that I had judged him so harshly when I was just convinced I knew the way that things were, were the right way. And, um, and he was so gracious and kind, but I've lost 20 years. And that's like one of the reasons why for running from Miss Salt Lake and why I chose the LGBT community and specifically being here in Utah because of the harm. And that example of not speaking to your brother and losing all of that time is that to, even if it's just two people to just be like, mm-hmm. take a step back and being like, oh, they're human beings <laughs> and they as in people who are in the LGBT, you know, Q community. And that I especially too, because 
so many people who are LDS and are in that community, they don't feel comfortable coming out. So they just stay in that bubble. And so there's a lot of people, like you said, other than your brother, you didn't know anyone. So there's a lot of stereotypes and things like that, that, you know, I know that some people, when they think of lesbians, they think of a girl with short hair and they, there's all these different stereotypes. So yeah, I'm in a beauty pageant, but I also like, like there, we come in all different personalities and looks and everything. And every year it's so funny. I know someone that made a comment, um, before they, before I had come out before they knew, um, saying, I wonder why there's so many people like coming out recently. Like, like, what is it? Cause I, I know that adults now are thinking it's like a fad and stuff. It's because people are more comfortable to come out. Mm -hmm. The numbers have safer. not, the numbers have not changed. Yeah. People just haven't been, have felt safe enough to come out. And so that's why I think it's super important that I mm -hmm. do this. And even I've even had some people reach out to me that are going to BYU or some, a lot of high school students have actually messaged me who go, you know, go to school here in Utah and are in the community and have Mormon families. And I've had a couple say that only two people know my family doesn't know. And I'm scared to tell them if I think, I think that if I tell them they're going to kick me out and I just, it just breaks my heart. And all of those kids like thanking me for choosing it as my platform, because it was risky, especially for Utah, for me to do that. I didn't think that I would they would like, let me honestly, let me be to begin with and then get Miss Salt Lake for it. Like that, I ju it, it was just meant a lot that even if the four people or five or how many people four it reaches and, and it reaches, yeah, that it's made, it's made them an impact. And it's weird to think, I don't want to like as myself to, to look up to, but the, uh, people have like reached out and said, thank you for choosing that as my platform to just bring awareness here, especially in Utah. And my really goal for coming on today um, I, like I said, I, I had no, no idea about Mormon Stories podcasts, but I needed that. I mean, to hear stories like Donna Showalter and Leah and Cody Young. And um, I mean, these are heartfelt, genuine people who are experiencing pain. And I never viewed, I'm so sad to say, but I, I never viewed people who left the church or who struggled with the church. I never viewed them as legitimate. I, it was... I'm just embarrassed to say that, but I didn't. And it was comforting to know that even though my the belief structure I had for 43 years has crumbled, I feel empowered and I feel okay that I'm building a new one, you know? And, and, and there's a lot yeah. that I'm, I'm keeping. And, and then there's the some part. I'm not, you yeah. know? And, and that's okay. Yeah. And you know what's really sad is... Our six-year-old said something super cute and funny regarding her beliefs. And after family home evening one night, okay, so like I have family home evening. Like a couple months ago yeah. after family home evening, <clears throat> where we're talking about Jesus Christ, um, she says, I want to tell you my belief, but I'm afraid to tell you. Okay, so I guess at the time she's five because she turned six in March. And... Um, I was, now, because I've gone on this huge journey, I was like, you know what? Beliefs are a construct in your brain. And guess what's so cool is everybody has different beliefs about things. And that's what makes it a belief. So we all have different beliefs and it's okay. You can have different beliefs than me, mm, right? And she says something that kind of shocks me about religion. And I asked her if I could share that today. And she said, no. <laughs> nice. And I said, you practice consent. Yeah. I, but here's why. <laughs> yeah. And I said, why not? And she's like, I don't want to talk about it. And I said, I dropped down to my knees cause she was playing with one of her dolls. And I said, I respect that you don't want me to tell them what that belief is. And I won't, but can you just tell me why? And her voice started to quiver. And she said, because I don't want to get kicked out of the church. Mm. She's six. And I was like, honey, you won't get kicked out of the church because you have a different belief. She goes, yes, I will. And I said, why do you say that? She goes, because I heard you tell daddy that you would get kicked out of the church if you didn't have all the same beliefs. And I was like, oh. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? You won't. You won't. I promise. And she goes, I can't risk it. I can't risk it? As a six-year-old, yeah. Because she loves her friends and her primary teacher. The community. And the community. And she likes going to church because it's part of our life. But I'm excited. Do you think that something's I, problematic with that? Yeah, but yeah. I'm excited to see the difference in 
obviously talking about how I was raised yeah. with that versus how she's going to be raised. So I'm, I, it's going to be hard on her. That's like, you're trying to figure out how to parent yeah. without yeah. With, with the, the Mormonism change, and stuff with the with changes, some of my changes in but ideas. even that example right there of her saying, mm -hmm. you know, telling her you to asking to share something about a belief. I never even as a six year old, seven, 15, 18 year old would have never felt comfortable to say something like no. that. So I think the whole point is, of this entire mm -hmm. thing is just that she feels comfortable telling. Yeah. You. And that's yeah. the growth that we've had as a family yeah. as for all of us, all eight of us. And, and so, so that, we're yeah. close now. We are a lot closer. I, yeah. I, one of my boys said to me, I, I feel like I could tell you anything, literally anything, anything, even yeah. if you didn't, you know, like it. Yeah. I, I would tell you anything right now. And, and I just want to, I don't want other parents to go through their life, if, if someone listens to this podcast and only one person, one sister doesn't treat her brother the way I treated him and salvages a relationship and doesn't lose 20 years, if one family can not go through the heartache of judging their children and thinking they're a failure, we had a quote in our house that said on a plaque, no success can compensate for failure in the home, which means people are failures. I was like, I've failed. I've failed mm, as a parent. Yeah, I've failed. My kids are failures. I had a family member say, I never thought all of your children would be such a disappointment. <laughs> oh. It's great. Matter what else you accomplish? Right, yeah, right. It doesn't matter anything else. Salt Lake City. Yep. Traveling, happy, being healthy. completely independent. Just see my children as disappointments. Yeah. yeah. And that was the that was the motivation. I knew that that was wrong. I knew it wasn't right, and I was just determined. I was not going to live the rest of my life crying every night on the side Praying of my for bed your kids. because I was going to be alone with my husband in the celestial kingdom, and none of my kids were going to be there. That is hell. That's yeah. not heaven. There's nothing mm -hmm. heaven about that, and there was nothing Christ-like the way I viewed them. But I couldn't see. I really thought I was yeah. standing up for truth and righteousness. I thought it was. <laughs> Defending my beliefs. No, I was being judgmental, shoving my opinions on people. And anytime they had a concern, I'd end the conversation <clears throat> with bearing my testimony. That's not listening. If for me, I wish I had just a long, I guess a long time ago, had understood the importance of understanding comes from listening. Mm -hmm. I recently read a book about... Um, Mormons and gay, more, gay Mormons, written by Richard Osler. Mm -hmm. And it's called li, uh, Listen. Learn and Love. Yes, Listen, Learn and Love. Yep. And I just was blown away. Oh, myth, 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 myth. Yep, yep, yep. I learned so much, you know. I'm just trying to learn and grow and be a better person. And I've been really fortunate. I've um, only shared a few of things other outside of my, my immediate children and my husband. Um, one friend I had, when I was struggling with like with this earlier, I had started to talk about some things and she was like, I can't go there. Like, I respect you. I love you. I want to have a friendship with you, but I can't talk about anything about like that about church. And I respected that. And we didn't. Another friend, I just shared how I've been going through this really, this year has been really rough. And I've, I've just come to a different understanding about myself. And, and then I, a third friend, I, I didn't say specific beliefs, but I did tell her more in depth about how I went through a really dark period and how Sean said to me, you know, you are, you are one of the most faithful, integral people I know, and I respect whatever you decide to do. And she said, wow, that's really impressive because I don't think my husband could have said the same thing to me. And this woman is just, you know, stake, relief side president, stake, yeah, women's president. I mean, she is very devout and believing, but she never once judged me. And she just listened. And, and my just, goal we need was, more of that. my goal was never, I never told her specifics. I, I have no idea, you know, she'll, she'll find the gospel topics essays online one day. And, uh, you know, I, well, I Kayla don't, will slip her uh, yeah, like, a little, you know, it was a trigger digger. Go look it up. Um, but, you heard about Turgy? You know, <laughs> I, my goal is, is not, I, I'm, 
to I, take people away. It's you it, just want to. It's just I listen. was angry for yeah. four months, and I probably did want to shout at the rooftops. Yeah, but listening to those podcasts was really healing to me. Yeah, and so I just want to you know I, we should be able to talk about difficult things and not be kicked out of the church. Definitely emotionally and physically through emotional shunning and fear. I was so afraid of people. Um, one of the things that has been really, I would say, damaging to my original Orthodox testimony, believe it or not, is I had no idea the level of excommunications that went on for apostasy. I was shocked when I started reading about or listening to, and then to find out that these people were not getting excommunicated because they were touting lies. It just wasn't faith-promoting facts. Truth. That uh, was disturbing. Uncomfortable truths. That was disturbing People have to been me. excommunicated for decades just for sharing uncomfortable truths. And that's not okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I, I understand that, you know, truth, God isn't going to, God is not going to lie. So who cares what people say? Jesus Christ, I started studying excommunication this fall. Like I... That went on my way. little yellow <laughs> sticky note. Like, why do we excommunicate people? Because they have different thoughts and beliefs. Or speak about them. That's not okay. Because yeah, you, you create yeah. a culture of silence and fear. When in my case, I, not saying that this isn't the case for anyone. I don't know other people personally. All I know is what me and my children have gone through. But there is no forum. There's no forum. Mm -hmm. You're a doubter. You've been deceived by Satan. I mean, it, it's and a I know whole deceived by Satan thing. Even if, got to stop. even if people who know us listen to this entire podcast, they're still going to be, oh, that's so sad. And, and I understand that. Yeah. And that's okay. Because I would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she and I were talking about that. And I was like, please be patient. Don't just hate every believing member. Because I still want to be a member of the church. And I'm not going to ever view it the same way. And it's going to be a long journey of me figuring things out. But I was a product of environment. I wasn't doing and, it intentionally. Yeah. I, I thought I was doing what's right. Yeah. So other people are too. Yeah. So give them some slack. Yeah. And I know that there's people that have been seriously harmed by different things. And, and, and I respect that, you know? So, mm. yeah. Beautiful. Powerful. So powerful. <laughs> Thank you. That's so great. That's uh, such a great story. Both of you, amazing and vulnerable and powerful. And uh, I'm inspired. How about you, Kara? Yeah, I was just thinking about the ways. I know we already said this, but I would just love to really like hone down exactly what you just said about how when you were a believing member and you were so orthodox, how many bricks that you put up between the people that you loved and I, I wrote down in my notes about how you started with the Bible and you wanted to understand the difference between Christ and the Pharisees. And you saw, like you said, a, I'm the Pharisee. that you were the Pharisee and you saw the, the ways that you could improve to be more compassionate, be more Christ-like. And what are we trying to talk about ultimately is the highest form of selflessness and love. And if that's Christ to you, like that's a perfectly good Absolutely. thing to thing to worship and yeah. to to work towards being like. And the more Mormons that can listen to your story and really, really see themselves, are you being like Christ or are you being like a Pharisee and who are you building bricks? Who are you cl like closing yeah. yourself off from? Is it your own family members? Is it you putting the church before your family? And if so, what harm is that causing mm -hmm. and what do you need to rework? What things do you need to pray different uh, and different priorities to be put in place? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a really beautiful story. The way that your relationship with your stepmom, understanding all the different dynamics that came into play. So I really hope that people listen and see themselves in your story. Thank you. That was really Thanks. good. They will. Yeah. They will for Thank sure. You. Thanks. I hope, uh, I hope Sean's going to be okay. <laughs> He may get a call from his yeah. state president. I don't and, understand why, though. Well, just, you know, coming out. I mean, th one of the reasons they excommunicate people is to brand them as dangerous. Yeah. And so coming on Mormon Stories podcast can be viewed in and of itself as an act of apostasy. You're giving them and ideas, John. Just kidding. What's that? <laughs> You're giving them ideas. No, 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 I, they don't, I, I've been doing this a while. I've been around the well, block. You write the letter times, for them, John. But, Come on. I'm just kidding. No, but, but I mean, hopefully they'll yeah. leave him alone, but they probably won't. He'll probably get called in. 
He may get released early. I hope he doesn't, but he's almost yeah. done with his tenure It'll be anyway. Five years in August. Anyway, shout out to Sean. We love you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hang in there. <laughs> love you. And uh, th- thanks for uh, all the good things you've done and all the ways you've worked to try and uh, support your family and, and your ward. And thank you to that. Let me just ask really quickly. This is going to just totally like be a right angle change. Um, Kayla, mm-hmm. th- there are probably stereotypes about beauty pageants. Yeah. Just like, yeah. <laughs> like you know, th- there's going to be people that are like, like them for reasons that may not be the most enlightened reasons to mm-hmm. like them. And then there's going to be others that look down on them as like unenlightened. Yeah. Talk about just why you would want to be involved and what yeah. maybe how, how people might misunderstand uh, beauty what pageants. They are. Yeah. Is that even what they're called now? No, well, I just said beauty pageants. That's what people no, are. They're just me. pageants. I, that's my, um, what I would call them. Yeah. So I had never done one before. I did. I just love doing new things. Um, and I did cheerleading all through high school um, and did like, um, not just like the sideline, I did um, competitive with it too. And um, so, and it gave me a lot of confidence because I didn't have a ton when like, getting into middle school is very tomboy having three older brothers. Um, and so it gave me a lot of confidence. It was like playing a character and it was, so it was really fun to be able to go on the mat and perform these routines um, and just be not myself, just to be this character being able to, I don't know, it was just really fun. So I thought that pageants would be similar to be able to be because I know some people would think of it as being shallow or um, uh, what's it called? Self. Like, um, I'm vain, the like words. Vain. Vain. Yes. Yeah, yes. Vain. When in reality, a lot of women actually do them. Um, and there's, there's even ones for people who are married and like, they have like older to gain confidence. Right. It, it's to, it's a motivator right. to, okay, it, this is in September. I'm going to try and get in the best shape that I possibly <laughs> can. And I'm going to, and you have to, do all of these things. And it's, it's not just getting on stage in, in a pretty dress. There's a lot of other things that you have to prepare like, for. There's an interview section that they do before that that's thing, like on TV, they never show that part. So you get grilled. You have to know, you have to be up with current news, things like that and be able to answer these questions. In a, in a, yes. Yeah, exactly. In a charismatic, um, in, informed, not offending anybody. You need to be able to, Diplomatic. yeah, exactly. So so I get to educate myself. I get to work on myself. I get to, and then pick a platform. So mine is the LGBT community. So I'm volunteering with, um, the Utah pride center for pride. So I've been helping for months plan this. Um, yeah. Yeah. For this week. Um, yeah. So it's going to be, it's going to be great. Um, what's it called again? So Utah pride center here in Utah, it's just pride week. So that's what I'm, I'm volunteering. So my, yeah, volunteering for that. So you get to, yeah, pick a platform. So somebody else could be, you know, an animal rights as- activist or something. So they use their platform with the, you know, the sash and things that they get to hold events and, and do things. And so I, it's, it's definitely more than just getting on stage in a pretty dress. There's, there's Is reasons there behind it. Thing? Is there still a talent kind of thing? Um, it depends. It? There's different types okay. of pageants. Okay. So some are, yeah, some have, um, talents, some have like swimsuit portions, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of other aspects to it that appealed to me, but also yes, being in a dress is going to be fun, <laughs> but I, I, I just think it's been fun to be able to, and not even fun. It's just been an amazing opportunity to be able to use that platform to talk about LGBTQ community, especially How, how does it make you feel about yourself? Um, it's more, once again, the more confidence thing, it's being able to, sometimes I, I sit and think I'm probably annoying people with how much I post about stuff. And I've also had some thoughts about people not, um, validating me. Cause like I said, I didn't figure it out until I was older. So I bet that there's people I know from middle school and high school. I'm like, she's not by like the, yeah. the platform part. Um, yeah. So I'm just like that. They, they probably don't, they don't validate my sexuality. And so with the platform, it, sometimes I, I think that I'm, I'm wondering if people are not believing me and things like that. I'm like, it doesn't matter because even if I wasn't, I could still pick this platform for the voices of other people. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Isn't she awesome? Yeah, that's a great yeah, message. Pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, and so the next step is. I'll be running for Miss Utah in September. So yeah. you'll be, and so all the different cities are going to send their yeah. own reps and, mm-hmm. and then if someone, when someone wins that. Then, then it would be on to USA. Yeah. Miss USA or Miss America, or is it? There, like I said, there's the two different, oh, okay. pa- like there's okay. two main different like systems. So she's part of the United States, States of America. America. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then nice. I'd be running for that. So yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> well, I'm just so thrilled that you guys, I was able to get to know you re- and, and we were able to 
celebrate Pride Week by having this epic yeah. story. Uh, just so, and that you come all the way from Nevada, mm -hmm. Nevada, Nevada, to, <laughs> Nevada. To, Nevada. I know <laughs> to, to make this happen. So I'm inspired. I'm grateful. Any final words you guys want to say? No, thank you. Well, so just much thanks for, for having us. Inviting us. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, it's, it's been our pleasure, and um, I know a lot of people are going to be very positively impacted by this. So yeah, it uh, means so. a lot. So thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Kara too. Yeah, thanks, Kara. And Kara, thanks so much for being sidekick. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Thanks for letting me hear your story and chime in. It was really inspiring. It's like almost sounds cliche. I can't even say the word inspiring. My jaw was on the floor most of the time. How's that? It was really, really interesting and really cool to Thank hear your guys' you. story. All right. So is there any way people can support uh, you or the Utah Pride Center yeah. or Pride or anything you yeah. want to say about um, that? So I definitely... Utah Pride Center is absolutely amazing. They don't just do Pride. It's not just the week or the month of June, which is Pride Month. They do so many other things um, throughout the entire year. Um, they have so many educational courses for um, parents, too, who their children have come oh, out. So you can take classes and learn about things. They have resources for uh, teenagers, adults, everybody, for everyone, too. They have transgender certain like classes and things like that for everybody, gay, lesbian, bi. They have like certain meetings and things like that. And um, it's just a, a sense of community, which especially can be hard here in Utah. So they have, like I said, throughout the entire year. So if you just go on their website, just Utah Pride Center, um, they will have a calendar that shows you everything throughout the entire year. Um, and yeah, they could definitely use your support with like donations and things like that. It's They're amazing in making sure that not only youth, but adults get um, the proper um, v validity here in Utah. And if someone wants to support you at Miss Utah, what do they do? Yeah, um, you can just, I guess, follow me on Instagram, <laughs> which uh, is just, what's, what's the, yeah, uh, it's just Kayla, K-A-Y-L-A dot Mike Sell, M-I-K-E-S-E-L-L. -L. Um, and you'll see me prepare for, and I, I talk about LGBTQ stuff on there and pride stuff um, and try to educate. And then I'll be running for Miss Utah in September. So you'll be able to see that. Great. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, here, uh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Sweet. Thanks so much. All right. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. It's been great. Thanks to everyone who donates to the Open Stories Foundation. Your donations mean the world. I did a State of the Union last week and uh, mentioned that we've lost a lot of donors due to COVID and um, just normal attrition. And several of you have stepped up to help fill that gap. I also mentioned that we, we've tried to really up our game with cinematography, with cameras, with lighting, um, with a, a full-time sort of r rental space and all the equipment and everything. And uh, you guys have all stepped, you know, so, several of you have stepped up to help finance that as well. So thank you so much and to support Kara and Gerardo and Brooklyn and the great work that they're doing with the Open Stories Foundation. So thanks to everyone who donates um, and supports us. And if you value this programming and you want to see it continue and you're not a donor, less than one out of a thousand contribute uh, listeners or viewers actually donates. So please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. It's tax deductible in the US. 100% um, of it goes to this programming and you can pay forward whatever benefits you've gotten and make sure that this pro programming continues for months uh, or years or decades into the future. We'll do this for as long as there's support. So thanks for supporting us. Support us if you can. And there are other ways to support us. Um, following us on um, YouTube, following us on TikTok, our new TikTok channel, Mormon Stories Podcast that CARES are running, is doing great. It's got over 10,000 followers now. 11.6. Um, what's that? 11. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Get it right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so follow us on TikTok, follow us on Facebook, subscribe, follow us on... Um, those, those follows really matter because they affect the algorithms. The more subscribers and followers and likes and comments that you get on all those platforms, it helps make the programming available to more people. So please do subscribe, follow, like on all the platforms, share it with everyone. And um, just, but most importantly, just be good to each other, be kind to each other, love each other, support each other, in or out of the church, in or out of belief, just be kind, be loving, be supportive, and um, enjoy this one big, beautiful life that you know you have. So enjoy it. Stay tuned. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments. If you have feedback, comment on this post or on the social medias. 
And um, if you have ideas or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear it. So thanks, everyone. Take care. We'll see you guys all again very soon for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. See everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.